After the Hour by Les Weinroth. After the hour, and the music sets the stage. Music to soothe, music to mollify, music to whistle. Thank you, Whistler. The original score for Assorted Strings, Woodwinds, and Brass, composed by Frank Smith. Same score for same instrument, see above. Guided by the baton of Caesar Petrillo. Words of various nature and proper emotions to be enunciated by members in good standing of the American Federation of Radio Artists, Chicago Local. This is Five After the Hour, and this is the play. Its title, The Life of and times of a happy man. <laughs> the voice you've just heard is that of Jefferson Mulch, a happy man. This is the saga of Jefferson Mulch, a happy man. Jefferson Mulch has everything. A lovely wife, two lovely children, an expensive townhouse in a fashionable city district, and an equally expensive estate in the suburbs. Furthermore, Jefferson Mulch was the president of two large and thriving businesses. He belonged to two high-class and exclusive clubs. His two lovely children were enrolled in two expensive schools. And his lovely wife was a member of two society ladies' organizations. Yes, Jefferson Mulch had everything. And was indeed a happy man. How did Jefferson Mulch know that he was indeed a happy man? That's easy, because people were always telling him so. The day had yet to go by when someone or other didn't say to him, Jeff, old chap, you're a happy man. Certainly wish I were as happy as you. Well, thanks for saying so, Bingston. You get to believe things like that after a while. At least that's what happened to Jefferson Mulch. He sincerely believed he was a happy man. That is, until one day... That was the day Jefferson Mulch fell ill with a cold. <laughs> and because he stayed in bed all that day and wouldn't see anybody, there was no one around to say to him, Jeff, old chap, you're a happy man. Certainly wish I were as happy as you. And then Jefferson Mulch happened to turn on the radio. Jefferson Mulch turned off the radio and said to himself, Am I really a happy man? Now, this is where the plot takes a twist. When Jefferson Mulch asked himself that question, there should have been no answer. He was alone. There was no one in the room to reply. Well, practically no one. If you accept his alter ego. Yes, his alter ego was with him. 
and was in a talkative mood. Alter ego. From the Latin, another myself. Very well. Speak, Jefferson Mulch. Reply, alter ego. Am I really a happy man? Ah, now you've hit the nail on the head, Mulch. Are you a happy man? Well, I... Well, of course I am. I've got everything in the world, haven't I? Don't ask me. How could I know? Eh? Uh, eh? Uh. <laughs> Gesundheit. Thank you. Not at all. Um, where were we? You just said you had everything. Oh, yes. Yeah, I do. You got a lovely wife, haven't I? Come, come, Mulch. Who oh, are you kidding? Well, I'll admit Myrna does get a little tiresome sometimes, but, uh... But, uh, what? But, uh... Oh, all right, Count found you. Myrna's a bore. A terrible bore. Now, are you satisfied? I am, if you are. Well, I am. Myrna may be a dull woman, but she's also a beautiful woman. And she loves me. And so do my two lovely children. Your children. Lovely indeed. Cynthia's spoiled and selfish and snobbish. She picks her friends carefully by the size of their bank balances. But then she's been well-schooled on that score. Your wife saw to that. Now, see here. And Jonathan. Now, there's a boy. <clears throat> if you don't give him what he wants, he pouts. And when you do give him what he wants, he pouts. Because you haven't given him enough of what he wants. Yes, indeed, Mulch. You have lovely children. You are a happy man. Hey, it all stop using that adjective. Happy, 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 happy. I'm tired of hearing it. I'm uh, very tired of hearing it. And what about the business? The money in the bank? The townhouse, the country estate, the exclusive clubs, and the well-regulated life. What's so wonderful about them? I don't know. I really don't know. Life's dull, isn't it, Mulch? Uh, yeah, terribly dull. Dull beyond all shadow of a doubt. Beyond all shadow. There must be a reason why I'm not a happy man, though. Oh, I hate that word. But it is a fact. A most certain and undeniable fact. You are not a... Uh, uh... No one. Well, there's a reason. There must be. And I'll find it if it's the very last thing I ever do. That's the spirit, Mulch. I've got it. That man on the radio, he ought to know. That's his business. Good, let's get started. Oh, um, you're untied. What's that for? You're going to sneeze. Huh? Oh, you're right. Uh, so I am. <laughs> like to see the voice of happiness. Uh, well, what about, please? Happiness, of course. Uh, what's your name, please? Uh, uh, Mulch. Jefferson Mulch. Oh, I'll put you down in the book as Mr. J.M. The voice will see you in just a few minutes. Thank you. Just what do you expect to accomplish by an interview with a radio actor, Mr. J.M.? He's not a radio actor. He's a consultant. He analyzes people, tells them why they aren't happy. Oh, were you speaking to me, Mr. J.M.? Oh, oh, no, I was just uh, talking to myself. Ready for the next case, Miss T. Well, this is Mr. J.M., sir. He is not a happy man. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Well, come in, come in, sir. Come in and tell me all your troubles. Nothing could make me happier. Thank you. Now then, uh, just where is the detour on your highway to happiness? Well, sir, it's like this. I have always been a happy man. That is, until this morning. At which time, I was in bed with a bad cold. So you see, that's the story. Yesterday I was a happy man, today I'm not. And you want me to prescribe for you? That's why I came here. Uh, what can you tell me? Well, that depends. If you want to appear on my radio program and tell your story to my radio audience, I can tell you nothing at this time. You see, I always wait until the fan mail comes in before I make my radio decisions. Mm. Easier on my popularity rating. Uh, if I let the people think that my decision is the same as theirs. Uh, that's why I'm such a happy man myself. But on the other hand, if you don't want to appear on my program, I can prescribe for you right now. Well, I really have no desire to go on the radio. Oh, very well, Mr. J.M. In that case, I will say this to you. 
having listened to your tale of alleged woe, and I might add, having mulled it over at great length as you spoke, I've come to the positive conclusion that you are the happiest mortal it has ever been my pleasure to sit down and talk to. You mean you have no advice for me? Advice? You need no advice. Go home and revel in your happiness. You are indeed a happy man. I am indeed a happy man, he said. Well, then, what are you sitting in this broken-down hotel for? Why don't you go home? He told you you were a happy man. What more do you want? Or, uh, doesn't the charm work anymore? No, hang it, it doesn't. Hmm. Of course, J.M., you lead a pretty well-modulated life, you know. Mm. Everything a simple matter of routine. Mm. Maybe you ought to go home and kick over the traces, create a little excitement for yourself. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, that might just fix things up fine. Yes. It's a thought. It's definitely a thought. Jefferson, dinner's ready. I'm not hungry. Why, nonsense. It's 6.30, and you're always hungry at 6.30. Tonight, I don't expect to be hungry until at least 7. Good, J.M., good. The help will leave if they must stay in the kitchen that long. Fine. I suspect you'd make a marvelous cook with a little practice, my dear. Good. Why, really, Jefferson, you're being quite impossible tonight. Mother, it's after 6.30. Aren't we going to eat soon? Your father doesn't seem to be hungry, Jonathan. Is he sick? No, he isn't sick. He just doesn't want to eat. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Father, what about the convertible I asked you to buy me? Jonathan, if you want a convertible or anything else, you can go to... Uh, 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 Easy, J.M., easy. Just go and buy it for yourself, provided you have any of your allowance left. Mother, it's 20 minutes to 7, and Hortense says if we don't sit down to dinner right away, she won't be responsible for the frog's legs. Father's not hungry, Cynthia. Not hungry? Are you ill, Father? I am not ill. Haven't you ever not been hungry at 6.30, Cynthia? Why, of course not. Poor child. Father, could you advance me a little money? No. Mother, call the doctor. Father is sick. I am not. While we're all together, I have something I want to tell you. I am seriously thinking about giving away two million dollars. What? What? You heard me. Jefferson, if this is your idea of a joke, I don't think it's very funny. I'm not joking. I'm very serious. Uh, Well, Jefferson, I I think it's very sweet of you to be so altruistic. I don't suppose parting with two million dollars will hurt us any? How much have we got in the bank? Two million dollars. And Myrna, I'm putting up the house for sale the first thing in the morning. Wonderful, J.M. This is the most idiotic thing I ever heard of. I am also selling the business and the townhouse and everything else. The trouble with all of us is that life has been too easy. We're all too self-satisfied and comfortable. Jefferson, I'm going up to my room. When you feel that you can talk sensibly and rationally, you may come up and talk to me. Come, children. Yes, right, mother. mother. <laughs> very nice, Mulch, very nice. What now? Oh, I'm not telling But I will give you a hint. Ever since the voice of happiness asked me if I wanted to tell my story on the air, I've had an awful yearning to go on the radio. Cynthia. Have you any idea how one would go about boiling onions? I'm afraid not, Mother. (laughs) Say, perhaps if I turn on the radio, they'll have one of those programs where the announcer tells you how to do all sorts of things. Well, it's worth a try. And that, ladies, is how one boils onions. Oh. I don't miss our country house so much, but I certainly could use Hortense in the kitchen. Well, I could do with a couple of club dances. And I do hate public school. You meet so many people. Mm, That's pretty, isn't it? Yes, but it's not boiling my onions. Oh, all right. And now, before we close for this evening, ladies and gentlemen, the harbinger of happiness has a few words for you. Thank you, Mr. Garman. Friends, if you have a problem that's barricading your route to happiness, come in and see me. We'll discuss your problem and the solution to it before a board of experts. Cynthia, that's 
Comes to me. Well, it's tried it's fiber. To solve, will receive one thousand dollars in cash. So Until that's what he's week, doing then, with our this money. This is a harbinger of happiness. Bidding you good night and happy days. Well. Whoever would have thought of Jefferson as a harbinger of happiness? You know, Mother, Father might just become famous doing that. Who knows, but very soon we might have some money in the bank again. How to Be Happy Though Living by Jefferson Mulch has already sold 175,000 copies and is in its seventh printing. Get his John Henry on a contract for a new book, pronto. Happiness is just a state of mind by Jefferson Mulch. 150,000 copies. Eight print. Harbinger of Happiness will be the greatest motion picture ever to come out of Hollywood. Get Mulch out here. We need a technical advisor. Well, Mulch, you've done a great job. Great. It's been fun. I've been a happy man for the past six months. There's only one trouble. What's that? I seem to have two million dollars in the bank again. Well, hold on to your hat, Mulch. Here we go again. You are Jefferson Mulch. I am. I'm Arthur Jones. Officer of Currency Stabilization, Department of the Treasury. Mr. Mulch. It has been called to our attention that you are doling out a minor fortune to people with problems. That's right. Through my radio program. Well, Mr. Mulch, I'm afraid all that will have to stop. You have no idea what a program such as yours, with its subsequent rewards, can do to rupture a country's economic setup. You mean that my giving away $1,000 a question on my program is upsetting economic standards? Yes, and you have no idea to what extent. After all, everybody has problems. And if you give $1,000 to everyone with a problem, well, just stop a minute and think of the possible consequences. I see what you mean, Mr. Jones, and you can count on me. I have no desire to disrupt the entire nation, and I won't give away another cent on my program. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Harbinger of Happiness. Bringing you another yeah, program. Turn off the humbug, Harry. He hasn't had a good program joy, since he stopped giving away cash prizes for problems. Look at that Hooper rating. Less than one. Beginning next Monday, a new show will replace the Harbinger of Happiness. His sponsor isn't satisfied with it. I always thought that stuff was a lot of drivel myself. <laughs> Well, Jefferson? Well, what? Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> this is it. You have no job now and no money in the bank. Where do we go from here? Answer, Jeff. Oh, we'll get along, my dear. We've always done all right. Just doing all right isn't good enough anymore, Jefferson. You may like it, but I don't. And neither do your children. We're used to something better than this. Better than what, my dear? Better than doing our own cooking and living in five little rooms. Sending the children to public school and having to make new friends even while we're dodging the old ones. We're used to better than that. And we expect to get it. Well, let her have it, Jeff. You haven't learned anything in the past six months, have you? You don't know what it is to be happy. You only know what it is to be rich. I've tried to give you the chance to know something better than that, but obviously you don't want it. Jefferson, how much money do we have? Money? None. Likewise, stocks. Bonds, real estate, none. We have nothing. And don't forget the life insurance. Oh, I do have some life insurance. In what amount? I don't know exactly. Let's say roughly a million. <sighs> Jefferson, I am devoted to you. You've been a good and kind husband. A loving and devoted father. I am going to do this... Only because I know that someday you will be happy about it. Men. Hey, wait for me. Coming, Jefferson.
angels. Quiet, please. Let us form a nice straight line for inspection. Thank you. Wings straight. Halos in place. Come, come. Very well. Fine, fine. You do look bright, every one of you. Bright and shining. Uh, Angel Jefferson Mouse. Yes, sir. Your halo. There was a cherub. Nice little fella had misplaced his. <laughs> and your harp. That very nice second harpist in the heavenly choir. Two of his strings were broken. Well. Hmm. But uh, your golden slippers. The assistant doorman at the pearly gates. The nice, fat, jolly little fella. His were being half sold. And I do enjoy going barefoot. Jefferson, Jefferson, what are we going to do with you? I don't know, sir. I'm sorry I'm such a worry to you. Worry? <laughs> Nonsense, Jefferson. You sound like a mortal. Why, you're one of our most shining lights. Why, Jefferson Mulch, you are a happy man. <laughs> This, then, is the saga of Jefferson Mulch. Jefferson hasn't got a lovely wife anymore, nor two lovely children, nor an expensive townhouse, nor an equally expensive country estate. He also has no money in the bank, no thriving business, and he belongs to no exclusive clubs. No, Jefferson has none of these. And little else if you're going to count personal property. But this, none can deny. Jefferson Mulch is indeed a happy man. Life and Times of a Happy Man was written by Carol Lederer and Les Weinrod. The original score was composed by Frank Smith, and the orchestra was under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. Next week, at the same time, you are again invited to meet with us at five after the hour by Les Weinrod. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Five after the hour by Les Weinrod. the hour. Play the theme song, Mr. Conductor. Play it sweet. Play it smooth. Make music a man can whistle. Thank you. A theme song is composed for you, listener. Fashion so that you can settle yourself comfortably near your radio. Designed for your ease in listening. Require time for comfort and ease. 50 seconds.
Now, prepare to be disturbed by the man without a face. Decide what to say before they return to kill me. Oh, it is so difficult to think now. Think, man, think. Your future, your life depends upon it. <laughs> your future, your life. Do you not remember the day you died? Him, or was it 11 years ago? I was at home, getting ready to attend the meeting of the bakers. Now, Liebchen, my cat. Here it is, dear. My, you do look handsome. Do you like it drawn straight or cocked over the eye? So. Very jauntily. That way. And you shan't be late, shall you? Oh, no. no. The, when the Munich Baker's Guild meets for an evening of beer drinking, singing, marching, who can say any hour is late? Excellent. Excellent. Such singing, such mugs. Hey, it was good. And the beer? <laughs> Wonderful. What more pleasant a life could a man desire? Good friends, good companionship, laughter, music, and marching to Sturman. Right. <laughs> Absolutely right. How easily you are both content. Well, why should we not be content? Why, indeed? Germany lies bleeding, disgraced by the terms of a sigh, sold out by the capitalists and the communists and the Jews, and you are content to wear those foolish uniforms and sing sentimental songs. You, you have no purpose in life. Well, what greater purpose can one have than to raise a fine family, have a successful bakery, and belong to a club? Yes, whatever are you talking about? Blind, blind thought of you. History is being written around you, and you have not the eyes to see. Germany's destiny is being planned, and you have not the sense to understand. He has come to lead Germany, to redeem Germany. He will be our savior. <laughs> I should have sensed it then. I should have recognized it as a disease. A disease that would spread over all Germany. A disease from which the German soul would shrivel and wither and eventually die. Now I remember my friend's face as he spat out those words. There was hate there in his eyes. Hate and fanaticism and cruelty and lust. There was greed for power. There was everything a human should be frightened of. But I did not see it. Perhaps it was dark that night. Perhaps the beer blurred my vision. Perhaps it was because this fastica was then only a hooked cross in a red field. And the fear was then only a politician who spoke very loudly and made us feel that we should conquer the world through bluff and bluster. So I returned to my home and hung up my uniform of the baker skill and went about baking the lightest pfannkuchen in all Munich. How many times have I told you you do not pull the trays out yet? I'm sorry, Master. I did not mean to be so careless. He did not mean to be so careless. For an excuse like that, an apprentice receives a reward like this. Oh. Now, perhaps you will remember the exact moment one pulls the trays out from the oven. Now, perhaps... And who dares to open the door without my permission? Who dares... Not with us. 
Immediately. What your talk is this? What do you mean by the... <clears throat> Pick him up. Take the boy, too. He has seen. <laughs> Baker, Herr Doctor. Heil Hitler. Ja, Sie Heil. Hmm. The physical characteristics are as described. Nose, it... Yeah, I hope we will try. His ancestry has, of course, been thoroughly checked. Five generations here in Munich. Aryan to the last drop of blood. Yeah, good. And now, tell me, Baker, are you prepared to shed a few drops of your pure Aryan blood in the course of the Third Reich? I may... It is permitted that I speak? To answer questions, yeah. But why have I been brought here? My family... Your family is safe for the moment. They are in protective custody. But why... Take him away. They are ready for him in the operating room. of my face, then the anesthetic and operation. Weeks, many weeks in a room, never being spoken to, strapped to the bed, my face a hideous torment, burning, itching, hurting. Then, that day... And now... We shall see the results of your surgery. I pray I have been successful. If you have, your work is over. Mine begins. We have come to remove the bandages. It will not be painful. Thank you. So, we begin. When we are finished, we shall have a surprise for you. Eh, hey, Doctor? Proceed with your work. Of course. My apologies. There. Now, to remove this last bandage. So. Ah. Yeah. Incredible. This work I shall enjoy. Well, Baker, are you not curious? I, uh, I do not know what to say. Good. Continue so and you will prosper. <laughs> With such a face, how can you help but prosper? Such a face? Yeah. Here, take this mirror. No. Look at yourself. <laughs> oh, no. I, I must deny. Oh. He has fainted from the shock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, understandable. Would not you faint if you awakened and found you had the face of Adolf Hitler? Adolf Hitler. My face. What a fantastic thing. My reason tottered. I was certain I'd gone mad. Then, the little Herr Doctor, he of the club foot, came again to my room. With him was the plain man I was to learn to fear. The one with the thin mouth and the nose glass. You are to be given the most glorious opportunity. The opportunity of laying down your life or your fear. My men of the Gestapo and Schutzstaffel will of course give you every protection. Needless to say, you'll be watched at all times. You will do nothing unless ordered. Is that clear? I understand. To your person, the fear will be spared many taxing moments. His person will be reserved for only the most important activities. 
And now, your course of instruction will begin. Head erect. Shoulders back. Left hand looped on the belt. Yeah? Yeah. Better. Now, now the eyes flash. The head is thrown back. The right arm upraised and salute. Step left. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. No, 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 no. Not like everything. Like a liar. Again. But, Herr Doctor, I cannot much to I try. Yeah, enough. Take him back into the room with the recording equipment for the rest of the day. emulate the Fuhrer's voice. Then we will dispose of him. No, no. Much effort has been expended on him. He will do for routine matters. Mass demonstrations, parades, various inspections where the Fuhrer is not expected to speak. You follow? Mm, yes. And for all functions where there is the slightest degree of danger. That was why I was spared. There were others with faces like mine who could do the speaking on occasion. I learned of them quite by accident, and I kept the knowledge to myself. At first I was afraid, and then I was no longer fearful. People looked at me and cheered. People looked at me and trembled. There were even those who knew I was not what I seemed to be, but they were respectful. After all, one does not know what will happen. Yes, I liked it. I felt the power, the glory of leadership. Glorious Edo, the youth of Germany welcomes you. And you thoughts we find our inspiration. In your deeds, we find our ambitions. In your hopes, we find our goals. We are you, and you are Germany. Hannibal! Yes, one must clear the fear of friendship to appreciate it. I thought of nothing else. Now I wore my uniform more and more, even as he did. But isn't it having only the one uniform? I wished he would wear many, like the fat one did. I learned much of what transpired in the party, too. The hatred, the jealousies. But one thing above all others I learned, that to conquer the world, one must follow blindly. You will leave at once for Munich. At once? He is there. He is not well. The cares of state weigh heavily on him. Various diplomats are expected. You will be seen in his study while he is resting. You will also abstain from any other activities. As you command, sir. In the event you do not completely understand me, may I point out that the various ways in which you entertain yourself are known to us. Yeah, my dear. That is all. Save one thing. Your situation is one from which there is no resigning. Also, if you are found wanting, there will be no other situation. Munich, the Brenner Pass, Berchtes Garden, always with honor, with respect. Takao, Belsen, Nordhausen, 
Garde legen. The concentration camps. How the guards outdid themselves to entertain me. And how the inferior race and the political prisoners trembled as word passed through that I was there. The power and the glory of might. Then, the blood purge of June 1934. <laughs> I was fearful at first. But it was soon over, and I was safe again. I was more powerful than ever. Then, then France in Austria in 1938. Anschluss! The fools, we would show them. In 1939, Czechoslovakia. A few days later... Lithuania. Then Poland. But the war went on. And it was good. War is good. Man is intended to battle. And the German is in destined to rule. Germany must have Lebensraum. And the Lebensraum she must have is a whole France has capitulated, and Marshal Verdun has agreed to terms of surrender. The Führer is now on his way to Paris. He danced a chain. And France fell. He danced the chick. After I had gone forward to try out the surroundings. But I had no fear. There was no one who could stand up to us. No one could question our mind. Then something happened. The astrologers and the mystics came more often to the Reich's Chancery. And he spent more and more time with them, and less and less time with the staff of the high command. The Russian campaign. He promised it would be a great adventure. It was no adventure. Japan struck at America. The American issue force declared war. And then the fat-bellied one proved a liar. He had promised us his Luftwaffe would drive from the skies anyone who dared rise up against it. He lied. I was near Hamburg. Come, sir. We must evacuate at once. The celebration that was planned, it is cancelled. The Wehrmacht has made a strategic retreat on the Russian front. Our forces have fallen back in good order. And the high command has prepared a trap that will ensnare the recklessly advancing Soviets. For the national security, greater restrictions will be made on the home front. All citizens of the Reich will register with the proper authorities at once. Today, I knew it was the end. The Russians were at the very gates of Berlin. The Americans and the British were in the skies over Berlin. And I was in Berlin. In the secret sub basement of the Reich's Chancellery. With him, with a little club footed man. The hair doctor had just announced over the radio that he would fight with the citizens of Berlin to the end. Now I hated him. He had betrayed us. He had promised us a world and had led us into this hell. Then I heard them talking. I heard them. You have your orders? I understand. 
He will leave by plane. The other one will die here. But I did not want to die. I wanted to live. I had done nothing wrong. He had betrayed us all. He had promised us victory. You cannot kill me. My wife, my children. I will go back to Munich, my bakery. You cannot do... They will think I am him. They will. This one. We dug him out of the sub basement of the Reich's Chancellor, Tavaris Doctor. Mm. A good Nazi party member, no doubt. What is left of him, his face you see gone completely. Mm. No identification. Fingerprints were checked. He is no one. Pulse. Very weak. Will he live? Who knows? Tell me, doctor. If such a one survives, is there a possibility for plastic surgery? Possibly. Let me see. My guess. Brown hair. Weak mouth. Pronounced nose. Typical Aryan, eh? Is it your guess they will make him a new face, doctor? I rather think no. The young. Them the world can repair. Their faces. Their minds. Their hearts, their souls. For them, there is hope in the brotherhood of man. For this one and the others like him, these we shall leave without faces, even as Germany is today. These have lost the right to new faces. These have lost the right to the brotherhood of man. This one and the others like him must go on until he dies, a man without a face. been listening to The Man Without a Face, written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrott. Five After the Hour originated in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And this is WBBM, the Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrott. across the strings, blow softly on the reeds, mute the brasses, make music a man can whistle, for this is the theme. This is music composed by Frank Smith. This is music conducted by Cesar Petrello. This is five after the hour. This is the mystery, the magic, the excitation of flowing water. This is the Song of the River, starring Curly Bradley. The Song of the River, 
This is the music of water that finds its way to the sea. This is the poetry of high banks and levees and a swift channel. This is the miracle of nature that feeds and nourishes and builds and gives light and life and then destroys. Song of the River. Dad, where does the river go? The river, son? That's a big question, and it'll take some time to answer. Where does the river go? The river starts in heaven Way up there on high The river starts in heaven, son Just like you and I A raindrop falls on a mountain top It's got to find the sea it's got a lot of things to do, just like you and me. Quiet, raindrops! Quiet, raindrops! You're awful noisy for such little things. Hmm. Looks kind of parched down there on Earth. Maybe I ought to throw some rain down there. Mightn't be a bad idea. Raindrops? Raindrops? Things look kind of brown, shriveled, dried out, down there on Earth. Thanks for agreeing with me. You know what's required of you. You're packed and ready to go? They're ready. Good. Well, pleasant journey, raindrops. And I hope you find the sea. Dad, do raindrops really talk like that? Do those little things really make a river? How many are there? A hundred skillion, maybe? No, there's more than that, son. A scraw trillion, at least. Gee. Right away, they start looking for the sea. Down that mountainside, they run and skip and tumble, bumping into stones, a zigging and a zagging. All those drops? Racing to the bottom. All the time, they're growing bigger. All the time they're growing stronger. Pretty soon they make a stream, and that stream says to those stones, Step aside, brother. I'm on my way. It's on its way rolling downward to the sea with grass a-growing on its banks and huge and leafy trees. It drains the soil in springtime and overflows its banks, leaving rich and fertile land. The farmer gives his thanks. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, John. Then skips begin to ride, boats begin to churn. They turn their way across the tide 
stuff from stem to stern with corn and sweet potatoes, cotton to and oats, with sugar cane and black molasses piled high on the bowl. All in the same river we're fishing in? The same river, son. Yeah. Take this stone and toss it over the bank. Gosh, look at all those ripples spread. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Look at them go. Those ripples travel all the way down the river. They see thousands of things that you and I can't see. A couple of hours from now, when it's night, they'll still be traveling. Maybe rock a little canoe with lovers sitting in it. Their faces shining in the moonlight. Harry, did you ever see a more beautiful moon? Hmm. It was made for tonight, Mary. And you and me. Look how the water shimmering makes the moonbeams dance. Hmm. Looks like about a million fireflies telegraphing the beauty of the night. <laughs> Makes you feel like drifting along on the river forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the moon's been shining on this river as far back as Father Time can remember. This river's got glamour, son. Huh? You know what glamour is? You mean pimp girls? <laughs> no, son, I mean something more like, well, like the glamour of the showboat. Oh, there were girls, all right, and singing and dancing. Like in the movies? <laughs> Long before there was such a thing as the movies. Showboat on the river stops at all the town. Showboat bring in joy and fun And gals in lovely gowns Dancers strutting proudly To music of the band To music of the minstrel men The gayest in the land Majestic melodrama, Laura, the lovely landlord's daughter, or oh, the price she paid for secret share. Hooray! 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 <laughs> oh, Mr. Bones, go on, Campbell. Open your big old ugly mouth. Well, that I will, boy, that I will. What I want to know is... How old is that wife of yours? <laughs> that wife of mine? Well, she two years younger than she was on her last birthday. <laughs> well, cook me, yes, fry sir. me, and set me out, boy. You sure ain't good at computing ages. Oh, no. No. How old is a person born in 1854? Man or woman? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you sure is dumb. Yes, Miss Bones, you sure is dumb. I don't know how you ever got a wife. Got a wife? Oh, I just sobered up and there she was. <laughs> now, tell me, boy, and tell me honest. Is it true that married men live longer than single ones? Uh-uh. 
It only seems longer. You really can't. You How long you been married, man? How long I been married? Two. Two years? Uh uh. Too long. (laughs) Miserable, you poor, miserable hunk of nothing, you. I'm gonna have to show you the lies. Say, is that so, Tambo? I've been doing pretty well in the dark up to now. (laughs) Oh, you think you're doing good? Why, you is so dumb come hard times. How you gonna make both ends meet? Why, that's easy, Tambo. I get myself a job in my brother's sausage factory. What for, fool? When you work in a sausage factory, both ends gotta be me. See <laughs> now, that remind me of a memory. The meat I had for dinner last night had two ends. Had two ends? How you mean that? Well, it was the end of the chicken, and doggone near the end of me. <laughs> Well, don't feel so bad, Mutton Mine. I didn't do so good either. I had ham for supper last night. Ham, huh? Was it cured? Well, if it was cured, it done had a relapse. But the river wasn't only made for fun and dancing and lovers, son. There's another part to it you ought to know about. The serious part. The part of the river that grows and harvests the crops, carries them to far off places and to all the people of the world. The river does all that too, son. How does the river do all those things, Dan? Well, listen, boy. Listen to the sound of that water wheel. Hear that wheel a-turning, water in the field. The land has got to have that water, so the crop will be. Hear that, boy? The power of the river crushes all the grain. That grow inside this fertile valley and from far away. You see, son, the river turns the wheels that run the country. It turns the little water wheels and turbines, the dynamos that gives us power to run the machines. And it's responsible for the miracle of life. Yes, the miracle of light, son. The light in your room will let you read all those wonderful books. Because you're going to have to read them before you become president, you know. I know. And the light's in the homes of millions of other boys and girls in cities, towns, and on farms. Where maybe their fathers and mothers didn't have light. And the light's in the schools and the shops and the factories, too. And in the clean white hospitals where the sick are being cured. And where great and wise men are finding out how to make your life and mine fuller, safer, longer. And in the war plants where men, women, and children are making things to help us win the war. Yep. There, too, light is helping us to beat an enemy who wants to take the world back into the darkness out of which we came. Golly. All that light comes from the river, son. You can thank the Lord for sending down those little gods. Thank the Lord. It don't hardly seem possible that all that comes from this one little river. Little, huh? Yeah. Pick up another stone. Yeah, that's it. Now, throw it in the water. Now watch those ripples, boy. Watch them for as far as your eye can see. I'm watching them, Dad. Yeah, take the one going that way, going south. I can't see it anymore. That's because it's on its way to St. Louis and Cairo. That's where Grandma is. Yeah, but it ain't going to stop there. It's going to float right past Crothersville, Missouri. And in Blytheville, Tennessee. Right on down through Memphis Town, past Mississippi, you see. And then past the Vicksburg levee. You know what happened at Vicksburg, son, if you 
stretch of history. Then where does it go? Why, into Louisiana, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans. Into the Gulf of Mexico and right on to the Caribbean. Now, take another big stuff. No, 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 not one of those teensy weensy things, but a great big rock that'll make a splash. Okay. Now, Eve Ho. Zoe! <laughs> oh, look at her go. Yeah, watch her to the north this time, son, and see how far she goes. Through Hannibal and Quincy, Dubuque and Old St. Paul, through Davenport and Clinton, too, and Sonny, that ain't all. From Minnesota to the Gulf, it runs through every state. This little river at our feet, it's greater than the grave. And it knows it, too. Thunder. That's not thunder, little boy. It's me talking about the river. The mighty conceited river it is. Mighty temperamental. Hard to control. It's roaring drunk with power. Flies into a rage. And off it goes. Spoiling all the good it's done. Sometimes I get so mad I... I looks mad. Just a little thunder in the east. We'd best be going in. Yes. Run for cover, good little people. Run from the river, lest it swell again and break its bonds and ruin what you built. Why can't you be all good, proud river? The people are good. They build themselves great cities. They build themselves a civilization and a brand new world. They build themselves a thousand miles of levee to girdle you in, and then you break it down. The dam is troubling. Run for your lives! I've got to get back! Help me get back! Run, woman! Your house is torn loose! My baby's in the house! I've got to get back! I've got to get back! River. A hundred thousand men tried to hold you back and failed. Almost a million people homeless, without food, without shelter. Yes, run for cover, little people, every time it rains. My family's gone. My stock. My crops. My lands will never grow a blade of grass. Hundreds of millions of tons of precious soil, of blessed good earth, washed into the sea. Aren't you sorry for what you've done? The thunder's not as loud as it was, Dad. Oh, the sky's lighter now. Maybe we won't have to run for cover after all. Look how peaceful the river is. Maybe it's sorry for what it's done. It does more good than harm. Don't it, Dad? It sure does, son. It sure does. All power's got to be harnessed, son. So as it can do the most good for the most people. And the river's no different from you or me. We don't ever want to let ourselves get out of hand. Just remember that, son. Remember that old river. And if you ever weaken, look up to the sky for the strength that he gave the river. Pray to him on high. Ask him for the power to keep all mankind free. Free as flows this mighty river through eternity.
This is the song of the river. This is the music of water that finds its way to the sea. This is the poetry of high banks and levees in the swift channel. This is the miracle of nature that feeds and nourishes and builds and gives light and life. This is the song of the river. Song of the River was written and directed by Les Weinrod with lyrical acknowledgments to Sherman Marks and Carol Lederer, and musical kudos to Frank Smith and Cesar Petrillo. Curly Bradley was heard in the leading role. At this same time, five after the hour will bring you another 25 minutes of music and drama from WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrod. with melody, add harmony, make it majestic, make it sweeping, for this is the theme. Theme and bridges, background and mood music, the original composition of Frank Smith. Same theme, Bridges et al., directed by Caesar Petrillo. This is the play. It stars Virginia Payne and Charles Eggleston. Its title... A man around the house. There was this little house little white house with a green picket fence running around it. The yard was just big enough for a dog and a little boy. Bowser, you come back here, Bowser! Inside the little house, everything was just as you'd expect it to be. The windows were very, very clean, except for a smudge here and there made by a small boy's small nose. The clock in the hall chimed on the hour, every hour. And the antimacassars and the rocking chairs nodded back when it chimed. There were some photographs of people looking self-conscious. One in particular, of a stern-looking man with a stern-looking beard. And there was a big lithograph of the Johnstone Flood, which looked like every other lithograph of the Johnstown Flood. There was a smell about the house, too. A smell is the personality of a house, really. This house always smelled of fresh baked bread and quince preserves and soap and water. This was a pretty, sweet, and dear house. Save for one thing. There was no man in it. 
And as the little boy's grandmother used to say to the postman... I tell you, Mr. Doty, a house with a growing boy has got to have a man in it. Hmm, any kind of house should have a man in it, Miss Willoughby. Yes, but a house with a growing boy has to have a special sort of man. Someone like Marcus Willoughby? Yes. Yes, someone like Marcus Willoughby. Ah, he was a special sort of man indeed, your husband. May he rest in peace. Father, grandfather, and playmate, a little chubby was. The fact is, Mr. Doty, I can't fill his shoes. Chubb is a very unhappy little boy. Too bad. Such a good boy. So honest and fair. Oh, he'll come around, Miss Willoughby. Yes, he will. You just keep on trying. I'll have a talk with Chubb someday. Oh, good. He likes you. Well, I must be off on my appointed rounds, Miss Willoughby. Neither rain nor snow nor sleet nor gloom of night, you know. <laughs> See you tomorrow, Mr. Doty. See you tomorrow, Miss Willoughby. Oh, what a beautiful day. <sighs> I still say there ought to be a man around the house. <laughs> Above, Chubb, you don't eat any more than a bird in that cage. Now, do you? No, ma'am. Don't you want your cornflakes and bananas? No, ma'am. Aren't you going to touch your eggs? No, ma'am. How do you expect to grow any bigger? Don't want to grow any bigger. Well, what do you want, Chubb? Nothing. Oh, dear. Oh, there's Mr. Dodie. Get the mail, will you, Chubb? Our Graham clears the dishes? Yes, ma'am. Come on, Bowser. Come on, boy. You can carry the mail. Well, well, well. It's the head of the house this morning. Morning, Chubb. Morning, Mr. Doty. Morning, Bowser. <laughs> you can give the letters to Bowser, Mr. Doty. He'll take them to Graham. Can he carry them all? There's quite a few. Sure he can. Here you are, boy. <laughs> Where's the rest of your little animals, Chubb? Which one do you mean? Well, Hankus the toad. He died. Oh, sorry to hear that. Well, what about Pincus the garter snake? Graham left the basement door open. He got away. Oh. She always said she couldn't stand the sight of him. Oh, I'm sure she didn't do it on purpose. Graham never would have left the door open. Graham never would have let Hankus die. Gosh, I wish he was still here. Graham can't play ball at all. Or fish. She don't even know how to dig for worms. It's too bad there's not another man to fill your grandpa's shoes. Nobody could ever fill Gramps' shoes. Never. Uh, what if someone came along who could take his place? No one could ever take Gramps' place. Uh, Chubb. Hmm? I want to tell you something, Chubb. Uh, here, sit down on the steps a minute, will you? Sure. Well, what about your mail? Oh, no one on this block gets much mail but Graham. Mrs. Hilliker's seed catalog can wait. Oh, oh, oh. My back's kind of tight today. I'm not as young as I used to be. Neither am I. Uh, Chubb? Yes, Mr. Doty? I don't think you're being fair to Graham. A woman just can't carry on alone. A house has got to have a man that gentler folk can lean upon. Uh, that's what marriage is for. You, you see what I mean, Chubb? Not exactly. Uh, marriage, Chubb, is a wonderful institution. You see? Uh-huh. It's a sort of a law of life. It's, well, inevitable. Do you get what I mean? No, sir. Um... Uh, here's what I mean. No one is ever too old or too young. Graham? Yes, Chubb? My 
talk to you for a minute? Well, of course you can, boy. What about? Oh, right. Great clouds above. Lou Ellen Lloyd Willoughby. What you got in your mind? Sit down, Graham. I- I'm sitting. I'm propped up good. Now talk away. You're not getting any younger, Graham. Oh, I believe that, Chubb. I really do. You must be almost 30. Why, thank you, sir. No one said that to me for almost 40 years. Yes, ma'am. And a house has got to have a man around. Hmm? Yes, ma'am. Do you see what I mean? I'm beginning to. Chubb. Yes, ma'am? You haven't been talking to Mr. Doty by any chance, have you? Yes, ma'am, I have. We had a long talk, and we both agreed on something. Agreed on what, Chubb? Stop looking in the mirror, Graham. Listen to me. Uh, agreed on what, Chubb? Well, we agreed that every house should have a man at the head of it. It's inimitable. It's what? Inimitable. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course it is. And we agree that marriage is a wonderful institution. I see. Go on. And we agree that a person is never too old or too young to join that institution, especially if he or she has a good offer. Hmm. Graham, stop looking in the mirror. You're not listening. Oh, believe me, Chubb, I haven't missed a word. You and Mr. Doty agreed on all those things. Yes, ma'am. And what did you decide? Well, you won't be angry, Graham. Oh, oh no, Chubb, darling, I won't be angry. What did you decide? I decided, Graham, yes. that it's about time yes. that I got married. Morning, Miss Willoughby. Good morning, Mr. Doty. What sort of nonsense have you been putting into my young grandson's head? What? Oh, that. You should be ashamed of yourself, Mr. Doty. A great, big, nice old man like you. Oh, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, Martha, Miss Willoughby, but every word I told the boy was gospel truth. Marriage, Mr. Doty, is not to be taken so lightly. No, nor put aside so lightly, ma'am. Marriage would be the best thing in the world for that boy. Why, Millard, Fillmore Doty. Now, no need to be insulted. It'll be ten years or more before Chubb Willoughby could even think of taking a wife. Chubb? Oh, oh, Martha. Chubb just got our signals mixed. I was just preparing him against the day when someone else might come along and take his grandpa's place. Mr. Doty, are you proposing marriage to me? Not at all, Mrs. Willoughby. Not at all. Oh. Just saying that for a woman in your position, it is a thing to be considered. And just who did you have in mind? Oh, any number of people. No particular person. Any person that I'd consider would have to be very particular, Mr. Doty. Well, what I mean is that for a woman in the autumn of her life, the chances... The, Mr. That is, Doty, it may interest you to know that you are talking to a woman who at this very moment is practically engaged. Martha, to who? To whom? To whom? Oh, to any number of people. In fact, Mr. Doty, the letter that you came here to deliver is without a doubt another proposal of marriage. Another? Number 17. There aren't that many single men in this town. Well, I've scoured the United States. With the help of the Twilight Happiness Marriage Club, of which, Mr. Doty, I am a charter member. Hmm. Wastebasket. Impossible. Wastebasket. Possible? Uh, have you finished with that pile of letters, Mr. Doty? Mm, not yet. Finished 24. Still have five to go. Mm-hmm. Waste basket. Possible. Waste basket. Waste basket. Incinerator. Why incinerator? Man says he hates children. You're right, Mr. Doty. Incinerator. Well, I've finished. Twenty-nine proposals, twelve possibles, twelve waste baskets, and five incinerators. Why did you put the man from Florida in the waste basket, Mr. Doty? 
His letter sounded rather dear. He's 85 years old. Ah, you're right, Mr. Doty. Wastebasket. Let me see some of those possibles. Here. The one from Idaho looks pretty good. Hmm. 65. Likes children. Oh, owns a ranch. Willing to settle in this town. Seems honest, stable, dependable, good references. Oh, and here's a picture. A picture? Let, let me see. Hmm. Hmm. Incinerator, Mr. Doty. Yes, Ms. Willoughby. Incinerator. Well, Mr. Doty, I'm very grateful to you. Mm. I wouldn't have dared to make the choice myself mm. without the point of view of a dear old friend. Mm. Well, Mr. Doty, what do you think? Confound it, Martha, or er, Mrs. Willoughby. This is ridiculous and outrageous and ridiculous. What is, Mr. Doty? Going through a whole batch of applications for your hand when all the time... Yes, Mr. Doty. When all the time there's a simple solution staring you right in the face. Yes, Mr. Doty. You you can take all these letters... Yes, Mr. Doty. ...and select the two most promising and invite them here where you can see them face to face. Oh. That's the way to make a decision. Thank you, Mr. Doty. That's exactly what I'll do. Are they coming tomorrow, Gran? Yes, Chub. Tomorrow is the day. Now, then you go to sleep. Have you said your prayers? Yes, ma'am. Ah, that's a good boy. Good night, Chub. Good night, Gran. Pleasant dreams. Thanks. Same to you. Graham. Yes, Chub? I'm worried. Oh, you'll find another toad, Chub. It's worse than Hank. It's Alice. Alice Martin? Yep. She's she's accepted me. Oh. I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. Well, now, don't worry, Chub. It can be a long engagement. Then I don't have to marry... That's well. Graham. Yes, sir. I just want you to know, whichever one you choose to fill Graham's shoes, it's okay with me. I want you to be happy off much. Thank you, darling. But don't you forget, Chuck. It's got to be okay with you, too. Yes, ma'am. And with Marcus B. Uh, I hope you don't mind all this. But you know as well as I do that if Chubb is going to grow into the man you set him out to be, he needs a stronger guiding hand than mine. He thinks it's for my happiness, but you and I know it's just for him. There's got to be a man around the house. Don't you agree? <laughs> That's what I thought. And I hope it pleases you that I arranged it through the Twilight Happiness and Marriage Club. Because after all, Marcus B., that's how I found you. <laughs> That's right. And I just want to hear you say that whatever choice we make, Chubb and I, we'll have your blessing. I want to settle down and die. Well, that, that's very interesting, Mr. Bassett. Yes, madam. I'm 68. An old 68. And after a life of strife and turmoil, hustle and bustle, dog-eat-dog dog and devil take the hindmost, 
I prefer to spend the years of my declining reclining. Reclining on some shady beach or lying prone in the tall wild grass within reach of nature's creatures. Does that include garter snakes and toads, Mr. Bassett? In short, madam, to settle down amid some pastoral scene, lying underneath a tree, or as Lord Tennyson had in mind, perhaps, on the shady bank of a babbling brook. Would you fish there, Mr. Bassett? No more scratching, no more biting, no more digging. Wouldn't you even dig for worms? Perfect bliss. Yes, the fulfillment of a dream I've always had to settle down and die in peace. Mm-hmm. And, and what of you, Mr. Gibsley? Do you want to settle down and die, too? No, ma'am, I do not. I want to settle down and live. Oh, dear me. I'm 72. A young 72. You see, as a youth, I was a dare-do-well. A roisterer. Did nothing but travel around and see the world. Footloose is a gypsy, free as a bird, hungering for adventure, thirsting after life. I have very interesting. I'll say. And then someone advised me, go to work, get rich. So I did. Head up, eyes to the front, nose to the grindstone, burrowed in the ground like a mole for 50 years. Now I'm tired of burrowing, tired of making money. And I found out why I went through that 50 years of torture and pain. Why did you, Mr. Gibsley? So that I can travel around, see the world, foot loose as a gypsy, free as a bird, what? hungering for adventure, thirsting after life. <laughs> Just what you were doing in the first place. Yes, ma'am, cheated out of 50 years. Now I want to make up for it. Now I want to spend my money. I want to see the top of the ground I've been burrowing in. I want to go everywhere and see everything. Sounds like fun. Can you pitch? Yes, sir, but won't have time for it. I want to see the Taj Mahal, the islands of Tahiti, and the pyramids of the Nile. <gasps> well, won't that interfere a little with Chubb's education? I don't care. In the leaning tower. Chubb? Oh, the boy. The boy will leave in an institution, which will endow magnificently. I don't want another worry in the world, nor a care. Oh, I see. Not if I live to be a hundred and fifty. And I expect I will. (coughs) I expect I will. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for coming all the way across the country to present your... Your qualifications. Uh, no, oh, no, no, madam. Uh, just give me a little time to make up my mind. Oh, excuse me, gentlemen. There's someone at the door. Not at all, ma'am. Not at all. In short, Mr. Gibbsley, yes? your theory of life is based on, uh, on, uh... On life, not death. Amen. Come, Chubb. Graham, I don't think they're going to do. Well... Miss Willoughby, Miss Willoughby, hope you haven't made your decision yet. Why, Mr. Doty? Here's more mail. Applications 43 and 44. Oh. Mr. Doty, can you pitch? Well, sure I can, Chubb. Can't those other men? Mr. Doty, I don't expect you'll ever ask me. So I'm going to ask you a very special question. What's that, Miss Willoughby? What size shoes do you wear? Ten and a half. Why? I thought so. Uh, That's the size that Marcus B. wore. Uh, uh, Mr. Doty, don't you think you could fill Grandpa's shoes? Well, clouds above. <laughs> Martha. <laughs> Millie. Graham, I think we've got our man around the house. This little white house, this little house with a green picket fence running round it. The yard still has a dog. And a little boy. Bowser, get the measure, Bowser! Inside the house, everything is very much the same. The windows are shiny and bright. The clock chimes in the hall. The kitchen is full of good smells. The photographs still look at each other self-consciously. The Johnstown flood still takes its toll. Yes, everything's very much the same. It's a dear, sweet, 
happy little house. Even the photograph of the stern-looking man wearing the stern-looking beard is in its accustomed place. Funny thing, though, he still wears the beard in the picture, but he seems to be smiling. Around the House was written and directed by Les Weinrath, with acknowledgement of syntax to Sherman Marks and Carol Editor. Sharps and Flats designed by Frank Smith, Cadenzas and Arpeggios under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrath. In with strings, add brass and woodwinds. Now the harp and percussion, for this is the theme. Play the original compositions of Frank Smith. Play them under the baton of Caesar Petrillo. For the time is five after the hour. The play, Amid the Blaze of Noon. is a play about a soldier. It takes its title from three lines written by the poet Milton. The lines are on the subject of blindness. Oh, dark, 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 amid the blaze of noon, irrevocably dark, total eclipse, without all hope of day. Soldier is blind. Blind. Close your eyes. Now, press your hands tightly across them. Tighter. 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 Now, try to open your eyes. Try to see. This soldier is blind. He has just returned from the wars. This is the ship that has brought him back. Well, Doug, there she is. How does she look, Squirrel? Tell me how she looks. Beautiful, Doug, beautiful. And all woman. Tons and tons of pure woman. Been away all these years and she's still carrying the torch. Home sweet home. Hey, hey, there's some writing on the base. I can't make it out. I knew these binoculars were phony when I bought them in Tobruk. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. I can see it. You can what? In my mind's eye, Horatio, in my mind's eye. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. The wretched refuse at your teeming shore. And send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Oh, very nice. Intended as a welcome mat for refugees. Well, that ain't bad for G.I. Joe's. Huddled masses yearning to be free. <laughs> That's us. Yeah. And when we get that little thumbprint on copy number 10 of that little white paper, you and I will be free. 
Send these, the homeless, tempest toss to me. <laughs> Hello, homeless. Hello, tempest tossed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, squirrel. As long as I've got a home, you've got a home. I know it, Doug. And as long as I've got eyes, you've got eyes. <laughs> This is a friendship born of war, born of blood and sweat and tears. Doug, the sightless one, was once a painter of pictures, and Mike, the homeless one, was once just what he is now, a lazy dreamer of dreams. And pretty soon the day came for Mike. Let's have your other thumb. Yes, sir. In the ink. That's it. Now press it here, and here, and here, and here, and here, 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 and here. This is it? This is it, Lieutenant. Uh, mister. 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 And the day came for Doug, a little later for Doug, because he had to learn things. He had to learn to walk as if he were newborn. That's it. That's it. That's fine. He learned to walk upstairs. Uh, one. Two. Three. Four. Five. And down. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. He learned to avoid the commonplace hazards of chairs and doors and curves and overhanging boughs. He learned sight through sound and touch and smell and taste. And his fingers became his eyes. Through his fingers, he learned to read. The apple fell from the, the tree. Good. Good. He learned to type. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the party. He learned to sew, to weave. He learned to fix. He learned again to work the potter's wheel, to mold in clay as he had done in his student years. And he learned that he owned a sixth sense, an intuitive understanding that is denied to those of us with eyes. His step became sure. And soon... He read with ease. Cowards die many times before their death. The valiant never taste of death but once. And with increasing confidence, he found he could do many things he'd always done, like a melody or two on the piano. began to dabble a bit with brush and palette. And though he knew the work was poor, a great resolve was born within him. And he said, I'll paint again. I'll paint again. And finally, the day came for Doug. Lieutenant, I can honestly say that never in my experience as a teacher has anyone progressed so far in so short a time. Thank you, Colonel. I know you'll make good. I've never had as much confidence in anyone as I have in you. Of course, it isn't going to be easy. I know. To an artist making his mark as you were, it must be a great blow to know that you'll never paint again. But there are so many well, other pardon things. Pardon me, Colonel, but I am going to paint again. As a hobby, of course, but you... As a livelihood, sir. As a career. If Beethoven wrote music that he couldn't hear it when he couldn't hear a note, well, I have some wonderful memories I can hope to put on canvas. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
And why not? No reason. The feeling is strong enough. It will move the world. Your escort's waiting just outside. Goodbye, Lieutenant. And Godspeed. Not bad. Not bad at all. Homeless, this is your home. Well, it looks pretty good to me. Oh, watch out, Doug. Over to your right. There's a, a green leather wing chair, I know. Huh? And and straight ahead of us, there's a, a wood-burning fireplace. Right? Right. To the left, a, a leather sofa with a Duncan Fife coffee table in front of it. Right? Hey, who's the eyes here, you or me? <laughs> in this place, I am. Boy, I can see every nook, cranny, paint stain, and speck of dust in the place. Just as clear as if I... I know. Uh, what do you think of the skylight? Must be a 12-footer. Uh, and the view. Oh, gorgeous. <laughs> hey, look at that water. Clear, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's turquoise at this time of day. Yeah. Uh, this is a terrific retreat, Doug. I can see why a guy would want to come here to paint. <laughs> when are you going to tell Eileen? Not until I'm sure. The minute old Mueller puts an okay on just one of my pictures, she'll get a letter. But not before. She's the reason why I want to paint, Mike. She's the reason why I've got to paint. And if Mueller says no? She'll never hear from me again. But look, Doc, here's the thing. Hold it. There's someone else in this room. Hello? Hello, Doug. Uh, Eileen. Door was open and I... Eileen. I didn't want you to... How did you know I, I was here? Mueller. Oh, Doug. Well, if you'll excuse me... No, Mike, wait. Uh, Eileen, this is Michael Gray, a uh, squirrel for short. How do you do? Uh, Mike's my... Well, my eyes for the time being. Uh, Mike, this is Miss Bartlett, my... My fiancé. Doug, it's been so long. All that time you were missing and... And then later, when we thought you were... I know. I didn't know what to do. It was months before we heard. Doug, I... I hadn't any idea you needed me so. Needed you? You didn't write that you were... That you were this way. I feel as if... Perhaps I could have... What are you trying to say? Doug, I'm married. I didn't hear you come in. Brother, I've got you the most ration, pointless dinner you've ever had. Eggs, 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 and more eggs. Tonight we'll have them boiled, broiled, fried, and mashed, and as omelet for dessert. Great. <laughs> <laughs> what you been doing? Painting? Well, there it is on the easel. How do you like it? Well, how do I know till I turn on the light? How you can sit here and paint in the... Oh. Sorry, Doug. How do you like it? Ah. Uh... Mm-hmm. Good. That's good. You really think so, Mike? You think it even begins to compare with the old ones on the wall? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, I don't know what it is, but that probably means it's great. Doug. Yes, Squirrel? You still set on going through with it? Mm-hmm. Still. Even now that I... Still, more than before. I've got to paint Squirrel or... I've got to paint. Mueller? Mm, good 
Good, 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 good. How long has it been now? Six months. Six months. Mm hmm. Good, good. Uh, that is to say, yes, good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You wouldn't kid an old friend? Why should I do that? Uh, answering a question with a question. Bad sign. Mueller, look me in the eyes and say there's hope. You want it from the heart? I want it from the heart. There is no hope. None. Not the slightest. Thanks. I guess I knew it all the time. I play games because... So it's dark at the blaze of noon. What? Irrevocably dark. Total eclipse. Without all hope of day. Well, where do we go from here? I told you a long time ago where we go from here. But no, suddenly you know better than Mueller. Uh, nobody knows better than Mueller. I've always agreed with you on that. You're you're always right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even when you sent Eileen. Oh, it, it was for the best. It had to be that way. For her. For you. For you. I know, I know. Well? I won't admit it's gone. My eyes, my girl, my work. What's left? I won't admit they're all gone. But they are. That is the past. What's left? You. Little boy screaming in the dark. Come out of the dark. Lead yourself. How? I told you how. Pottery. I can't. You, you can't ask me to do that. I'm an artist. Burns for sale. Help the blind. Why not apples on the street corner? Apples. The fruit of victory. Listen to me, dog. Not pottery, heads. Clay, plaster, stone, bronze, marble, who knows what. Something you can feel with your fingers. Clay. All right, clay. Look. Here and here. Heads you did in clay for me when you were only starting and they were good. Why can't they still be good? Why must you be pig-headed? Why? Why? Clay. God made man from a shapeless mass of clay. Not to be able to see, my boy, is bad. But not to want to see. That is much worse. What are you doing? Here's your hat. Here's your cane. Come with me. Tell him what I said is true. It's true, all right. Every object in this studio was done by my students. None of them has sight. Hmm. Very interesting. And lots of them have sold. Bought good prices, too. Yes, this one's rather good. See there? You can tell just by touching it. You've had good training. You've come far. Oh, proportion's good. Uh, just ahead from memory, of course. No particular likeness. Oh, of course, it's a likeness. <laughs> Tell him, Cotty. I have no more breath. All the work is done from models. Here, give me your hand. Now place your fingers lightly on my cheek. That's right. Now trace the hollows of the eye. The nose. The lips. Don't you think you could memorize the structure, the proportions? Yes. Yes, I believe perhaps I could. Yes, yes, I believe perhaps I could. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this one? This one? Oh. Good. 
Very good. More professional than the rest. Oh, yeah, much more. Thank you. Huh? I beg your pardon? You've made a compliment for the pretty teacher, Doug. That one she made herself. Oh. Well, then the old saying is wrong. The old saying? Well, I always heard it said, those who can, do. Those who can't, teach. <laughs> oh. Oh? Oh, apologies, Mueller. There are exceptions, of course. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> so the teacher is better than the class, eh? <laughs> but of course, why not? It's different for you. Not really. I'm blind, too, you know. It's good. It's good. Okay, squirrel. Isn't it, Cat? Yes, yes, it's good. <laughs> In fact, it's great. I mean, it looks like me. Doesn't it, Cat? Mm-hmm. Lear and all. All right, it looks like you and we lost a sale. Who'd be crazy enough to buy it? Oh, lots of people. My head would look swell on the top of a totem pole. What do you think it's on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Enough's enough. Well, I'm off. A uh, true confession if I ever heard one. Off to pick up Mueller. <laughs> if the jalopy will start. It's a pretty cold winter out, you know. Or wouldn't you two know? Ah, uh -uh. in here it's spring. Spring everlasting. Well, I wouldn't know about that. I've never been in love. See you geniuses in a couple of minutes. With a little surprise, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> He's right, though, Doug. The likeness is remarkable. And your work is taking on expression, too. And character. Mueller says the one of me is perfect. Because the model's perfect. Doug... You're wonderful. You're a miracle. Kathy, you've given me a whole new world. Brighter than the one I used to see when I had eyes. Having eyes and seeing aren't the same thing. People don't see just because their eyes are open. Not when their sense is shut. Yeah. Maybe I'm seeing now for the first time. When they told me that I'd never see the sun again, I... I thought my life was through. I never have seen the sun. I don't miss it. Kathy. You are the sun. Very pretty. Very pretty indeed. I mean it. From my heart. Just on a chance. You're not... making love to me. I am. Just on a chance... And, by the way, how is the chance? Rather good, I'd say. Kathy. Shh. Strangers within the gates. Age before beauty, as the saying goes. Oh, never mind. That feels just like you. <laughs> well, geniuses, here's my surprise. Step forward, Mr. Mueller. Friend, teacher, guiding star, and fairy godfather. Mueller, he's no surprise. No. No. The surprise is this check. For Cotty's head, one hundred dollars. Yankee dollars. Doug. For a face like that, a pittance. The face? <laughs> what sold it was the eyes. The expression, as if those eyes could see. As if they can't. Thank you, Mueller. Now, my surprise. Uh, step forward, Kathy. Friend, teacher, guiding star. And wife. Wife? Wife. To be. <laughs> Children, bless you both. <laughs> see, see the blush on Kathy's cheek. It's not a blush. No, Mueller, it's not a blush. Behold, the blaze of noon. is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Five After the Hour, 
by Les Weinrod. Prado Expressivo, Introduction with Expression, the original composition of Frank Smith, Andante, Allegretto, Ad Libitum, Tempo and Execution under the Baton of Cesar Petrillo. is the music of five after the hour. The play, Murder Has No Tongue. just committed the perfect crime. So perfect that you won't believe I did it. Even when I tell you. Even when I show you. Because it's the perfect crime. Julie. Why don't you fall back under your stone and leave my life alone? I got your little note. Your little love letter. Max, get out of here. Very sweet it was. Only you should have delivered it yourself. It's a wife's duty to inform her husband in person that she's no longer his wife. Big scene, brush off, leave him with a laugh. You know, a flash finish to a high class act. You're high class. Julie Reed, the plaintiff, versus Maxie Reed, the defendant. <laughs> At that, you got top billing. What do you want, Max? You got to take me back, Julie. That's right, small time. Crawl. You got to take me back. I'm no good alone. As an actor, or anything else. <gasps> what about the big single you were going to do? You don't need me. You always said so. Without me, you'd be big time. Or somebody. I was wrong. Without you, I'm nobody. You were always a nobody. You were born a nobody and you'll die a nobody. You're a somebody, I suppose. I was a somebody. Before you song and danced your way into my life. I had friends. Nice friends. I, I could have been happy if I'd married somebody else. I, I could have married Claire. Yeah, I know. Your father was a doctor. And what was yours? What did he do? Who was he? didn't even know his name. Ah, uh, cut it out. That's the life I should have had. That's the life you were going to hand me. Champagne, caviar, sables from head to toe. <laughs> you handed me champagne, all right, in a prop bottle in our act. You, you were going to put my name up in lights on Broadway a mile high. Julie, I will. <sighs> you couldn't get us booked into the lobby of the Astor. Honest, I've changed. <gasps> Don't make me laugh. Julie, I've got to have you back. I'd do anything for you, Julie. I'd, I'd die for you. I'd... I kill for you. You killed enough for me already. You killed everything I ever was or hoped to be. You killed every chance I ever had. Killed every soft and decent thing in my life. Now go ahead and die for me. I'll make it up to you, Julie. I'll buy you everything. Oh, you never bought me a flower or a box of candy in your life. Honest, I'll get to be big time, Julie. Big time? The only thing about you that was ever big time was that you looked like somebody else who was big time. Sure, in your top hat and tails, rented, of course, you looked exactly like Cappy Vane. 
Maybe that's why I fell for you. The poor man's cappy vein. The poor man's poor man? You couldn't be the sixth carbon of a man with class like Happy Vane. Julie, if I brought you all the things Not that you... if you brought me the world on a platter. Oh, you'd take the world on a platter. Not if you went with it. If I changed. Julie, if I got class. Not a chance. No one means anything to me, Julie. Nobody. You're in my blood. Keep away from me. If I could even hope to hold you in my arms to kiss you again. It wouldn't mean a thing. I don't believe that. Let go of me. I don't believe that. Let go It doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. You're out of my system like poison. Washed away. You're dead. Maxie, you're dead. I stumbled out the door and down the stairs somehow. My hands, my face, my body burned. I gasped for breath. My lungs seemed full of smoke. I struggled toward the air as if groping through a burning house. There was a beat, 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 beat inside my head like voodoo drums. I walked and walked, keeping time with the beat. Then I heard the automobile horn screeching like a million parrots. Screeching. Dead. 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 A stoplight blinked yellow and red and became a marquee on Broadway a mile high. Blinking my name, Maxie Reed. Maxie Reed, the greatest little guy that ever hit the big time. And then I heard my entrance music, and I was on. Stick, white gloves, top hat, and tails, the dance, the Dipsy Society bit, laughs, all laughs. The big prop bottle of champagne, the bow to Julie, the kiss, the faint, the finish. She carries me off, the laugh, the applause. Again the light. Yes, again the light. A mile high. But it wasn't blinking my name anymore. Now it said, Cappy Vane. Happy and I saw him in top hat and tails, pouring real champagne for hundreds of beautiful women, and they applauded too, and the applause was louder than mine. I'd never seen this man, this society playboy, except in the papers and newsreels. Neither had Julie, yet I couldn't get his face and figure and voice out of my mind. So much like me and yet so different. He was class. Champagne and caviar, sables and bright lights. To Julie, he was life. And I was deaf. And then faces began flashing past me so fast they blurred into each other like horses on a merry-go-round. Julie's face and mine and Cappy Vane's. Faster, 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 faster. And then suddenly everything stopped. And I saw only his face sharp and clear. His face. Or was it mine? I couldn't tell anymore. But at last I knew what it was I had to do. Who's who in America, sir? Oh, well, you'll find it in the reference room to your left. Open shelves under W. Last edition of the Wall Street Journal. Upstairs to your right under business and Hold All back copies of the daily papers are in the basement vaults. Uh, Mr. Grousley, will you please show this gentleman down to the vault? <laughs> Yes, we make off-the-air recordings of many radio broadcasts. We record entire programs or portions thereof. You can play it on any one of these turntables or on a home phonograph. The record is cut on acetate, you see, and can be played with good clarity quite a number of times. Uh, what particular radio program did you have in mind? <laughs> well, we're just terribly proud to have you as our special guest on the list. Have a party program, Captain Bane. Now, what's your formula for a successful party, Captain? Well, Ilza, it's perfectly simple, really. When the guests arrive, I merely throw open the front doors, throw open the kitchen, and throw open the bar. Then I sneak into the servants' quarter, cautiously arrange myself in the dumbwaiter, haul myself to the cellar, and run out the back door. It's perfectly simple, really. Simple, really. Simple, really. Simple, really. Simple. Perfectly simple, really. 
perfectly simple, really. Now I gotta try it again. Gotta try it again. Perfectly simple, really. When the guests arrive, I merely throw open the front doors, throw open the ki- Perfectly simple, really. Perfectly simple, really. Perfectly simple, really. I've got it. I've got it. Tell you once and for all, Vane, this wild spending spree has got to come to an end. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Oh, confound it, Vane. Be serious for once. You're not being fair to your sister Madeline, you know. No, you're not, Kathy. According to the terms of your father's will, Madeline is to come into a half share of the fortune on her 25th birthday. At the rate you're going, Vane, when Madeline's 25, he'll inherit a half share of nothing. Ooh. Now, I'm warning you, Vane. You'd better behave. Or... Or what? Briefly. Just this. Your mad squandering, your hair-brained antics these last years have made you a public joke. A family disgrace. The question of your sanity has become a popular subject of discussion. <laughs> As family counselor, I could easily take matters out of your hands. I've refrained up to now because of the family. But if you force my hand, I'll have you legally set aside as an incompetent. And that, briefly, is that. Come, Madeline. Good night, Kathy, darling. Sleep well. Good night, sweet sister. Too bad John or Martha aren't here to show you to the door. But I've sent them on a vacation with double pay. How nice of you. How nice of you. It's your money. You'd do well to remember what I said. I shouldn't like to have you placed in an institution. You don't turn practical. I assure you I will. And be justified in so doing. Good night, Faye. Thanks for being at home when we call. Don't worry. If I'd seen you coming, I'd have sneaked down the dumb waiter and been out the back of the river way before you could say... Who? Hmm? Talking to myself. Maybe Hamilton's right. <laughs> no, isn't that not fair? I'm very clever. Isn't the dumb waiter a clever idea? And practical. Comes in handy, doesn't it? Yes. It does. What are you doing in my study? What do you want? Who are you? What do I look like? Who do you... That's strange. You look exactly like me. I know. Incredible. As if I were looking in a mirror. Is this some practical joke? It is if you want it to be. You're famous for practical jokes. It's incredible. I agree with you. It's incredible. <laughs> Good imitation. Nobody knows you're here. Nobody saw you come in. Nobody. Yes, I can use you. Oh, what a joke I can play on Hamilton and Madeline. I can... I'm afraid the joke's on you. What do you mean? I'm going to strangle you, Mr. Vane, with this tie. I, I don't understand what you want of me, Mr. Vane. Why did you ask me to come here? At the suggestion of an old friend of yours, your former husband. Mac? He seemed to feel it was my fault you couldn't be happy with him. Oh, 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 no. Said you compared us all the time, that he couldn't live up to your expectations, that it made you very unhappy. Poor Mac. I I'm afraid he gets a little mixed up sometimes. Perhaps you should use the past tense. He may not be alive. What? He said that as long as I was alive, he was dead. In your eyes, at least. Oh. But he looked like a man who expected to end his own life very soon. Oh, no. No, not Mac. You, you don't know him. He, he's a cow. Real small time. If you know what I mean. He loved you very much. And if it was my fault that he never loved him, I... Oh, I... I loved him. 
You did. One. Oh, but here's part of my heart is closed now, like... like the lid on a coffin. He said the least I could do was to make it up to you in some way. I'd like to try. May I? It would be interesting to me. Well, you're very kind. And thank you very much. But it's no use. And if you should ever just happen to talk to him again, tell him that I still think he's small time. Will you please? Max? Wait a minute. What did you mean by that? Max, you're out of your mind. I know you anywhere when your eyes look like that. What are you doing here? Why are you dressed like that? Why do you call yourself Mr. Vane? Come with me, Julie. Where is Mr. Vane? Mr. Vane. The well-born Mr. Vane. The Mr. Vane of the top hat and tails. The Mr. Vane of distinction, class, gentility, of champagne and caviar. The original of my carbon copy. The man you told me and told me and told me was so much better than me. Where is Mr. Vane? Oh, Mr. Vane. He must be around here somewhere, Julie. Oh, Mr. Vane. Perhaps he's here in this dumbwaiter. Look! Well, what do you think of me now? Oh, no, no, don't, 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 don't look at me like that, Julia. You don't understand. I've moved up into the big time, the real class. You're mad, mad. No more prop champagne, Julie. No more props at all. Everything's real. I own the world, and I give it to you. That body in there. Dead. He's dead. But not me. Not anymore. I'm born again. Julie, I own the world, and I make you a present of it on a silver platter. I don't want it. But it's yours, Julie. Whatever I did, I did for you. You know that, don't you? Because I wanted you back. I didn't think I could do it, but you gave me strength, Julie. I found myself. I hate you. And now it's yours for the rest of your life. I can fool everybody, Julie. I've studied his walk, his talk, his looks, his family history. Oh, stay with me, Julie. Tell me that I've come alive. No, here it is, don't you see? Everything you ever wanted, everything you ever dreamed, all you could have been or hoped to be. Oh, I hate you. They'll never know. No one will know. Please. Listen to me, Julie. As the river runs behind the house, swift running water, water washes everything away. Help me. No. Help me, otherwise I'll have to stop your tongue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me why don't you... I can't. Coward. I love you, Julie. I'm going. To the police? You might as well. I'd rather be dead than live without you. No, ma'am. I'm not going to the police. I hope they don't find out. I hate you so much, I'd rather see you live. This new body. This new world of yours. Because I know what'll happen to you. I can see it in your eyes. That twisted brain of yours will snap. And I want it to. It's what you deserve. Life in darkness stales in life. Oh, now. Keep your world. I want no part of it. It's all yours. Live it. Forever. Inspector, come right in. But, Mr. Vane, you didn't have to come to my office and drag me out to your house to prove anything. I, I believe you. No, you don't. You're humoring me as if I were mad. I've told you over and over again I'm not Cappy Vane. Hello, Vane. I'm... Hello, Inspector. Hello, Hamilton. 
What are you two doing here? Excuse Madeline and me for barging in this way, Vane. Just got uh, here a moment ago. Came as soon as we received your call, Inspector. You know Vane's sister, Madeline, of course. Oh, of course. Oh, Cappy, I'm so sorry. I'm not Cappy. You're not my sister. My name is Max. Your brother Cappy's dead. What? Of course he is. Of course he's dead. He couldn't very well be alive if you killed him. Oh, Cappy. Oh, you fool, you fool. Here's your brother. Here in the dumbwaiter. Look. Gone. What's gone? The body. His body was in there. It's gone. You were right, Hamilton. He's not completely mad. You'll have to help me take him away. Sit down a moment, Dane. Here, let me help you. Julie did it. Julie took the body down. She hit it, threw it in the river. She hadn't far to go. She's strong, you know. She she used to carry me off the stage. Of course she did. Don't think about it now. She took the body down. Because she hates me. Oh, look, Vane, I want you to come with us. Let's go, Vane. Uh, no one's going to hurt you. I promise you that. No one's going to hurt you, Kathy. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to prove me mad. Vane mad. To put me away. Him away. So you can have the money. I heard you, you know. I was right here when you said it. Right here. Of course you were. Of course you were. Oh, you fools, you stupid fools. Your brother talked like this. It's really very simple. It's really very simple. Can't you see how different it is? Of course it's different. But you're not well, Cappy. You're sick. Why won't you come with us? Julie. Julie. What have you done to me? <laughs> you said my brain would... Come along now. You hear that? My entrance music, you hear? I'm on. The dance. The champagne gag. The laughs. The bow to Julie. The kiss. The faint. The finish. The laugh. The applause. And the sign on Broadway is two miles high. The flash finish to the high class act I've always dreamed about. The biggest act of all. The perfect murder. The perfect murder. <laughs> I'm big time. <laughs> Murder Has No Tongue, starred Sherman Marks in the roles of Maxie Reed and Cappy Vane. Beverly Younger was featured as Julie Reed. Original music was composed by Frank Smith, and the orchestra was under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. This origination was from the WBBM studios in the Wrigley Building, Chicago. Next week... This is Five After the Hour... By Les Weinrot. Begin with melody, add harmony. Now, sweep the bows across the strings, play the brass figures. This is the theme. for five after the hour is the original composition of Frank Smith. The orchestra is under the direction of Cesar Petrello. This is the play. Foxhole Conversation Piece. Missed. Don't let it eat you. We got them Japs holed in. They can't stay in that cave forever, and the only place they got to go is out. When they move, we get them. <laughs> <laughs> 
And if we move, they get us. This stinks. For a guy with your education, Twist, you got very little imagination. Stinks what everybody says. The Forgotten War. Huh? I said the Forgotten War. This. Oh. The Philippines are secure. Japan expects a landing on her islands any day now. And we're waiting to smoke out a handful of Japs on Luzon. So? Nothing. Forget it. Okay. I know what you mean, Twist. Glad you do, Bobo. I'm not sure myself anymore. I sure wish you two guys were normal. All the time talking and only half talking. Why don't you guys cut it out? Sorry, Hank. Have a nice meeting with your ancestors. Maybe the rest of them will surrender now. Nah, uh, they'll stay there and keep us here until we get them all. They got no brains. They ain't human. We know. I'm hungry. You guys ever get to wondering about how real food tastes? Okay, I'll shut up. Itch. If you don't pull your seat down, you'll get scratched, but good. There. They still got grenades. They still got everything. They're bound to run out. Sometime. Sure. Hey, Twist. Yeah? What's the date today? I mean, back home. Fourth. That's what I thought. Hey, have you gone nuts? It's the fourth, ain't it? Have you got it out of your system? Lay off, will you? I'm sorry. Forget it. When I was a kid, we used to set off a string of firecrackers under the old man's bed. Right at daybreak. Put him in a tin pan. Made a hell of a racket. Then, the old man, he'd get up and go to the window and fire off his 38. Wake everybody in the neighborhood. We always had a picnic. The whole family, cousins and all. Drove out to Elmwood. Took Grandma along. <laughs> she always had to have a rocking chair. Used to strap it on the trunk rack. I went on a picnic with my grandmother once. Wasn't much fun. How come? My governess made all the arrangements. Oh. Whole clan used to gather. Dad and my uncle would set up a keg of beer. They play softball in the morning, poker in the afternoon. My old lady never approved of poker. I never write her that I play. Did they have a parade in your town, Hank? Sure. Old Major Morgan, he let it. Was the marshal. Used to rent a horse from Martin's Ice Company. <laughs> we kids all knew the horse. Horse knew us. Used to make the Major mad when we'd call out at him. We had a parade. Down Main, over to Fifth, and out to Warner's Park. Had fireworks in the evening. So did we. Always ended up with a batch of skyrockets and a Big scene in fireworks. Like the sinking of the main? Uh-uh. Picture the president in the flag. Let's. Have races in the afternoon? Sure. <laughs> Three-legged race, sack race, peanut race, all of them. Uh-huh. I want to catch his mid once. Left it overnight at five points. Rain. Stuffing came out and ruined the pack. Bill's outfit. Uh-huh. Only part I didn't like was the speeches. Old lady made me listen. I used to sneak away when I got the chance. Mayor always talked. And some big shot from out of town. My sister used to recite the preamble to the Constitution. Then the band would play and we'd salute the flag. The mayor was a big flannel mouth. Used to get red in the face and pound the table. Break nearly a whole pitcher of ice water. One time he got so excited he knocked the microphone down. Sure made a hell of a crash in the loudspeakers. We, the people of the United States, in order to huh? form a more perfect union... Ain't that the Declaration of Independence? Preamble to the Constitution. Didn't you guys have to learn it? Sure, but nothing like that ever stays with me. Me either. 
I'd learn the stuff just long enough to say it when I had to. Then I'd forget it. You remember the rest of it, Twist? Establish justice. Ensure domestic tranquility. Now. Where'd those come from? The hill. First time any fire came from there. Think they moved? I don't know. If they got around to the hill, it ain't healthy here. What do you mean here? I'm going to see if I can draw their fire. Take it easy, Twist. We got nothing but time. Right. They're there, they're there. Hold your fire unless they answer. Okay. There, there. Bad. We gotta get word to Bill's outfit. You guys. Who stay... told you to be a hero? Maybe if we hold out here. We can't. You can pour it right down on us. I'm gonna get to Bill. Let's hike hard for it. I'm going. I thought this was supposed to be a citizen's army. You guys start shooting, keep them occupied. Okay. I'll wait another five minutes. The sun will be right over the hill then. Maybe something will happen meanwhile. Yeah, maybe something will happen. We'll sweat it out. That's all that will happen. I'll get the bill and his fit outfit will cross back of the hill. Uh-huh. Hmm. What? Nothing. Just had a funny thought. Thinking about those Joes that fought in the revolution. What about them? You know the pictures we had in our history books? Like Washington crossing the Delaware and the spirit of 76? And the one about Valley Forge, uh, where they're standing around the fire? What about them? I just had a screwy thought. Never thought of those guys being guys like us. What do you mean, guys like us? What do you mean, guys like us? Well... It's kind of hard to explain. You see a picture in a history book. The guy's dead now, see? Yeah. Well, the whole thing's dead. Uh, like in a movie. They're supposed to be real. But you know they're actors. These guys in the pictures in the history books. They were kind of like actors. I mean, they weren't real. Till now. You're growing up, Hank. What do you mean, growing up? I mean, you're seeing history in the right perspective for the first time. You don't make any more sense than Hank. Go ahead, Twist. No, you finish. Okay. I'm laying here thinking about the 4th of July. That takes me back to school. To Miss Werner. I had her in sixth grade. Uh, she spoiled history for me. Used to pour it on. Dates, 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 dates. And then? I get to thinking about the book we had. It had brown covers. It was a big book. Charlie Larson hit me over the head with one once. Nearly knocked me out. I get to remembering the pictures in it. Now, the guys never looked human. They were so... So lousy, noble-looking. No funny uniforms and all. And then all of a sudden, it hurts me. They were Joes like us. They were G.I.s just like us. Never thought of it like that. Sure. Sure, they had to be. Why didn't they teach us that, Twist? Why would they tell us that? Oh, maybe you can't tell a little kid things like that so he'll understand them. And maybe after this war they will tell him. Tell him that in every war, it was always a bunch of young guys. Guys who'd never been away from home before, for the most part. Guys who did the ordinary things kids did in whatever year they were born. Guys who got homesick for their mothers. Guys who had sweethearts and wives and kids. To think of them guys in the Revolutionary Army. Guys like us. They were like us in Caesar's legions. All G.I.s are G.I.s anytime. And all wars are alike in the fighting. It's always for a little patch of ground. 
few yards, few feet. Like the hill there? Like the hill there. And they're fought for the same things, pretty much. One bunch of guys decides to push the people around. People take so much pushing, and then they get mad. And when they get mad, they start fighting the guys that are pushing them around. That's war. And the guy's fighting it. They're always laying on the ground. And they're always dirty. And they're always hungry. It ain't real hunger. I mean, it ain't like when you're home. They sure ain't got the range. Sun's in their eyes. Give me a couple of minutes and open fire. Stay put for about a half an hour, and okay, then... Okay, Twist. Do good. Thanks. Tell Bill he still owes me a buck thirty-five. I'll tell him. Good guy. Yeah. Went to college and all, didn't he? Couple of them. How come he didn't try for a commission? Turned it down. Oh. Got a wife and two kids. I know. Good soldier. Yeah. Doing okay. So far. Time for us to... Can you see? No. What do we do? We stay put. But twist. We stay put. Okay. Hank? Yeah? Can you see anything? No. Maybe that was Bill's out there. You know damn well that was twist. I know. Think we ought to try him out? No sense to it now. Twist either made it or... Yeah. Either he did or... I almost wish those rats would make a bonsai charge. <laughs> waiting, waiting. Bearing down on the same place. Yeah. Well, give it back to him, Twist. Give it back to him. How come he don't shoot? He must have got through. You got through to Bill. That's how come. We wait another couple of minutes and then we... Twist set to stay put. Twist out there. How do you know? I don't know how, but he's out there. They got him. Ah, why do they keep pouring it on that one spot for? You just said the reason why. Because Twist is out there. Come on. From the cave and the hill. Uh -huh. Lay still till they simmer down. Now... This way. Right. But keep behind this patch. Okay. Closer. Yeah, still peppering that one spot. Now. Look. Twist. They hit him. They know. A twist. We don't do many good if we draw any more fire to where he's laying. Now, try to crawl without moving anything. And this stuff? Try. We lost a lot of blood. Yeah, that'd be far. No. Wonder Shut if... Shut up. Provide for the common defense? Promote... General welfare. I hear him. We're coming, Twist. A move. General welfare. A move. Some over here. Gentlemen. The Continental Congress. Who's he talking to? The gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Franklin. Owes us an appropriation of general welfare. Purpose of sustaining life in the body of one Sergeant Twist. He's out of his head. The bless 
seems liberty the commonwealth of virginia joins a, a motion to bestow the blessings of liberty on sergeant twist it's okay twist we're here it's us hank and bobo Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Hancock, how good of you. Shoulder, left leg, in the guts, right in the guts. Medic, we got... In the guts, I tell you. Philadelphia? I can tell you about Philadelphia. I can tell you the whole story. How, how it's going to happen. We're going to win. Clean the last chap out of Philadelphia. Oh, God. The, the people. The people. Ask the people what they want. Steady twist. Take it easy. Easy? It's not easy. Nothing's ever easy. And this is important. The hill. The hill. They called it Bunker Hill. Assemble the members of the Congress. Read the preamble, if you will. Please, Mr. Hancock. We, the people of the United States, we, the people, that means all the people. You know them, Mr. Jefferson, and you, Mr. Franklin, and you, General, speak up. Tell them that all the people means little and big, rich and poor, black and white, and shades in between. Tell them that it means Christian and Jew and freethinker. You must tell them. We'll tell them, Twist. We'll tell them. Just like you said, Twist. Mother, Mother, the hill, they've worked up there. Mother, take care of Bobo and Hank. She hears your twist. Establish justice. That's important, Mr. Hayes. Without justice, you're, you're without. Order to form a more perfect union. Get that, Bobo? More perfect union. You gotta keep trying. Keep working at it. You can't relax. Ensure domestic tranquility. Domestic tranquility. That's fancy a happy home. That's why we've got to clear the hill. God bless her happy home. Provide the common defense. That means defend yourself far away so you can be safe in your happy home. Clear the hill out here on Luzon. That's the common defense. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Posterity. Little Paula and Billy. Daddy's gone a-honey. Seems of liberty. Daddy, oh, 
bring them home. Daddy will bring home the blessings of liberty for you kids. And it'll be yours. The beautiful, wonderful blessings of liberty. They'll sparkle like diamonds. And shine like gold. And they'll make you laugh and make you happy. The blessings of liberty. the common defense, the general welfare, and the blessings of liberty. Sign here for the people of the United States. Sign here. The ink is warm. And do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Sign here. Foxhole Conversation Piece was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrot and star Johnny Coons in the role of Twist. Ralph Camargo in the role of Bobo, and Norman Gottschalk in the role of Hank. Original music was composed by Frank Smith, and the orchestra was under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. Five After the Hour was originated in the studios of WBBM Chicago, and will be heard at this same time next Wednesday night. <laughs> Nordine speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago 11. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. <laughs> to introduce the play, music to set the mood, music as a prelude to words. Original composition for five after the hour by Frank Smith. Interpretation by the orchestra under the direction of Cesar Petrello. And now, sweep the theme to conclusion and prepare for the play. After the Hour brings you a love story, pure and simple. Principal ingredients for a love story, a place like Brooklyn at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning, a girl named Millie, and a boy named Joe. Also, various lines from assorted poems. That's about all you have to know about this story, called Make Out with a Poem. Look, 
Look, Millie, I'm asking you again like I've been asking you for the past three years. Are you or you're not going to marry me? Really, Joe? That is no way to propose to a lady. Are you or aren't you going to marry me? You might as well be saying, are you or aren't you going to tell me the time of day? As romantical as saying, shoot the sherbet to me, Herbert. The effect's all the same. I never called you Herbert. Gosh, Millie. The trouble with you, Joe, is you do not know how to be romantic. Romantic? That's a laugh. After all the time we've been going together, I ought to call you sis. You've got to have poetry in your soul to be romantic. Our whole life is a poem, Joe. Did you know that? What kind of talk is that? Life is a poem. Honestly, Millie, sometime I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about poetry, Joe. Rhymes and beautiful thoughts and beautiful words. Well, if it's rhymes you want, I can recite you every one of them like the shave signs between here and Jersey City. Or I can recite, there was a young lady from Yonkers. Yo! I don't mean that kind of poetry. I mean, uh, uh, poetry. Huh? Real poetry. The kind of words that make you feel you got clouds under your feet. The kind of words that make you hear music when, when there isn't any music playing. You feeling okay, Millie? Honestly, Joe, you got the soul of a, a garage mechanic. But, Millie. I am a garage mechanic. Well, you don't have to think like one, do you? You don't have to talk like one, do you? Anyone can talk poetic like if they only put their mind to it. Yeah, I can just hear the guys down at the garage if I begin spouting poetry. I'd never live it down. Joe, you wouldn't be doing it for the boys down at the garage. You'd be doing it just for me. Doing it? Doing what? What are you talking about? Uh, listen, Joe, I read about it in the paper just the other day. It's over in Manhattan. They call it a school for poets. And for $10, they absolutely guarantee to have you talking poetry in two weeks. Oh, please, Joe, go on over and let them teach you to talk like a Shelley or Wordsworth or a Keats or something. That, that's part of their ad. You can have your choice as to which poet you want to talk like. Millie, are you nuts? Quite to the contrary, Joe. I am very serious. Well, it's out. All the way out. I should go to school to learn to talk like a longer. <laughs> no thanks. Then, I am afraid I cannot marry you, Mr. Mahoney. Oh, Millie, come off it, will you? Good night. Okay. okay, what's the address of the journey? Joe, Joe, do you mean it? You're going to do it? Yeah, I'm going to do it. But I know I'm going to hate myself in the morning. Uh, excuse me. You are excused, sir. That much is true. Now, what can we poets do for you? Uh... A certain party wants I should sound like a poet. I see. What sort of poetry did you have in mind? The ballad, the sonnet, or the epic kind? I don't know. What you got on the menu? Well, our curriculum covers, the catalog states, the poetical field from Arnold to Yeats. With Homer and Virgil, Cervantes and Burns, Schiller and Goethe, you'll learn them by turns. Milton and Wordsworth, Dryden and Dunn, and the sonnets of Shakespeare we take one by one. Never heard of the bums. What's their batting averages? Hmm. Then there's Shelley and Byron, Browning and Gray, Whitman, Rossetti and Stephen Bonet, Bryant, Sandberg, Jeffers, Thoreau, McLeish, Millay and E.A. Poe. And we also teach upon request the philosophical writings of Edgar Guest. If this isn't enough from which to draw, we'll throw in Falstaff Openshaw. He kills me. But, uh... Millie says I should go high class. Now choose from this list, and before you know it, we'll have you speaking like a poet. Okay, it's a deal, and I'm taking the works. The whole works. I guess I'll show Millie talk like a poet, she says. Okay. So I'll talk like the whole book of poets. When do we begin, mister? If it's the entire course you're looking for, we'll start at once. Right through this door. Uh, hey, if you don't mind, uh, 
I'd like to get exposed to some of that romantical stuff right away. Certainly. The romance department and Miss Willoughby make a very fine pair, as you shall see. Oh, the registrar. Did you call? I'm here and ready to give my all. Oh, what am I saying? That is the head of the romantical department. I assume you wish to learn words of romance. All right, this will be your first chance. Rhyme the word love. Rhyme love. With uh, what, for instance? Well, dove. Love, dove. Yeah, I get it. Uh, but uh, what's it mean? No, a rhyme toil. Oh, sure, that's easy. Goyle. Pardon? Goyle. Goyle. A female lassie. Goyle. Goyle. Mm -hmm. Ooh. <laughs> Your pronunciation is most amusing. Your speech pattern, shall we say, confusing? Yes, let's say that. Confusing. confusing. <laughs> but uh, put your mind at ease. Through our course, you'll breathe. We'll make of you a splendid bard. But, but you, you must, must work, work very, very, very hard. Once more, please, Mr. Mahoney. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee. Love is the blossom where there blows everything that lives or grows. He that loves a rosy cheek or a coral lip admires or from star-like eyes doth seek fuel to maintain his fires. <laughs> the past two weeks have been well spent. You've gone to good from worse. Uh, I mean worse. Your graduation present is this anthology of verse. Motor's missing, buddy. You give it a look, see? If the motor's missing, look around, or maybe try the lost and found. Oh, wise guy, huh? Look, buddy, I'm in a hurry, so do not give out any games. Okay, my command is your desires. Kindly expose your ignition wires. Hey, do you always talk like that? No, just in my waking hours, I suppose. My dreams is all the purest prose. <clears throat> look at that engine. You gotta agree, it's a mess of wrecking an oddity. Huh? The carburetor's full of carbon, the gas is full of dirt, and there ain't a drop of oil, not one blessed little squirt. Hey, look. Your ball bearings look like buckshot, the differential's out of whack. You better get those spark plugs ground, or else they're gonna crack. No. The wheels need realigning, the muffler does not muff. My advice is to you to get a horse and junk this hunk of stuff. Listen, buddy, I ain't asking for advice. I'm telling you to fix her up and in a hurry. I ain't got all day. It is true we aim to please the folks, but we cannot fix practical jokes. All I want is a little service. And what do I get? Insults. Nothing but insults. Where's the owner of this here garage? I do not have to be insulted. And in poetry yet. <laughs> times do I have to tell you that my name ain't Millie? It's Millicent. Millicent Rose, to be exact. Okay, Millicent Rose. But listen, Millie. What are you doing here in the middle of the morning? Why aren't you at the garage? I'm trying to tell you, Millie. Joe. Joe, you didn't get fired, did you? No. Oh, that's good. I was afraid I for a minute you might have had a fight with... You quit? Yeah. Yeah? Is that all you can say? Yeah? What did you go and do that for? Millie, you wanted I should talk like a poet, so I did what you desired. But because poems and garages don't mix at all, I quit before I got fired. Listen, Joe, 
Don't blame me because you sound so ridiculous when you open your mouth. I did not want for you to talk like a poet all the time. Just when you was proposing to me. Okay, Millie, so I'm proposing, and naturally I'm supposing that because I'm rhyming a beautiful thought, you'll marry me pronto, like you should ought. Joe, you have still got the soul of a garage mechanic. Coming up here in broad daylight, in a pair of greasy overalls, standing there with your hands in your pocket, asking me to be your wife. I give up, Joe. I really give oh, up. Oh, Millie, For the honey. last time... There has got to be a moon, Joe. And music. And shadows on the bridge. And wind making the water ripple. That's poetry. Okay, Millie. I'll pick you up tonight at eight. We'll try it again no, and Joe, make... I cannot marry you as long as you have not got a job. What would we live on? We cannot eat poetry. But Millie... The name is still Millicent, and the subject is closed. I will not marry you until you can support me in the style to which a lady should easily get accustomed. But Millie... Good day, Mr. Mahoney. Mr. Mahoney, glad you've come back. You won't be in a minute, you poetical quack. What's that? I wanted to learn some romantic words, but this perpetual dry... Rhyming is strictly nerds. I'm out of a job and I ain't got a girl. And when I finish with you, your long hair's gonna curl. Please, now keep your distance, Mr. Mahoney. Blaming me is pure baloney. Maybe this'll change your tune. It's guaranteed to make you swoon. No, oh, sir. Slugging me is not quite cricket. In fact, I find it downright wicked. But you've won a prize. I cannot withhold $100 of the nation's gold, plus a position fit for the bards, composing rhymes on greeting cards. You mean roses are red, violets are blue? That's it, exactly. Good luck, and a two. Mr. Mahoney, we need a poem for our new shipment of Mother's Day card. Right, Miss Fidget. Take a rhyme. Ready, Mr. Mahoney? Uh, when I come home at eventide, the first thing that I see is my charming gray-haired mother just waiting there for me. Got that? Mm, sweet. She cooks my meals. She mends my socks. She regulates my life. And mother is the reason why I haven't got a wife. Look at this nice card I've got from my son. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Charming, gray-haired mother. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And mother is the reason why I haven't got a wife. Isn't that a lovely star? Ah, Johnny's such a sweet boy, matron. Sometimes I wish I hadn't poisoned his wife. Mr. Mahoney, Barton's real estate agency would like a poem about homes. We have none... Sit down, time. Miss Fidget. Uh, what are we waiting for? Why, Mr. Mahoney... Take a poem, Miss Fidget. To know the joys of living, to know the love of friends, to know just what a home can mean when the turn in the day's road ends, to know that your kids are happy. That's what a home is made for. But naught can compare with the feeling you get when you know that the jerk is paid for. Um, show me, old boy. Listen to this card I bought for Sandra. Right, old Thurston. I've never liked babies. But you see, my baby is as pretty as she can be. With eyes of blue and dimples, too. With hair of burnished gold. 
She's honest and fair, and I love her true. My baby, who's 20 years old. Oh, <laughs> very good, Thurston. Uh, Chumley, there's a diamond bracelet that goes with it, but don't you dare tell my wife. Mr. Mahoney, you're a very clever man. Your greeting card poems are sweeping the country. But, uh, Mr. Mahoney, you're wasting your time. The place for you, sir, is in advertising. And uh, that's why I'm here today. My company is prepared to offer you... Ladies, do your hands suffer from? Are they, well, that way? When he reaches for your pretty paw, does he draw away? Hmm? When you look at your hands, do you go? Yes! Ladies, you've made a horrible error if you've got hands that are a terror, but still your paws can be a dream if you slosh them around in Cree, me, Cree! Ladies and gentlemen, the jingle you have just heard was the original composition of Joe Mahoney, noted writer. For another original composition by Mr. Mahoney, stay tuned to the station for exactly 30 seconds. Gentlemen of the Congress, the solution is clear. Conscript Joe Mahoney. A man of cheer. Employ his talent. Use his brain. He's our man. He'll cure the pain of world disorder. War and strife. He'll make all nations man and wife. <laughs> Well, Millicent Rose, will you be my wife to have and to hold the rest of my life? Joe, you have to propose that way. I've told you, darling, time after time, you started me out on a life of rhyme. Poetry, poetry, always poetry. But look, my sweet, I've gone to the top by making rhymes, and now I can't stop. Think, just think what our life will be with just you and me and little he. I can see him now toddling down the walk, rhyming rhymes and baby talk. Daddy? Hello, Junior. What's on your mind? Have you lost a plaything you can't find? Confide in your father. Tell him all. Tell him everything, big and small. Her fathers are friends and counselors, too. Come on, Junior. What's eating you? Daddy, father, counselor, and friend... This is the beginning, not the end. Daddy, please come play with me. I'm just as lonely as I can be. When I'm alone, it's not any fun. I wish I was two instead of just one. No, no, I can't stand now, it. Now, Mother, cease your cry of woe. We implore you, Joe and Joe. Be romantic. Make with a poem. Right. Take joy in this our happy home. Join us in our life of rhyme. For fun and joy and great good times. Be happy, carefree, think up a verse. Come take me, darling, for better or worse. March down the aisle, carrying blossoms of orange. While I'll... While I'll... While I'll... Orange. 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 Dorian, Dorian, Zorian, Millie, it's gone, Millie, I've lost it. Oh, oh, Make Out with a Poem was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrat, with lyrical assistance from Carol Lederer. 
The music was the original composition of Frank Smith, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Make Out with a Poem starred Elmira Ressler as Millie and Anna Wainwright as Joe. Supporting players were Constance Crowder, Charles Irving, Sherman Marks, Janet Niles, Tom Moore, and Norma Jean Ross. Poetical acknowledgments with thanks to Burns, Shelley, Wordsworth, Keats, Browning, oh, uh, and of course, Joe Mahoney. Attention, young women of America. The United States Cadet Nurse Corps offers you your opportunity. Military requirements in the all-out against Japan have created an acute shortage of nurses on the home front. If we are to have enough nurses to maintain civilian nursing services and to meet the further needs of the armed forces, the U.S. Public Health Service must enroll 60,000 new student nurses in the Cadet Nurse Corps. If you are between 17 and 35 years of age a high school graduate with a good scholastic record and in good health. This is addressed to you. All expense scholarships are now available to qualified young women. Apply to your local hospital or write to U.S. Public Health Service, Box 88, New York 8, New York, for full information. Do a woman's work in the fight for victory. Join the Cadet Nurse Corps. after the hour originated in the studios of WBBM Chicago and will be heard next week at the same time. Ken Nordine speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago, 11. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrock. <laughs> Weave a tapestry of music. Bow the strings for color. Blow the horns for depth. Stroke the harp for highlights. This is the scene. Music for Five After the Hour is the original composition of Frank Smith. And the orchestra is under the direction of Caesar Petrello. This is the play. The course of true love, of course. This is not where you would expect to hear music such as this, for these notes comprise a love song. And this is a newspaper office, the office of a great metropolitan daily. To be specific, the classified advertising department of that newspaper. You know, the department where you advertise for your lost watch, where hope will seek four walls and a roof over their heads, where you find a job or a slightly used set of dishes. Nevertheless, there is that music, the music of love, of deep, soul-searing sighs, of muttered and smothered... Yes, forever, darling. Which makes it very curious, and as a matter of fact, is the reason for this piece. 
You are, then, an eavesdropper in the classified advertising department of the Daily Universe. And what happens is stranger than the truth. So I said to him, I said, Herbert, we've got to come to an understanding. Yeah. Herbert, I said, I can't go on like this any longer. <laughs> you should have seen the look on his face. Hello, Daily Universe Classified. Uh, Miss Bell speaking. I want to put an ad in the paper. My lawyer says I should serve notice. I ain't going to pay for my wife's bills no longer. The rate for such disclaimers is $1 per line. The three-day rate, that is, the same advertisement run for three consecutive days, gives you a reduction of one-third. Do you wish the usual notice? Having left my bed and board, I hereby proclaim that I will no longer be responsible for any debts incurred by... and so forth. Yeah. And start it right away, will you? Before she bankrupts me. Your notice will be inserted in the next edition. Your name, address, and phone number, please. Another I will know. Mm -hmm. Mondays are always the worst. Mm Mm-hmm, they sure are. Guess it's because most couples' fights come on the weekend. Yeah, that's probably it. And see if you can put it in big letters and on top where she'll be sure to see it. Your notice will be given the proper attention, Mr. Eminon. Thank you very much. Men. Yeah. So go on. What did you say to Herbert? Men. They're all alike. Selfish, mean, and, and hateful. I despise all of them. All of them. But Herbert... Herbert is a goon. He, he's a man, a prospective, I will know. You're not gonna... I am. Herbert and all the rest of them. They're all alike. But what'll you do on Saturday night? I'll curl up with a good book. And if Herbert sticks his little head in, I'll throw it at him. You sure are down on him. I'm down on all of them. Listen, if Sonny Tufts and Van Johnson both came in here together... I'd faint. Van Johnson. That hair. Herbert has no hair to speak of. And if he had as much as Harpo Marks, I'd still feel the same. He must have done something terrible. I don't wish to discuss it. The subject is closed. Herbert and all the rest of them... Did I say Van Johnson? Look. Oh, my phone. Darn, I never classified, Miss Ford speaking. Lost and found, yes. The locket, yes. Sentimental value, yes. Reward, yes. Excuse me. Yes? I, uh, I'd like some information. Do you wish to place an advertisement? Uh, that's just it. I, I don't know if it's the right thing to do. Hey, you see, I'm private... Bag. Bag? Yes, bag. B-A-G-G. Go ahead, lady, make the crack about a sad bag. That's why I didn't tell her. That's why I said Ronald. You see? No. No, you don't. I guess I'll go visit the squirrels. They'll understand. Are, um, are you in trouble? Yes and No. Yes, I'm in sort of trouble. No, the trouble doesn't make sense. Neither do I, I guess. My first name is Ronald. Uh, I was afraid it'd sound like that. If you can tell me the nature of the advertisement you wish to place, perhaps I Oh, I I couldn't hear. You... You couldn't... uh, No, of course not. I couldn't what? I mean, if you could have a Coke with me or something, it's really very mixed up. I'll meet you down at the drugstore in ten minutes. I have a relief then. Uh, You will? Mm. Oh, swell. Gosh, that's wonderful. Uh, The drugstore downstairs. Oh, Oh, I don't know how to think. (sighs) All men are goons. You hate them. They're selfish and mean. Ha. Oh, so boys. And with? And I had to get caught with a lost and found. (laughs) 
so last Sunday, I'm at the G.I.'s retreat. You know, the place the city fixed up in the park? Yes. And I'm walking along the beach, and I come to the fence. There's a fence there that separates the retreat from the public beach. And there she is. Dorothea. And you climbed the fence? Uh, no, no, I just looked. She had on one of those beach things. One of those very... Little beach thing? Uh-huh. Here's your coax, Miss Bell. Oh, oh, uh, thanks, Rudy. Well, we got into conversation. You know how it is. Everybody talks to a soldier. I know how it is. I told her my name was Ronald. It is. You understand how I feel about the bag part. <laughs> she said her name was Dorothea. Well, we talked, and she said I could call her up. That's why I came into your office today. Private bag. I'm a hard-working business gal who supports herself. My work isn't what you might call light labor. I try not to complain, but... I'm afraid I can't help you. Take your problem to Miss Tellu. She writes the advice to the Lovelorn column. But you don't understand. Maybe Miss Tellu will. Uh, Rudy! Oh, allow me, please. Uh, don't you think I might possibly contact Dorothea through the personal column of the universe? You see, Dorothea didn't tell me her last name either. And I lost the phone number. <laughs> Private bag. You're the most helpless man I ever knew. Here. I'll write an advertisement right now and we'll get her number. Uh, Dorothea, you lost your number, please. Give it to me again. Want to call you? Sign. Run. There. And you better take the three day rate so she'll be sure to see it. So? I said I'd write the ad, and I did. And Private Bag is a goon, even if he is good looking. And I'm sorry you didn't draw him. I'm not. I suppose he isn't good looking. He could be a dreamboat. I met Dorothea. When? How? She came up right after you and he went out. Listen, Ronald, why didn't you call? I'm disappointed. You sounded so uh, sincere. Signed, Dorothea. Oh, you dope. Why didn't you hold her or, or send her down to the drugstore? How did I know you weren't shopping? Sorry, Took the three day race. But don't you think that. Very well. I will run the advertisement just as you have given it to me. No, no, I'm sorry, but I cannot withdraw your first advertisement. But it has two more days to run. You paid for it on the three-day rate, and you have two more insertions coming. Very well, I will read your advertisement back. Ronald, if my telephone number meant no more to you than that, forget the whole thing. I have signed Dorothea. I'm sorry, Private Bag. We are not allowed to devote such information. No, I cannot give you any information on the lady's last name. Or her telephone number. I'm sorry. Yes, I'll, I'll take it. Go ahead. Dorothea. It did mean more. How can I tell you how much more... If you don't give me your number, please. And if you don't like what I have to say, you can hang up. A sign wrong. I want to run an ad. A three day raid? Yes. Run it for three days, and if it doesn't do any good, run it for three more. Ready to take it down? 
Okay, here goes. Dorothea, please give the poor guy your telephone number. <gasps> Haven't you ever lost anything? If you don't, you may be sorry the rest of your life. I know. <gasps> Got that? Mm-hmm. Right. What name? Oh, a uh, sign it. Interested reader. Yes, it might be well to run the notice for three days. Very well. Are you ready? Ronald, do not feel badly. This young woman would probably not be good for you in the long run. It is said they understand but little who understand only what can be explained. There. Do you have it? Very well. Sign it to one who understands. to you from the learned Seneca. It was he who said, what once were vices are now the manners of the day. Well, not that I accuse the young men and women of today of vices, but I do point my finger at them and say, you are bereft of good manners. You are casual in your meetings. You enter into associations with each other without proper investigation, without proper introduction. You have gone far afield from the manners of your mothers and fathers. You accept the uh, pickup as the proper mode of alliance. You carry your flirtations into the columns of the newspaper. As Seneca said, I repeat, what once were vices are now the manners of the day. Uh, remind me to call the White House. <clears throat> also the cable beaver, bro. <clears throat> And then tell Irving to hold the presses and get ready to replace the editorial page. I'm going to dictate an editorial, signed by myself. Very well, Mr. Furbisher. Shall I take it in shorthand? Uh, <clears throat> no. I'll put it on the record. <clears throat> uh, notes off the publisher's cup. Put it in caps. <clears throat> now, sub it. America need not worry about its youth. This nation was founded by young people, by uh, husky, vigorous young people. America needed strong backs, the facile minds, to win an empire from a wilderness. Paragraph. Some self-appointed critics of our youth of today are throwing up their hands in great alarm of the casualness of our young people's manners. Paragraph. We who came up the hard way, we who sprung from the people, know that fancy manners never created an empire. We who are the church slaves of America know that the manners of the silk hats are only a shoddy covering for their sins. Paragraph. If it is a sin for a boy and a girl to strike up an acquaintance in a casual manner, then our nation is indeed in dire danger. Paragraph. But we who pioneered America know our forefathers had no time for fancy land mannerisms while they were clearing the forests, fighting the Indians. Breaking the soil. 
paragraph. This observer has no fears for America's future. This observer believes in America's future. This observer believes in America's youth. And put that hand in caps. And in the hasty manners of American youth, let's win the war first. And worry about our manners after that. And now, have uh, Camargo knock off a cartoon showing a boy and a girl, make boy a soldier, holding hands and uh, facing a uh, facing the sun. And uh, have him label the sun uh, America's future. And uh, put this caption over the cartoon. Don't worry about pickups. Now, let me get this straight. You want to run what? kind of an ad. Remember, Mr. Eminem? You know, I ran that ad saying I wasn't going to be responsible for the old lady's debts no more. Oh, yes. Well, me and the old lady, we, we've been reading about Ronald and Dorothy uh, through their ads, you know, and we both decided to kiss and make up. The old lady and me were both pretty stubborn, you know. So we want to run some kind of an ad saying we ain't mad no more. And that the old lady can charge the stuff just like she used to. And it's all right with me. Dorothea. Yes, Ronnie? This... This is nice, isn't it? Yes, it sure is. I sure wanted to see you. Mm Mm-hmm. This sure is... Sure is swell. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure is. Well, I gotta be getting back to camp. Mm-hmm. And before I go, I want to say... Yes? This sure is wonderful. So I said to him, Herbert, I said... We gotta come to an understanding. And, and what did he say? <laughs> when he is. He turns to me and he gives me that Clark Gable grin. You know, the crooked mouth stuff. Mm. Mm. Hello, how Daily Universe classified, Miss Bell speaking. Uh, hello, Miss Bell. Uh, this is Ronald, a private bank. Yes, private bank. Oh, it's him. Now we'll find out. I just called up to thank you. Oh, that's all right. Then you did see Dorothy. Oh, sure. I saw her. How is she? How is everything? Oh, she's fine. It was very nice. Yeah, real nice. What, Cook? Real nice? Yeah, real nice. And I sure want to thank you. Oh, oh, that's all right. And Miss Bell. Yeah, yep, I'm popping with curiosity. Uh, Miss Bell, I'd like to put another ad in the paper. Uh, could I give it to you over the phone and come down and pay for it tomorrow? It's kind of important. No, of course, private bag. Do you know what you want to say? Oh, yes, I have it all written out. Uh, just a minute till I find the envelope. He's going to run another ad. Brother, is that Dorothea a tough nut to crack? She's playing it smart. I don't understand. What don't you Here understand? Here it is, Miss Bell. Uh, are you ready? Go ahead, private bag. If the young 
lady wearing the white bathing suit with the red dots who talked with a soldier last Sunday at the fence at the GI retreat will answer this ad, giving her phone number. The soldier will call her. He is very anxious. That's it, Miss Bell. <gasps> and, Miss Bell, if you don't mind, sign it Clark. That's my middle name. of True Love, of course, was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrath, of course. Original music was the composition of Frank Smith, and the orchestra was under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. Heard on tonight's Five After the Hour were Jane Elliott, Johnny Coons, Janet Niles, Charles Irving, Muriel Fagan, Tom Moore, Norman Gottschalk, and Joan Lundeen. Live After the Hour originates in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago, and will be heard next Wednesday night at this same time. Ken Nordine speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago 11. This program will be interrupted in the event of important news developments. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrath. <laughs> The strings sing, blow softly on the reeds, mute the trumpets, for this is the theme. Hey, wait a minute, hold it. Important memo from the front office. From HLA. Right, listen. What about comedy variety show scheduled for five after the hour? Yeah, but the show was set for tonight. How can we make a change at the last... Sorry! Emergency memo from front office. This is a must. Comedy variety program must go on tonight. But the show is rehearsed and we're on the air. What do you this mean? This is it. It's in his own handwriting. What do you mean? What do you it's say? in the red ink and it's underlined. And it says... Well... Get the writer. Get the director. Get the producer. Here he comes now. All three of them. Well, Weinrot? You heard what HLA wants? How are you going to get out of this one? Yeah, what about the comedy variety show, huh? Yeah, well, well, don't uh, just stand there like a like a writer, director, producer. Say something. Yeah, like HLA says. Well? He's typing. It's very good. Yeah, hold it, hold it. Stand by for comedy variety show. Huh? Title for show. Announcer to read. Les Weinrot presents The Tickle Rib, a comedy variety show. Caesar Petrillo and the orchestra over the show with June is busted out all over.
Caesar, and thank you, boys. And now, and now, what comes next? Well, he's typing again. Yeah. Call Variety. Get comedy writers, stooges, and star comic. HLA isn't going to approve of this. He certainly isn't. Tell HLA and front office I have but one, but one. Well, what happened? I got his finger stuck in the E. <laughs> there. there. Hey, he's loose. Tell HLA and front office I have but one typewriter to give to my network and call Variety now. Variety. Hunt warbling. Hey, look, Bill, I'm calling for five after the hour. We're in a jam. We need comedy writers, stooges, and a star comic in a hurry. Don't be hicks. Writers, stooges, stars, nicks. All gone to picks. Suggest comb sticks. Good blitz. What'd he say? Can he help us? Oh, what's the word? Free translation of conversation with variety. Hunt says all writers, stooges, and star comics have gone to pictures. He suggests we comb rural areas. And he concluded by saying good flicks. Good what? Goodbye, variety style. Well, well. Send out scouts to tour rural areas for writers and stooges. Prepare to make a comedian. Bring in following list of articles. Potassium sulfate, H2O, pickled herring, weedy spinach, <laughs> laughing gas, one tickled rib, Joe Miller joke book, one toupee, an old car, preferably a Maxwell. We're three witches, double, double, toil and trouble. I am Mary Walter Trouble. Woo, woo, woo. Watch out what you're doing with that broomstick. The writers and stooges are here. And so is the corn they brought with them. You think this is going to work? Well, it better or HLA will be tagging another scalp on his wall. Uh-oh. It looks like it's done. Get that bottle ready. We're about to launch a new comic. Presenting that man of mirth, that master of mimicry, that newest atomic eruption of the ark, the sock, the belly laugh, Arno Lester! He's launched. <laughs> Good evening, folks. This is Arno Lester. Tonight, as I was coming down to the studio, nothing happened. <laughs> it's a twist, huh? I didn't run into a single person. I didn't hear a single gag, honest. Nobody asked me for an autograph, and no one paid the slightest attention to me. I got into a cab. I told the driver where I wanted to go. He told me where to go. <laughs> so I walked down. It was wonderful, just like not being in radio, which I have a hunch I will soon not be. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Hi, Arno, old boy. I'm Tom Moore, your announcer. <laughs> How flattering. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, tell me, Tom, uh, what did you do before you became an announcer? I was a milkman. <laughs> the early hours got me. I lost weight like crazy. Condensed milkman. <laughs> so then you came into radio. You came into radio after that. You know, I'm very happy to have you on my show. Oh, thank you, champ. And say, yes. would you mind calling me Bubbles? Bubbles? Why? Because I'm... Bursting with joy! <laughs> Hear me! Ring me up and call me Rinsel! Oh, dear, dear. My announcer, five pounds more, and he'd make Don Wilson look like a thin man's Tom Moore. I wonder who else I've got on the show. Yes? Arnold Lester? Yes, I'm Arnold Lester. I'm one of your new gag writers. Name's Charlie. Charlie, and what would you like me to call you? Charlie. That's nice. I used to be a barber. How interesting. I'll be around to see you when I grow a head of hair. Oh, I gave up barbering. Couldn't take it anymore. Tonic poisoning or the once over lightly blues? Oh, I like barbering, all right. It was the talking that got me. The customers never stopped talking. Felt they had to entertain me. Used to bring me all the new stories. Maybe I should learn to cut hair. The only piece I had was when I had a close shave or... Mustache trim in the chair. And uh, what finally broke the camel's mm -hmm. hair brush, Charlie? Had a Van Dyke beard in the chair. Oh, that so? Was just giving him the final snip. That's a delicate point, you know. I must ask. <laughs> I, uh, I must uh, must ask Monty Woolley about that. He tried to tell me the one about the canary that got drunk. 
I couldn't stand it anymore. I cut the Van Dyke off. You debearded him, huh? Yes. How was I to know he had more jaw than beard? <laughs> I gave up barbering after that. I understand that. Then the man without the beard gave up chinning. Mm-hmm. And now you've come to write gags for me. Thank you. I thought it was bad, too. And uh, you say you know all the funny stories? Every oh, single the... one of That's them. fine, fine. But I don't like them. Huh? You, you don't like them? I hate jokes. When I hear a funny joke, I get so upset, I cry. You cry? Now, come, 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 Charlie. They're not all that bad. Now, <laughs> take, for instance, the one about the bed who had a, had a mouse in the oh, best pocket. No, not that, that one. No, please, not please, that one. I can't stand it. It's so funny. I cry, fucking so. Goodbye, Mr. Lester. I'll be back after I think of something sad so I can <laughs> help. Fine writer. That's a wonderful writer. If I'm funny, he busts into tears. If I'm sad, he laughs. <laughs> I'll trap him, that's what I'll do. I'll be sad. I'll try it out. Oh, more. <laughs> no. Yeah, Sam. Look, more, more. I'm going to think of something sad. Uh, Rosnop. <laughs> Rosnop? Sponsor spelled backwards. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Say, he's here. Who's here? Rosnop. <laughs> I'll go get him. Oh, shucks. Nothing works for me. I got a darned old sponsor. I mean, a Rosnop. Well, well, well. How do, how do, how do? I'm the senior partner of Rosnops, Rosnops, and Rosnop. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> my two brothers and I run the company. And when I'm alone, I have to speak for my two brothers. That's why I say everything three times, three times, three times. You know, it'd be much easier if you had three heads, wouldn't it? Uh, what do you manufacture, Mr. Rosnops? We make the name three labeling device. Among our satisfied customers, we number three on a match, three of a kind, three musketeers. How interesting. I have one of your products myself. Three grows in Brooklyn. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Had quite a time with that one. Raised it from a thriftlet. But our real smash was three little fishes. Created a sensation in the fish industry. I remember. It wrecked the gefilte fish market. <laughs> well, I must be going now. I must be going. Have to meet my brothers. Bye, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye. I'll be threeing you. Rosnops. Oh, well. Hey, Moore, come in. Hiya, Dopey. This is where I sing. You, you sing? I don't do pratfalls, bud. Get help. I'm the Bobby appeal in this show, the swoon department. Yeah, division. Just a minute now, just a minute. How can you be the singer on this program? On every other comedy show, the singer's a nice, meek, unassuming, and somewhat dumb character who, who says silly things, and then the comedian says funny things back to him, and then the, the comedian gets a laugh. What cooks with the other shows, Arno, is not my racket. On this show, I make with the ox, I give out with the giggle goo, and I get the laugh. Who says so? Rosnop says so. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Did he say it three times? He said it three times. Oh, yeah? Well, go ahead and sing. Ladies and gentlemen, our singer will vocalize three for two. I'll get even with him. I'll announce the wrong song. <laughs> What 
Buddy Clark, who henceforth will have no more speaking lines on this program, Rosnow. Hey, you Arnold Lester? Yes, I'm Arnold Lester, comedian, rock on tour, and general all around funny man. Oh, shucks, don't apologize. Oh, well, what can I do for you? Can't do a thing for me, sonny. I feel fine. Chipper's a hopper, spire's a goat, and Frisky's a coat. <laughs> and oh. <laughs> Kind of an old coat. <laughs> well, look, won't you tie up all your little friends and have a seat? I will not. I've been hired to write your plays. Well? I'm looking at you. Well, I'm looking at you. And you know something? I think I'm looking better than you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I like a man that looks like myself. The two of you of, must be uh, very happy. A man full of fire, a man full of poetry, a man full of... <laughs> <laughs> A man full of vitamin B1. Now, oh, careful, Bob. No, you careful, me, you whippersnapper. I've written a great play for tonight. It's a play for a lady killer. Well, look, will you pretend I'm a reasonable facsimile and go on? <laughs> I killed him with this play in 1900, wowed him with it in 1910, slayed him with it in 1920. And we'll dig him up with it in 1945. Now, wipe your chin and go on. Don't you rush me, Sonny boy. I made William Gillette wait for three months. I made Lionel Barrymore wait for six months. Of course, he was just a child after. Then. Oh, that's all. It was a, it was a real pretty little fella had long curls. He used to talk baby talk. He'd say, "Now, Doc, you kill them." Oh, I wish Doc killed them. Really? I don't believe in doctors, no sir. You know, I never been sick a day, not a single day in my whole life. <laughs> life till now. Here's the. Oh. Oh, excuse me, will you? I know, got a date with a little chick. Come on, baby, we're going to... <laughs> oh, dear. Ladies and gentlemen, the Arno Lester Mummers will present a play with snappy dialogue, snappy situations, and snappy comedy. Directly after the next snappy number by Cesar Petrello and his snappy seven Rosnod. <laughs> the Arno Lester Mummers present an original play. This is called an original play because it was originally presented in 1900, 1910, 1920, and so forth and so forth. Now, I'm going to play the lead, a dashing, handsome young lover who smashes hearts right and left. Now, the Arno Lester Mummers in The Picture of Dorian Green.
Hold still, Dorian. I'm trying to finish painting your picture. If you're persistent squirming, I shall jolly well paint you with two heads. Ripping, ripping. I've always wanted a twin. <laughs> oh, 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 capital. <laughs> you are a witch. <laughs> rather, rather. And I'm only a half dry. <laughs> <laughs> now, there. A final touch from my palette. It's slipping. But, yes, it is. <laughs> And now it is complete. <laughs> My masterpiece. Oh, God. <laughs> How lifelike. No, it's not true. Not true. Tell me, tell me, old boy. Uh, tell me, old boy. What shall you call it? You call it? Call it? Yes, call it. Your palette isn't doing so good, is it? Oh, well. I uh, shall name it after you. I shall call it the picture of Dorian Green. <laughs> But is it a, is it a very low dive? A very, very low dive. Good, good, good. I, I want to plunge deep into life. No shallow dives for me. Good, eh? <laughs> Capital. <laughs> you can be completely dissolute. You will remain unchanged. Only my picture will bear the mark. But Tom, come, come, since it's a low French dive... Shouldn't we speak French, old boy? Rather. Oh, rather. We. Oh. Mm. Great thanks, gentlemen. Hello, Garkin. Who oh, capital oh. fooled him completely? Oh. Oh. Well, what is your pleasure? Will you have wine, song, or... Uh, I think we'll have... Uh, I think we'll have a touch of... Uh, Ask him to make it for two, old boy. Can't track, you know, of a pallet. <laughs> rather, rather. Uh, Garçon, bring us two bottles. French, you know. Bring us two bottles as the orchestra to play us two numbers and invite two... Two, two bottles for the French peasants, two musics, and also two beautiful... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir, buddy, I told you, get around, don't I, sonny? <laughs> oh, Rosnops. Hey. Oh, nothing, old boy. Cursing to myself in French. Oh, come the ladies. Hello, baby. Hello. Hello, Hello beautiful. Come, my baby, sit close to me. I will say sweet things to you. I will talk soft to you. I will whisper small things in your ear. Mm, oui, is this a lie? Then I will take you for a ride in the moonlight. I will park the car. I will... You'll run out of gas. I know you. I remember you. You are Dirty Dorian Green. So it was. Dorian Green touched the very depths of life, tasted of every thrill. And yet he remained untouched. Only his picture carried the sordid marks of his evil life. And then one day... He stood in front of that picture. Hello there. Hello there. I am free. Free to do as I like, while you... <laughs> you bit of canvas. You must grow old and wrinkled. Dorian. Yes? Do you think it quite sporty? Sporty. I have no morals. None at all. Then this is quite hopeless. Quite. I mean quite. And I shall continue to grow older and older while you remain a perennial youth. Wait. Very well. Then there is one last request I have to make. How about it, old boy? When I am an old, grey and wrinkled cousin, will you please tell my brother? Your brothers? Melvin and Ivan Rothnab. Rothnab! Yes, tell them I said you're fired, fired, fired! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard the picture of Dorian Green, as dramatized by the Arno Lester Mummers. In a moment, Arno will be back. Hold everything! Emergency memo from the front office. From HLA? Hey, listen, listen! Continue with five after the hour. 
have been reading wrong schedule. H-L-A. Oh. Well, don't stand there, Weinrod. Do something. He's typing again. Uh, last will and testament. Being of sound mind and... Sound mind. Sound mind. Sound mind! The Tickled Rib was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrod, who also conjured up the character of Arno Lester. Appearing on this program were Sherman Marks, Charles Irving, Buddy Clark, Norman Gottschalk, Arnold Robertson, Fran Allen, Mary Lou Newmeyer, Tom Moore, and Ken Nordine. Original music was composed by Sal Stocko, and the orchestra was under the direction of Cesar Petrello. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrott. <laughs> Permit us to lure you with the theme. Allow us to assuage you with the melody. For this is the opening of Five After the Hour. for this series is the original composition of Sal Stocko and the orchestra is under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. Good evening. Tonight we concern ourselves with a blight upon the fair American scene. We view from all angles an American fascist, a rabble-rouser, a hate-monger. And since even an analytic piece must have a title, we quote Hazlitt, who said, Prejudice is the child of ignorance. And call our offering, Child of Ignorance. Since this is an American child... Let us bring it into the world with music typical of America. Notice that the music is gay and free. Perceive that the light motif is tolerant and filled with good nature. But this American child is a child of ignorance. He will grow up into a monster. The child will grow into a man who will spew hate and prejudice. He will become a weed in the lush garden of the United States. A blight on all good things. A malignant growth on the tolerance that is America. There he is. The child of ignorance. That is his voice. Remember it. For it is the voice of destruction. It is the cry of viciousness. It is the battle bray of the American fascists. say to you, Americans, don't sit still for this sort of thing. Fight fire with fire. Burn if you have to. Destroy if you have to. Kill if you have to. There Is are he speaking of an enemy of the United, United States? States? Who are Do America? these mealy mouthings concern well, themselves with a foe that threatens us with invasion? With such menaces? We know what to do with these babies. We've got plenty of lampposts in these United States. Enough lampposts to string each of these dissatisfied Americans to a lamppost apiece. That's the cure for them. And this doctor is one American. One real, honest-to-God, red-blooded American who's got enough intestinal fortitude to prescribe for them. There you have it. 
Freedom of speech? Sure, we've got freedom of speech. And the child of ignorance uses it. Uses it to sow the seeds of discontent, of suspicion, of greed and avarice and plunder. Lay into the minority. Take it out on the little guys. And if anyone dares raise his voice in protest, shout him down. And let Shout him down by accusing him of being un-American. That's the ticket. Wrap the red, white, and blue about yourself, child of ignorance, and show the wise guys up. We're coming. I'm going to take them for a ride. A nice, long, one-way ride. How can such a monster grow to manhood in these United States? How can he thrive and flourish? How can he have arrived at his present poisonous state? You rang? I did. Prepare the laboratory, please. Lay out the instruments for dissection. Scalpels, probes, etc. And select various historical cases for comparison. At once, sir. Oh, yes, and uh, invite every American to attend. I'll take care of everything. This sounds important. May I ask who the subject is to be? Subject? Uh, make out a card. It should read... A clinical dissection of the child of ignorance. The poisonous state of the subject's body suggests that his present condition had its origin in early childhood. I had to do it. I had to, I tell you. But why did you have to? Who forced you, darling? Did someone make you do it? I can't tell you, Mom. I can't tell you. He'd hurt me. Something terrible. I can't. The poison began to work early. In the subject and all other children, he made the victims of his cruelty. Now, mind you, evidence points out that he was not brave in his persecution. Always he was able to convince someone else to do the part of his dirty work that requires physical courage. This manifested itself, too, at an early age. You guys do what I tell you, see? Exactly what I tell you, and we'll take over the whole neighborhood. But first, you gotta swear a blood oath. You gotta swear that no matter what happens, you'll stick together. And to me. Notice that the blood oath was of prime importance. This is the medieval abracadabra that has surrounded his entire life. In manhood, it will manifest itself in various phases of modern witchcraft designed to captivate the masses of people. But doesn't our school system serve for anything at all? Can't the infection be checked early? A fair question. The school record, please. School record of an ignorant child. Attended classes regularly through first six grades. Had a tendency to stir up trouble and make one of his classmates a scapegoat. Mark tendency to argue. Constantly resented authority of any kind, unless authority was vested in himself. Organized pupils into gang which levied tribute from shopkeepers and smaller children before and after school. Mark delinquency in 7th and 8th grades. Showed pronounced interest in civics, political science, and history. When asked why he liked these subjects, the ignorant child replied... I like them because, if you know them, you can push other people around. This remark is the keynote to the power complex inherent in the subject. From childhood, he wished to inflict his will upon the wills of others. Conclude his school record now, if you please. Subject left school without finishing the eighth grade. Local police were summoned when he injured teacher with a heavy book. Case was dismissed because of his eloquent plea of self-defense. Later evidence showed that the attack upon the teacher was malicious and premeditated. Now let us follow this child into the world, the world which he wishes to change into his own design. He secured employment at, let me see, 14. Who's the new punk? He's the kid the boss picked up. Name's Iggy. Iggy? Yeah. Pretty sharp, too. Boss has got him spotting cars. Catches on fast. Knows what's good and what's hot. Bo says he'll make a good finger man when he gets a little older. 
He began as a spotter for a gang which specialized in stealing and stripping cars. When one of the gang of young hoodlums challenged him to a knife fight, he disappeared from the gang precipitately. Again, this shows that he was afraid of physical violence, where his own person was in danger. Next, we find him engaged in contact with the people of the Middle West. He went from town to town. Now, folks, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm here to bring a little sunlight into the lives of each and every one of you. Like the man said about his mother-in-law, if the old battle axe would smile, she'd crack her face. <laughs> well, folks, what is life but a little smile, a little give and take, a little sunshine spread around in the lives of every one of us? Now, that's why I'm here. Now, the great company I represent has asked me to come down here and offer to each and every He one prospered of you. in his trade for a while. He learned the cruelties and the avarices that are inherent in the people, and he played upon them. He was a great talker. Loved to make speeches on any subject. And would have become a great pitchman indeed. But uh, there was the matter of being some $85 derelict in his accounts. So he went on to greener fields. It is with great pleasure that I have the privilege of introducing the inventor of Torn News Wonder Cure, the great healer and doctor himself. <laughs> My good, good friends. It was with great reluctance that I came to your fair community. As I drove through the approaches to your town and saw the beautiful shade trees and the grass plots of your lovely backyards. I said to myself, Doctor, this is no place for you. This is a place of health and happiness. These people have no need for you. And then, then I saw a small child, a small child crippled with a dread disease. And I knew that unhappiness had visited even your fair community. And I knew that I would be welcome. I knew that I would be needed. My friends, life has been good indeed to this humble man. Of monies and friends and good health, I have enough to be triply blessed. But how can a man be content to count his blessings unless he is ready to share them with his fellows? How can a man face his maker at eventide unless he is able to say, Today, I have served my fellow man. That, my friends, is why I have come to your community. To share the blessings that have been given me with you. The formula for Tornu's Wonder Cure is a simple one. It is compounded of pure chemicals and great faith. It is the ultimate combination of great science and man's belief in his God. The science came to me through years of study. The faith through years of suffering. That is why, my friends, I have come to you. Shortly, representatives of this wonder-working cure will pass among you. In memory of that child that drew me to you, and of the millions of sick and ill, I have declared a special offering of this cure tonight for one dollar per bottle. One dollar This ignorant child, who had grown into an ignorant, albeit cunning and deceitful adult, thrived and prospered with his wonder cure. But the monies that poured in for the compound of spring water and sassafras was not enough. No, oh, he craved for power. His very being demanded the adulation, the complete prostration of the populace. A 
corporal had become an emperor. A beggar had become a king. There must be an angle. There's got to be an angle. A gimmick. Somewhere. There must be a way I can get to the top and push these dopes around. And as so often is the case, a woman provided the way. There had been many women in his life, and then there was this particular woman. She was a good woman, an honest woman, a nice woman. And she fell in love with this man and was robbed of her reason. As love sometimes robs a woman of reason. Darling, do you... Do you have another appointment tonight? Darling, do you have another appointment tonight? Yes, I have an appointment tonight. And any other night I feel like it. Oh, here's I see. Now we'll have some fun. Mickey, baby, come to Mama. Hey, folks, now come on. Let's get the old party pepped up. What do you say? Come on. That was a historic night in the life of the ignorant child. A woman burst into the place where the party was in progress and screamed that a man had attacked her daughter. The crowd was indeterminate for a moment, and then his voice filled the room. Wait! Wait! Are you going to stand there like dumb animals while the fair womanhood of America is desecrated? No! 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 If this land has no law to deal with such swine, we'll take the law into our own hands. I say, let's find them and string them to a tree. The mob, led by the ignorant child, didn't stop to inquire into the man's innocence or guilt. The mob didn't stop. Mobs never do. There was a scuffle, and the man was lynched. And the ignorant child went home filled with a wild excitement. The incident itself was unimportant. He had tasted power. He had discovered himself. My good, good friends, I consider the post for which I am campaigning worthy of the best that is in a man. I would rather be alderman of this ward than president of the United States. Why? Because my home is here. Because my home is in the best ward in the world. The best. If it were not for certain elements who dare to claim the benefits of this ward and at the same time turn their noses up at honest though. Poor men. That's why I want to represent this ward in the city council. So I can join you in driving this element out of our ward. Out of our city. Out of our state. I wish I could lead you in battle against this element. I wish I could hurl the first stone through their windows. But I can't. I can't because I'm a good American. A law-abiding American. But I can. And you can. We can lick them with a ballot. Lick them and drive them out with our votes. And we will! boy sent me over to talk to you, Alderman. <laughs> I'm always ready to talk to the people. I stand you ever can for... save that. I've heard it before. Can we talk net? Net. Shoot. Where do you really stand? We know you're flannel mouthing for votes, but what do you really want? What's your price? And can we do business? Mm hmm. We can do business.
Well? He's okay. A little nuts. But that's good. Wants to be a big shot. Got a Napoleon complex. But he'll go along. Will he stay in line? Don't worry about that. We'll see that he doesn't get out of line. He'll stay hitched. And so, I should like to conclude by saying that I prize the high office I am contesting for more than anything else in the world. Yes, more than wealth and fame and prizes beyond compare. Because in this office, I can serve. In this office, I can protect the citizens of this state from the infamy of traitors in our midst. In this office, I stand guard against the hideous, squalling minorities who threaten our government. And in this office, I can deal with them. This is no time for namby-pambies. This is no time for idealists. This is a time for men of action. For men who are ready to fight and strike back and hurt and maim if necessary. Your humble servant is ready to do these things. In the protection of our state, our nation, America for Americans, and let all others beware. We know them, and we will track them down. And find them and hunt them out like the coyotes they are. America for Americans! Bless you all. And so I warn you. Look about you and take heed. This is a Christian nation. This is a white nation. Let those who do not conform go elsewhere, or we will drive them there. America or Americans! Bless you all. This clinical observation has come to its end. We have tried to prove Mr. Hazlitt's thesis, prejudice is the child of ignorance. In so doing, we've conjured up the life and times of an American fascist. This program should have frightened you more than a double horror feature at the movies. Such a monster can be spawned in these United States. Such a terror can bring the hate and viciousness of Hitlerism to these shores. The study of an ignorant child is closed. <laughs> Child of Ignorance was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrot. Tom Moore was your narrator, and Charles Irving portrayed the Child of Ignorance. Original music was composed by Sal Stocco, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Next week at this time, five after the hour, will again originate in the studios of WBBM Chicago, and will again be heard at this same time. This 
is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago 11. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. <laughs> that join, muted brasses that complete the tone poem. This is the theme. Music for Five After the Hour is the original composition of Sal Stocko. And the orchestra is under the direction of Caesar Petrello. This is a play about the peace. A play entitled, The Day's Long Toil. Oh, good heavens. You're all making so much noise, I can't hear myself think. Mom, can I go to the station to meet Jim? Can I? I say we all ought to go down. Meet him with a brass band. Hail the conquering hero, eh? You're right, Wilbur. <laughs> After all, he's been away for two years, uh, and just I a think minute, we uh, ought... Wait. What? All of you. Uh, oh. Now, listen. Now, that's better. Now, here's how it's going to be. Let's have no more discussion. Jim always hated crowds, even when he was a little kid. Mother and I'll go to the station to meet him. The rest of you will wait here. <clears throat> well, I do think Peg should be there. Jim will expect her. Oh, Mrs. Martin. I'm his sister, and I think I should have just as much right as anyone. Oh, yeah? How about his little brother? How about me? Who'd he send the bayonet to? Who's got the German flag? Oh, no, now, that, that will like do. Back. Just a moment, everybody. So? Father and Peg and I will meet Jim. We'll come directly home from the station. We'll all have plenty of time to be with him. After all, he's not going back. He's discharged. Yippee! That will do, Robert. I haven't finished. I'm sorry. I want to say a few words to all of you. And I'd appreciate it if you'd pay attention and pass it on to the rest of the family and to all of Jim's friends. Uh, this article... Not another article. This article was in last night's paper. It's entitled, When Johnny Comes Marching Into His Home. Now, it, it says exactly what everybody should do, and more important... What they should not do. That applies to you, Squirt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Children. Now, now, uh, look, Emmy. I don't need to have any Weisenheimer tell me how to behave. Seems to me I've uh, done a pretty fair job of living up to now without any interference. Well, I should say, I can't think of anyone in town who's made the brilliant success of himself that Wilmer this has. This is not for you, Wilmer. It's for Jim. Oh. Well, uh, go ahead, Emmy. Well, it, it starts off by saying, when Johnny comes marching into his home, remember, he's not the same boy he was when he marched off to war. He's been places and he's done things. Those places were strange places. The things your Johnny has done were strange things. You must realize that even as the world has changed, your Johnny has changed that world. And... It has changed him. Say, uh, I never thought of that. That's pretty good. Pretty good. It certainly is. My, my. I... Go ahead, Mrs. Martin. I will, Peg. Now, I'm not going to bother you all with the whole article right now. Though I would appreciate it if you'd read it while we're down at the station. But what I do wish is that you remember some of these points. Now, listen, please. First, it says, remember your Johnny may be battle-weary and he may be tired, fed up with war and everything connected with war. 
Don't try to make him relate his experiences. But Jim told me he'd tell me about everything. How he got the brown star. Pay attention to what Mother says. That will have to wait, Robert. When Jim's ready to talk, he'll tell us all about everything. Now, I want you to remember that, dear. Yes, ma'am. Then the article goes on. Now, let's see. Oh, yes. It says, two. Remember that Johnny is starved for home news. It would be well for everyone to remember that every little family anecdote will be interesting to Johnny. Oh, that's my department. <laughs> I know plenty of oh, those. You sure do, dear. Uh, it says, three. Remember that Johnny has been in a military organization where everything was done by orders and by numbers. Let him luxuriate in the comforts of home. Prepare all the little delicacies he's been dreaming about. I reckon you've got them all for his first meal, eh, Emmy? <laughs> well, I, I tried. <laughs> and then, then the article goes on. It lists every important point that should be remembered. But the main thing is, try to act as though it's perfectly natural for us to have Jim back with us. Now, now, everyone, just make him feel at home, in his home. That's the thing to do. Oh, it's okay, funny. Uh, know what time it is, Emmy? No. Quarter past. Oh, good heavens, we've got to hurry now. Come on, Peg, we've got okay. to rush to get down to the station. and ask him again, Father. Okay, okay, but I just asked him five minutes ago. He'll think I'm crazy. I don't care what he thinks. Now go ask him. Goodness, you'd think the one day in the world Jim was coming home, this old railroad could be on time. I'll tell the station master about it. I'll register your complaint personally. <laughs> You're nervous, Mrs. Martin? Mm-hmm. You, Peg? I... I'm shaking like a leaf inside. I know, dear. Do you think he's changed much? Well, I, I hope not, but he's bound to have some. He, his letters to me, they were the same. To me, too, but... Oh, darling, you, you know how Jim hates to worry anyone. Yes, I, I know. Uh, Peg. Yes? Have you and Jim... I, I mean... Is there anything definite? No. Oh, but I do think we understand each other. I'm glad, dear. Thank you, Mrs. Martin. And, Peg... Yes? You will help me. I mean, while Jim's undergoing this... this transitional period, I think they call it. I'll help. Thank you. I told him what you said, Emmy. It must have taken it to heart. Train's coming in now. Oh, he's coming. Jim's <laughs> coming. Hey, come on, let's crowd up front. Come on, Peg. Oh, my God. Now, Emmy, crowding won't help matters. Take it easy. <laughs> Excuse oh. me, madam. I, Sir. Uh, my son's coming in on this train. Soldier. Been away two years. Uh, I don't see him. Uh, maybe he's in the back. Jim. Jim. Over the... Jim. Son. Over here. Over here! Hi. Oh, Jim! Oh. 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 Mom! Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! Dad, son, welcome home! Dad! Jim! Hey! Break it up, you two. You're blocking traffic. <laughs> Looks like you picked up something pretty fancy over there. Never knew you knew how for you left. <laughs> he just didn't tell you everything, did you, Jim? <laughs> hey, 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 where's Sis and the squirt and Uncle Wilmer and Aunt Letty and everybody? They're waiting at home, dear. We figured you still hated crowds at railroad stations. <laughs> oh. oh, sure. Sure. Uh, let me give you a hand with that bag. Oh, oh. Hey, what do you got in there, lead bricks? <laughs> oh, come on, let me take it, Dad. <laughs> you know, the shock of having someone else carry it for me would be just be too great. <laughs> you let your father take it, dear. Time he did something besides talk. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> Anything you say, Mom. Anything anybody says. Just so long as I'm home. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> that reminds me of something that happened in Augsburg. You see, Wouldn't I was you just like com- some nice lemonade, dear? I made it the way you like it, with two oranges. And plenty of sugar. Mm-hmm. I'll have some, Mom. Mother, ask Jim. <laughs> uh, nothing wrong with your appetite, huh, Squirt? It reminds me of a guy in our outfit. We call him Gobbo. He used to gobble his food. <laughs> he even ate some French stuff. <laughs> like Harry down the luncheon club. Always eats two lunches. Says one's for his tapeworm. That's <laughs> Harry. He's killing. <laughs> Would you like another sandwich, Jim? I've got some nice cold chopped meat. You know, the way you like it fixed. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mama. I couldn't eat another bite of anything. I don't know when I've been so stuffed. You want me to move over so you can lay down? Oh, sit right where you are, sis. I have to stretch out and put my head on your shoulder. Hey, you filled out since I left. I told you you were getting fat. No, I am not. All right, you two. Jim just got home. Stop the chatter. <laughs> oh, I don't go to it, Dad. Sounds like old times. They really love each other. They they just carry on that way. Oh, sure. I just adore her. And I just love him. <laughs> Characters. It reminds me of Ted and Butch. This Butch was the screwiest guy I ever knew. He he got his at the bulge. Uh, did, did I write you about your cousin, Millie? Oh, I'm sure you did, uh-huh. Mother. Now, come on, let me tell uh, you. Yes, go ahead, dear. Oh, he's a scream the way he tells you. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Wilma. Well, uh, it seems that... Uh, Mother wrote me. Cousin Millie met this man and married him three days later. He's your fourth. Mom, why does Cousin Millie... Never all... mind, Robert. You're too young to enter into such discussions. I, I think I'll go inside. Well, it's much nicer out here on the porch, dear. No, I, uh, I'm going upstairs to my room. I'll be down after a bit. Excuse me, everybody. Uh, see you in a bit, Peg. Oh, dear, he's changed so. Sure has. Fidgety. Can't sit still. Noticed it the minute I laid eyes on him. I did, too, the minute he came in. Oh, poor boy, he must have been through some terrible experiences. I'm going up to him. Can I go too, Dad? You stay right where you are. Yes, sir. And, uh, Wilmer, why don't you two go home? Fine, fine. Make me feel as though I'm to blame. That's what I say. I don't think it's fair to blame you. Now, Father doesn't mean... I'll explain later. Uh, Perhaps I should go home, too. You stay right where you are, Peg. Jim will want you right here as soon as he feels like seeing anybody. Now, don't say anything to arouse him, Father. Remember... It will take him a little time to get adjusted. Jim, are you in your room? Yeah, Dad. Don't mind if I come in, do you? No. You, uh, know we're glad you're home. Sure. Well, I want you to know something else. We know you've been through a lot. And we realize all this must seem strange to you, so... Uh, Dad... Yes, son. Dad, do you mind just uh, leaving me alone? Why, no, son. Anything you say. Thanks. And uh, tell Peg I'll pick her up after dinner, will you? Swing still squeaks. Yes. Dad still threatens he'll oil it. Well, I'm glad it still squeaks. So am I. I'm glad you still smell the way you do. Thanks. Hmm. Lilies of the valley. Gosh, pig, I used to smell that scent. I think I did. The strangest places. Once I was dug in. I hadn't eaten for 12 hours. Maybe I was lightheaded. But there it was. Don't and... talk about it, Jim. I'm here. You're here. We're together. That's all that counts, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's all it that counts. You want to know what's been going on while you were away? Oh, I, I know, honey. Your, your letters were swell. I sure appreciated them. Thanks, Jim. be swell to get into civilian clothes. You shock. <laughs> Gay ties and, and those loud sports shirts. Anything. Anything so long as it isn't tan or brown. <laughs> One good thing about the Army. Don't have to worry about clothes. Say, did I write you about losing all my gear when we oh, came into the port? Wasn't that awful? Oh, but they did outfit you all over again. Yeah, they outfitted us all over again. What's the matter, dear? Nothing. Just thinking. Don't. Don't even try to think, Jim. Just close your mind and, and vegetate. Relax. You're home, darling. Home. Home. Peace and rest at length have come. What's that? Poem I remembered. A guy named the uh, Hood wrote it, I think. I had to memorize it once. I used to say it to myself. I said it lots of times. Peace and rest at length have come. All the day's long toil is past. And each heart is whispering home. Home. At last. Don't be bitter, dear. You are home. Home at last. <sighs> What's the matter, Jim? Uh, nothing. I, I'm going home, Peg. See you tomorrow. But, Jim, I... See you tomorrow. called, and she was crying. I, I'm sorry she was crying. I, I'm sorry, sorry for everything. Now I want to go to bed. Poor darling, you're upset. That, that's natural. Coming home and all the strangeness. Mother. Mother, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, and I wouldn't do anything in the world to upset you, but, but right now I, I don't want to talk. I, I just want to go to bed. Good night, dear. Good night, son. Oh, nuts. What's wrong with me? It must be nuts. Swell family, swell gal. Don't move, Pa. I've got you covered. <laughs> oh, it's you, Squirt. Don't try and pull any brother stuff on me. I'm Two-Gun Carson, and I don't like the looks of you. Okay, Two-Gun. You got me covered now, but don't think you heard the last of this, you no good rustler. Reach! Hey, 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 hey! Gotcha. Yeah, like fun, I drilled you first. And I got the hammers on my guns filed down, and I got springs in my holsters. <laughs> okay, okay, in that case, I'm a dead pigeon. Hey, how, how did you get in here? Sneaked in? You won't tell. Um, um... Atta boy. Can I sleep with you tonight? I don't know. Ah, oh, come on, Jim. I want you to tell me all about how you knocked the Nazis off and got the Bronze Star. Only you won't tell Mom. No, don't worry, I won't. Hey. How come you said that? Mom thinks we shouldn't talk to you about the war. I think she's nuts. From the mouth of a child. Huh? Uh, nothing. Squirt, you're a genius. I am. Yes, sir, you sure are. Hey, hey, Mom, Dad, sis. Cut it out. You want to get me in trouble? Ah, don't worry, kid. Everything's going to be all right. Jim, Jim, are you all right? What's up, son? Jim. Hey, Squirt, what are you doing here? Robert. Hey, lay off the squirt, everybody. He's a genius. Huh? Him? Yeah. Listen, everybody. Look, 
I got a lot to say. And you're all going to have tin ears by the time I'm through. I'm going to tell you about the war. I have to. I've got to get it out of my system. And you're going to quit treating me like a mental case, like like a soldier. But, son, we didn't well, mean to... I, I know, Mom. But forget I'm an ex-soldier, will you? And remember, I'm an ex-civilian first and last. And I was a civilian a long time longer than I was a soldier. Jim Martin! Ex-civilian! Yippee! He's not. Sure, just like he used to be. Call Uncle Wilmer and Aunt Millie and everybody. Hey, come on, let's raid the icebox and all get a belly ache. Yay! Right. <laughs> Jim, son. Oh, Dad, you old so-and-so. You, you so-and-so. Well, I never... Hey, I just remembered. What? I got a date with a rusty porch swing. <laughs> Today's long toil was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrot, and featured the original music of Sal Stocko. The orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Charles Irving was starred in the role of Jim, and Mary Lou Newmeyer and Tony Weinrot were featured as Peg and Squirt. Others heard were Peg Hillius, Charles Eggleston, Tom Moore, Maura Martin, and Joan Lundeen. <laughs> After the Hour by Les Weinrot will be heard again at this same time next Wednesday night over many of these stations. Tonight's performance originated in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago. Broadcasting System. This is the WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. <laughs> This is an invitation to the drama. 
This is a request to listen. This is five after the hour. Music for five after the hour is the original composition of Sal Stocko. And the orchestra is under the direction of Louis Panico. Now, you're invited to listen to the new suit. This is a story about a man's suit. Now, on the rack of the clothing store, it resembles each one of its brothers in every detail. Shipment number 3058. One lot double breasted men's suits. Blue with white chalk stripes. $39.50. This suit had come into being in the ordinary way. The wool came from sheep raised in Montana, the thread was manufactured in Massachusetts, and the tailoring was done in New York. The entire garment was made entirely under government regulations, and the manufacturer's representative said... Say, for a war garment, that's very handsome. Very handsome. Yes, it was quite an ordinary suit. And then it was sold. This is its story. Stand up straight. I'll look it up. Uh, inseam, uh, 31 inches. Uh, look up. Uh, inseam, inseam, 31 inches. 31 inches? Um, uh, inch and a half a cuff? Yeah, inch and a half One and uh, one half inch uh, cuff. Let me see. Uh, raise up the right shoulder a little bit. Uh, raise up the shoulder. Pull a little padding. <laughs> uh, shorten the sleeve. Mike Mark. Raise mm-hmm. right shoulder... Right pad, shortened sleeves, and marked. Let me see. Mm-hmm. Reset the buttons. Reset buttons. That all? Yeah. <clears throat> it's in a business. Why can I have it? Well, uh, with conditions as they are in the rush, say uh, Friday. I gotta have it now. I'll uh, wait. Uh, not, but that's impossible. Look, look. I'll work with me. Either I get it now or it's no dice. Well, now, uh, couldn't you rush well, it through this afternoon, Mr. Fiorino? But, uh, well, if it's uh, for you, okay. I'll put it the rush on it. Uh, you can uh, pick, uh, um, uh, suppose you come by uh, 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. Right the uh, closing time, hmm? Good. I'll be back. Fine. Now, then, if you'll just give me your name and address, Sergeant, we can send your Don't uniform. Don't bother. Give it to some guy who wants to be a hero. We have no white shirts, but perhaps I'll uh, I'll take three of the plain blue ones. Collar and sleeve size. I don't know. Uh, what's your guess? <laughs> Well, these are the only shorts we have. Limit three to a customer. Well? How about some of these solid color rayons? They're very smart, don't you think? Lady, I've been wearing the same solid color for three years now. Show me something with patterns. Lots of patterns. And don't hold back on the colors. Perfect fit, eh, Fiorino? Mm. 
Just like she was a maid for him. <laughs> now, with your honorable discharge button in your buttonhole, you're all set, Sergeant. Or, uh, I mean, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Take a walk for yourself, Mr. Biff Jones. Stroll down the avenue. Take in the sights. <laughs> Don't look so self-conscious. You, uh, you wore a suit of sight longer than you did a uniform. <laughs> now breathe deep. Uh, it's free air. You're a free man. No more by the numbers. You're a civilian, son. A lousy, no good, live off the fat of the land civilian. <laughs> hey, you look sharp. Feel good? You got do re me in your pocket? You own the world. Uh oh. Here comes an MP. Okay. Unbutton your coat and let your shirt tails hang out if you want to. <laughs> Relax. You ain't fighting the war with anybody. <laughs> huh. Hmm. Must be near chow time, or lunch time. Treat yourself to a meal, Mr. Jones. You're not such a bad guy. The a la carte breakfasts are all you can have now. How about lunch? Lunch? Now? It's 11 o'clock, isn't it? Okay, mister. If you want to eat lunch an hour before everybody else, it's your business. Only you'll have to order a la carte. The blue plate don't go on till 11.30. Well, what'll it be? I'll have, uh... Uh... Never mind. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to sound snippy. Just had a run-in with the chef. We're awful short-handed. Uh, would you like chopped steak, mashed potatoes, beans, and salad? I can get that for you in a couple of minutes. It's on the steam table now. That'd be fine. Okay. I'll be right back. Uh, the morning paper's on the rack right behind you, soldier. Come on, Laurie. Tell the truth. You knew I was a soldier by my discharge button, huh? Not altogether. In the first place, you come into the restaurant at 11 o'clock and you want lunch. I figure you're used to an early chow. And then your suit. And what's wrong with my suit? Well, nothing. It's very sharp. But, brother, is it new? Well, everything on you shrieks brand new. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Say, how come you asked me for a date with the dessert course? Your number one heartthrob stands you up? I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing. You didn't say the wrong thing. I wish there was a number one. That she had stood me up. I don't quite know what to say. You don't have to say anything. Okay? Okay. Biff. Yeah? Mind if we sit down? Okay by me. Where'd you get the name Biff? That's a long story. You'd be bored. Listen, will you get the chip off your shoulder and act like a human being, or do you want me to get up and leave? Thanks for giving me a choice. I'm sorry, okay? Okay. My old man was a fighter. Boxer. Prelims, mostly. Now, once he was sparring partner to the champ... He named me Biff. Oh. Never thought much about it until I got in the army. The guy started to ride me. They didn't after a bit. Where is your father? Dead. Mother, too. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they died when I was a little kid. Never liked the orphanage. Busted out one on my own. Yeah. Did lots of things till the war came. And now? Now? I don't know. The 
For three years, somebody else did all the thinking for me. Never had to worry about anything. Board, room, clothing, job, nothing. Now, it's different. Mm-hmm. Funny thing. Like most guys, I I never particularly liked the Army. It was one of those things. Now, now I, I feel more alone than I did when my folks died. Screw you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I put my final thumb mark on the discharge papers, I thought to myself, Biff, you're out. You're going to get out of this uniform and buy yourself a suit. A civilian suit of clothes. You're not going to belong to anything. That's how it is. I don't. Well, give yourself time, Biff. Give yourself time. I will. Oh, and uh, say, Laurie. Yes, Biff? Uh, thanks for listening. I felt like a jerk. Now I feel better. Okay. And I hope you feel good enough to be good and hungry. I am. I saw the guy about the educational program. And? Well, he Excuse said that... Excuse me, miss. Uh, but uh, can, can I have some water, please? Oh, sure. I'll be back. Don't worry about anything else. Ah. Ah, hello, Biff. Oh, hiya, Mr. Kibble. Ah, you look fine tonight. Fine? <laughs> Thanks. Three weeks already you've been coming to my restaurant... <laughs> <laughs> and still you look fine. <laughs> a steady customer. It is the wonderful food. No? No. No? It is not the wonderful food? No. Oh. Oh, well then, it is something else. The, the wonderful atmosphere. No? No. No, not the atmosphere. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I, I wonder what it could be, then. I... What did the man... Oh, I didn't see you, Mr. Kipple. Oh, it's all right, Laurie. It's uh, good to have only the customer's interests at heart. Me, old Kipple, I like to see my girls take a personal interest in the steady customers. I don't know why. Go ahead, laugh, you old hyena. <laughs> Biff, what happened? Uh, no go. I couldn't afford it, even with the government help. Besides, I, I didn't finish high school. Oh. And the jobs they offer a guy, selling stuff. I'm no salesman. Well, oh, you've done a pretty good job with me. Uh, look, Laurie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I got uh, out, I thought seven. I'd... Laurie, uh, Station uh, 7, the party of 8. Uh, this way, folks, is please. Laurie! Oh, sorry, this Biff, that's my seven. station. Uh, uh, see you tonight, okay? Tonight. Okay, Biff. Uh, it's it's all mixed up, Laurie. When I was over. We used to sit around and have bull sessions about what we'd do after it was over. I guess maybe when you're just living for the one minute that's there, right now, you got screwy notions. So? So you build up a bunch of stuff. And you come back, buy yourself a new suit. I expect that everybody has been thinking the same things as you. And they haven't. They've been too busy making dough to worry about what you think 
What you hope for. What you'd like to do. Are you all through with the beef? Huh? Because if you are, Aunt Laurie's going to tell you the facts of life. Listen, Biff, just because you sweated it out at El Alamein and Anzio is no reason to think that everybody back home was taking it easy. There's lots of ways to fight a war, you know. Name one other. Okay, I will. There's sitting around listening to the radio. There's reading the casualty lists. And there's the newspaper headlines. You're breaking my heart. Well, I'd like to break your head. Ah, oh, Biff. Biff, the world isn't all good, and it isn't all bad. However it is, whatever it is, you've got to adjust yourself to the world. It's too big to adjust itself to you. Ah, uh, what's the use? Go on. I'm listening, Laurie. Well, Biff, you've got to give yourself time. It's like... like... Biff, did you ever break a leg when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Well, do you remember how you planned stuff while you were lying there in bed? It was at the orphanage. I could hear the other guys playing ball. <laughs> I ran out every hit. Yeah. And then do you remember how you felt when they took the cast off and... I wanted to run. I fell flat on my face. Hey. Hey, it... It's penetrating my thick head. You had trouble walking at first. It was slow. Step by step. Yeah. That's what I'm doing now. Learning to walk. No, I'm... I'm just now learning to crawl all over again. But when you practiced a while, the muscles started to do what you wanted them to. Didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Well, they will again, Biff. All your muscles, your mind, your heart, everything will remember. You mean I'll quit resenting civilians? I'll quit feeling like somebody owes me something? Why, sure, Biff. Why, you'll be too busy being a civilian. Be too busy working at whatever you're doing to have time to be. You really think so? I really think so. Good. I hate myself for resenting the chair-born commandos, the guys dressed in civilian suits just like myself and wearing a discharge button just like me. Only, they got theirs for fighting the Battle of Chicago. Or they were dug in in a foxhole at the Pentagon. Or, or they had a cinch in Omaha. I get mad at them. Yet I know that I would have swapped with them any time along the line. Also, I... I know they didn't ask for theirs any more than I asked for mine. You're on your way, Biff. What do you mean? I mean you're getting your thinking straightened out. That's the first step without the crutches. Yeah, yeah. Gee, it's getting late, Biff. An old man Kipple's got me on the early shift tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah, well, you gotta be going. Here, give me your hand. Okay. There, there. <sighs> Thanks. Biff Jones. Hmm? Well, you've got leaves and grass and dirt all over your new suit. Well, brush me off, lady. This is my new business suit. Didn't you know? Ladies and gentlemen... This is Les Weinrat. At this point in the script, the writing should take a twist, according to all the rules. Biff should get a good job with a pleasant employer and a promise of a future, and he should propose to Laurie, and she should accept. Fade out, the happy couple kiss, and old man Kipple beams as they face the golden sunset, their eyes gleaming with the confidence of youth facing a roseate future. Now, this Scrivener knows Biff and Laurie are their reasonable facsimiles. 
but he does not know what happens to them. Because that story remains to be written. And neither this writer nor any other writer can write it. Yet. No, this story has its ending in the future. In the future that America makes for its Biff Joneses and the lorries they fall in love with. America must write this ending. America must provide the means to make Biff a solid citizen and a good, albeit grousing, taxpayer. Biff Jones is back. He's one of the first. His suit of civilian clothes is new now. New and sharp. One day it's going to be second best. Then one day... One day it's going to be a rainy day suit. And then one day... Biff will buy another new suit. That's maybe in a year... Or two... Or five... Or ten. It's important for Biff to buy that suit terribly important because the end of this story must be the beginning of Biff. The new suit was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrott. Starred in the roles of Biff and Laurie were Ralph Camargo and Cheer Brentson. Other players were Charles Irving, Lucy Gilman, Sherman Marks, Josephine Hipple, and Tom Moore. Original music for the new suit was composed by Sal Stocco, and the orchestra was under the direction of Louis Panico. After the Hour by Les Weinrott originated in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago, and will return at the same time next Wednesday night. This is CBS. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Five After the Hour by Les Weinrott. composition of Sal Stocco. The orchestra under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. And now, prepare for the words. These 
are the words. The words to be found in Primer for Prejudice. Hate, envy, detest, despise, abominate, also rancor, and condemn, and likewise degrade and desecrate. <laughs> Village Publishing Company, Charles Butterfield Jones, editor and publisher. Yeah, this is Charlie. What'd you want, Mrs. Werner? Another item on the By the Wee Ladies Social Pastime Club? Yes, ma'am. Just a minute till I get a pencil. Okay, shoot. The By the Wee Ladies Social Pastime Club. We'll meet at the home of Mrs. Lorraine Werner next Wednesday for an afternoon coffee. Uh, Going to serve anything besides coffee, Mrs. Werner? Oh, it's just called an afternoon coffee. Uh huh. Okay, I'll set it up real nice. Not at all. And uh, uh, Mrs. Werner. Your uh, subscription to the Earth Village Globe ran out four weeks ago. I uh, hate to remind you. Will I take it out in eggs as usual? Sure thing. Fetch them in next time you buy. Okay. Children all right? Fine. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah? Hello? Hello yourself, boy. I got a story for the newspaper. Are we, uh, figuring on placing an ad? Huh? Let's see now. Um, you'd be one of Ricky Malaka's kids, wouldn't you? Uh-huh. Why aren't you out in God's sunshine, boy? This is no place for a young one. Nothing in here but dead words. What's dead words? Words that have been set up in type and printed in the newspaper. After that, they're dead words. Where are they? Are they buried? Sure. This big box. Those don't look like words. <laughs> they were, though. All kinds of words. A son was born to Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. Oh. Mr. Sherman Martin, pioneer resident of the community... Celebrated his 100th birthday today. When asked what he attributed his longevity to, Mr. Martin said, Whiskey and chewing tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of words in there. Dead words. What'd they do when they were alive? Told everybody about everything. Made folks happy to read them. Made folks cry, too. Made some folks laugh. And uh, some folks madder in hornets. Can I play with them? Sure, but uh, look out for the type bugs. Type bugs? <laughs> Just fooling. Oh. <laughs> Old printer's trick. Tell folks about the bugs that grow in type. Why aren't you uh, out with the other kids? I don't want to. No? Don't like to play baseball, huh? No. Or go swimming in the pond at Bonner's Woods? Uh-uh. Or fish in the slough? No. What's wrong, son? They called me a dirty dago. Oh. What'd you do? I ran away. Then I threw rocks at him. Hit him? No, I was too far away. Mr. Why do they call me a dirty dago? They learn from the primer for prejudice. 
Huh? They are blind when they read, deaf when they hear, and dumb when they speak. Yet the primer for prejudice is easily memorized. Why do they call me a dirty Dago? Dago. Bohunk. Sheeny. Shanty Irish. Shine. Kike. Jake. Greaser. But why do they call me a dirty name? Let's find out, boy. Come on. Where are we going? Into the world. The big, beautiful, wonderful world that man has used so badly. of Athenians, the ignorant, unenlightened, pusillanimous posers, dare resist the might of Rome. They shall be put to the sword, every man, woman, and child of them. Who's he? Let us march a fellow named Sully. He was an Italian. Like me? They called him Romans in those days. Did he make up dirty Dago? Ask him. Mr. Mr. Who calls to Sally? Mr. Why do the kids call me Dirty Dago? The Athenians are a low breed. They are slaves. The spawn of slaves and the progenitors of slaves. Their existence displeases the gods. To slay them is to propitiate the gods. It is our mission. He don't make sense. To a clean mind, no. Come, son. Poles are a thorn in the side of Mother Russia. The thorn must be extracted, and we must see that it never grows again. To slay a pole is to slay for a holy cause. who call themselves Protestants must die on the rack and the wheel. The Inquisition must force from them. The truth! driven from the land. We must seize their monasteries and their churches. We must strip them of everything. The Jews are the curse of the nations. Moneylenders, parasites, evildoers. Kill them. Rob them. Destroy them. Shiny, shanty Irish, chink, kite, 
hating, greaser, hate, envy, detest, despise, abominate, degrade, desecrate, great, pillage, burn, destroy, crucify, kill! It's been going on like that for a long time, son. A long, long time. You mean somebody was always calling somebody else names? Calling them names and hurting them and being cruel to them. Why do people do that? Folks been trying to figure that out for a good many years, son. Isn't anybody smart enough to figure it out? Can't teachers figure it out? There have been teachers who have tried. One great teacher explained it all. It's in the Bible. I know. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I never call anybody names. Never. Well, I call Ed Smith fat, so that's because he's fat. Oh, and I call Jimmy Rotten because his name is Rothman. Oh. But I don't call anybody mean names. I still don't know why anybody calls anybody else mean names. I'll try to explain, son. Try to explain it the way I see it. And now, uh, mind you, I'm not very smart, and I'm only guessing. Okay. bountiful, luxuriant, good earth. This earth that grows things. This earth that gives us food and warmth and clothing and shelter. The earth is good, all right. Here are wheat fields and corn and barley and oats. And here, the orchards. And there, the meadows. Below the ground is the coal, the iron ore, the minerals. Here is the wherewithal for man's existence. What does that mean? Here is everything we need to live on. Oh. If everything is here, then what's wrong? I reckon it's the people. What's wrong with the people? Oh, uh, I don't know for sure. We can try to find out. We can ask. Listen, I was stationed in England and I was in Italy and now I'm in France. And you can take the limeys and the frogs and the guineas... And you can blow them. Why can you blow them? What's wrong with them? They're... Well, they're nuts. Are we nuts? Us in America? Could be. But we're different. We... We're better. How are we better? What are you, a quiz kid? Go on, scram. Don't bother me. We're a nosy character. <laughs> I said to him, I said, listen, you no good kike. What do you get off selling me a fur coat like this? Wasn't the fur coat any good? Yeah, it was all right. I just don't like them kikes. Why? Are they bad? Sure, they're bad, all of them. What makes them bad? Ask anybody. Anybody will tell you. They're bad and you can't trust them. I tell you, the boogie's got to be kept in their place. This is a white nation. Why is this a white nation? We were here first. We got to keep them in line. Are they bad? Sure they're bad. They're a menace. Why, 
Why, they'll take over if we're not careful. Now I'm off him. He's Shandy Irish and his pal's a dumb bohunk. Is he bad? Them Shandy Irish are all alike. They're all bad. And them bohunks are worse. You gotta watch those greasers. Those sheenies will cheat you every time. Those mixers, are boozers, every one of them. You can't trust us, Ben. You never know what they're thinking. All those chinks are lazy, lying things. Ching, ching, Chinaman. You'd never get back what you send to their laundry. Big old bohunk greaser. Tight, big, jig, chink. Hate them. Hate them all. Are those the people? Those are some of the people. Are there lots of them like that? No. Uh, I'd say there were a few. Unfortunately, they're the noisy ones. Then why doesn't somebody tell them to shut up? No, uh, that's not good either, son. If we shut their mouths, they'll still have those thoughts in their heads. Then what can we do? We can educate them, son. Make them go to school? In a way, yes. And if they're not good, keep them after school. <laughs> That's not the kind of school I'm thinking about. What other kind is there? This is a school. That? This printing press. It can print the truth. And the radio. It can tell the truth. And the churches. They can give out the truth from their pulpits. And the school... Like I go to? Like you go to. They can teach the truth. What is the truth? Truth, the way I see it, is that all men are human. That all races are of one father. That there are good people and bad people in every race, in every creed. Of every color. And the bad people make the trouble for the good people. The bad people make the trouble for all the people. The people who know but a little. The people who pick up the nasty things, the vicious things, and strike out with those things because they're disappointed or jealous. Or just plain hateful. They're the ones. The ones I met. They don't make sense. They don't make sense. But they're noisy about it. And they influence the other people who are ignorant. And the, the first thing you know, we got a primer for prejudice. A guidebook for the bad. Well, I gotta be going. Okay, son. And if anybody calls me names, you know what I'm going to do? What are you going to do? I'm going to say to them, hey, quit ruining the good earth, will you? Make some sense. Primer for Prejudice was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrott. Heard tonight were Herb Butterfield, Norma Jean Ross, Charles Irving, Lucy Gilman, Angel Casey, Arnold Robertson, Norman Gottschalk, Tom Moore, and Sherman Marks. Original music was composed by Sal Stocco, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo.
peace has come, the big guns have been stilled. But the fight at home goes on against a treacherous foe, inflation. His booby-trap pennies are constant threats to our economy. These booby traps are the extra pennies that you pay over ceiling prices. They're dangerous money and pack an explosive wallet. It was after the armistice in 1918 that the greatest rise in prices took place. That means that the biggest danger of inflation lies ahead of us. We can lick it if we buy wisely. Buy only what we need and pay no more than ceiling prices. Not a single cent more. So every time you shop, remember to check those ceiling prices. After the Hour by Les Weinrot, originated in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago, and will return next Wednesday evening at this same time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. Play the theme, for this is five after the hour. Play the theme, for this is an invitation to the drama. Original music for Five After the Hour is the composition of Sal Stocco, and the orchestra is under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. And now, the play. A play entitled... There was this waltz. There was this waltz, see? It's the first piece we hear the band playing when we get on this excursion boat. Mean Willie. Uh, the boat is the Mary Ann. Uh, that's that dancing excursion boat, the one that docks at the foot of the river. You know, midnight cruise out on the lake, leaves 11 p.m., returns 1 a.m., gents $1, ladies 50 cents. Well, Willie and me are scrounging around with nothing particular in mind when we see this here boat. And the crowd's hanging over the bridge watching it. <laughs> hey, let's go. On that tub? Are you nuts? Look at the dames pouring on. Come on. Oh, we'll go nuts, Willie. Two hours. And if you don't like it, there's nothing you can do about it. So what? The fresh air will do you good. Fresh air can poison you. Hey. Hey, the plant, babe. That one? <laughs> no, over there. That's for me. Yeah. But how about me? She's got to have a girlfriend. Every blonde has. <laughs> Okay, wise guy. So you shanghai me onto this tub. 
And now, where's your blonde? She'll show. Blondes can't stay away from dance bands. And where's her girlfriend? I thought you said, um, ouch! Ah, see what I tell you? They're coming in through the door. I don't like mine. Well, maybe she's a good dancer. Maybe she talks good. Maybe she... Maybe she's kind to her mother. Brother, look at that face. Come on. You go. Come on, you got nothing else to do anyway. Okay, okay. Oh, the way you get me into things. Honest, sometimes I think I'm a jerk. Now, what do we do now? Just barge up oh, and... Oh, now, don't be a stoop. You've got to use technique. Um, <clears throat> great number, this waltz. Hi, huh, Harry. I say, great little waltz. Huh? Oh, <coughs> oh, sure. Sure. Yeah, I heard um, Wayne Wayne play it last week. Great little band that Wayne's got. Huh? Huh? Oh, oh sure. So don't cry, yep. don't you think, Elsie? Maybe we should have gone to dance. Yeah, uh, Wayne, he's for me. Smooth and sweet. I <laughs> love dance land. But you said that's the way I like it. There. Smooth and sweet. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, smooth. I guess these excursion boats draw families mostly, don't you think? It's a shame Let's... to hear music like that Let's and not be long. able to dance. Oh, well. We can always enjoy the it's ride. a waste. A pure waste. Sure is. Sure is. Of course, I'd rather not dance unless I can dance with someone who really knows how. We can uh, go on the upper deck and look here. at the moon. Ah. Some technique. Why huh. don't you hit him with a ball bat? Strange, isn't it, Elsie? You know, Harry? Some people just stare and that stare. That blonde looks familiar. Yeah. She ought to. Sure You've been looking at her long things. enough. I wonder if I met her Careful, when I was honey. in Hollywood. Yeah, sure. Your eyes She's will bug Betty out Hutton. altogether. Oh, You're Arrow really Flynn. Ridiculous. Come on. He is cute. Isn't I he? sure would like to dance. Personally, I like mine ugly. What's stopping no you? you Fred Astaire does all right by himself. Um, Isn't this a divine night to dance? <laughs> Pardon me, uh, my swoon. Uh, excuse me, but may I speak with you? They ain't tax in the air yet. Uh, no, no, I mean this other lady. Oh, were you speaking to me? He's been trying to since the dance started. At least two of us aren't blind. <laughs> you two sound like you're rehearsed, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they sure do. Well, you two sure don't. <laughs> Sister, you said it. <laughs> when you said it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you care to dance? Would she care? Why, uh, I don't know. We haven't been properly introduced. He's Willie and I'm Harry. She's Mary and I'm Elsie. There. Now that you two have been Emily posted, go ahead. Well? Well. All right. How about you? My feet hurt. They're killing me, to be utterly frank. Yeah, so are mine. Honest, some days I think I ain't going to be able to walk another step. Would you like to stand up behind a counter all day and make with a smile when your dogs are barking? Elsie's a little too frank, but she's really a swell kid. Oh, so's Harry. I mean, not too sharp, but he's he's uh, he's a man's man. Well, that's why I run around with Elsie. Huh? Uh, oh, oh, I mean, oh. Oh. I mean she's regular. <laughs> you know how most women are. I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't think I was too forward. You see, you're the reason I got on this boat. I saw you getting on, and I, 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 I just couldn't help it. Me? Uh-huh. Yeah, you. I saw that blonde hair, and I, I, I just couldn't help it. <laughs> I dragged poor Harry with me. Oh. Oh, I bet you tell that to all the blondes. Well, I bet I don't. And, and I, I bet plenty of guys tell you that. Well, I'm not saying yes, and I'm not saying no. You don't have to. The way you look, the way you dance. Oh, Willie. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, am I glad I came. Hey, you're not with anyone. I, I mean, you, you didn't come here with anyone. Elsie and I just got on. 
program, you might say. Oh, that's swell. Whew. Like to dance? Mm-hmm. So do I. Boy, I think that anybody who don't dance is missing a lot of romance. Nothing like dancing, I say. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. You give me a good band, a good floor, and a gal that knows how to dance. Yes, sir. Me too. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. What is? I had a hunch something wonderful was going to happen tonight. You did? Really? Yep. Harry and I were just scrounging around. Thought, uh, thought maybe we'd go over to where us guys hang out and, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe play a little gin rummy with the boys. That's what we thought. I'll bet you were going to play with some of the guys. No, we were, honest. And something, something drew me here. It was just, just, just like a magnet. Honest? <laughs> honest. I'm glad I came. So am I. Oh, oh gosh, it's over. Yeah. Went like that. Wasn't that a short number? No. Your dancing made it seem short. Oh, oh thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, I wonder where Harry and what's her name are? Elsie. Elsie. I, uh, I don't see them. Maybe they're, uh, maybe they're up on the moonlight deck. Oh, Elsie would never go up there with a strange man. Uh, want to bet? I bet anything. We'll never find out unless we go up there ourselves. I don't really think I ought to. Don't you trust me? Well. Or don't you trust yourself? My, we're pretty confident of ourselves, aren't we? Uh-uh. I'm just confident about us. Come on, Mary. Folks, get a while hot, red hots, red hots, Coney Island red hots, those juicy, tasty pigs and bun, red hots, red. Well, you two gonna buy? Just gonna stand there and look at them dogs? What you waiting for to bark? Temperament with hot dogs yet? We'll take two with mustard, piccalilli, and ketchup. Too bad you weren't on board last night. We had anchovy sauce, too. Here you are. That'll be 30 cents. No tax for the floor show? Yeah, come on. You don't make for no appetite. Okay. Poor guy's probably got bunions. Get your red hots. Red hots here. Me the bun. And go and cruise with that one. Do you mind if we sit while we work up our indigestion? It's okay by me. Where? Mm. Is this chair taken? Well, it will be if that jerk ever gets back. Hope you strike gold, lady. Excuse me for a minute, he says. That was an hour ago. Oh, I hope he gets himself good and lost. Nothing like a moonlight cruise to bring out the romance. Yeah. I never was one for the romance department. Too much wear and tear. <laughs> From the looks of you, I'd say there was plenty of room for wear and tear. You sure are a sweet character, aren't you? You kidding? If that's what you were looking for, you should have tied on to Mary. Oh, no. Oh, I leave that department to Willie. He's the smooth wolf. Would you mind not walking on my feet? I got corns and they hurt. Sorry. Try soaking them in salt water. Thanks. When they hurt too bad, I go to a foot doctor. A fellow named Gillespie. He's a good man. Where do you think they are? Up on the moonlight deck. Huh? What do you think they're doing? Lying to each other. That Mary is a terrific con artist. Oh, oh don't worry. Willie ain't so bad himself. Right now, um, she's making with the eyes. You know, fluttering the lashes and saying, Oh, Willie, I wish you meant it. Yeah. <laughs> and he's saying, But I do mean it. No girl ever hit me the way you do. Oh, Willie, I wish 
you meant it. But I do mean it. No girl ever hit me the way you do. Honest? Honest. <sighs> oh, Mary. You two were sure a lovely <gasps> dovey. Hey. Oh, you're a, you're a hateful, spying little monster. Hey, go on, kid. Scram for it. Let you have it. You and what army? Boy, are you two sure ridiculous. Hey. Oh, Willie. Oh, Willie, I... I feel so... so cheap. Don't. Don't, honey. Don't, don't, don't let anything upset the beauty of... of... this. I'll try not to. You... you do think it's beautiful? Sure I do. Willie, there it is again. Our world. Our walls. What'd you say? Huh? Willie. What'd you say? Oh, mm -hmm. Do you think things like this are meant to be? Mary, I think everything is meant to be. Oh, when you say things like that, I'm afraid. Afraid of what? You're so deep. Oh, I'm not so deep. It's just, just, just that I think a lot. And you dance so wonderfully. So do you. <laughs> What's the matter? Nothing. Well, then. Why, then? I don't know. It's... It's just that... I feel that... Tomorrow you won't even remember I'm alive. Oh, I'll remember. Tomorrow... And tomorrow... Oh, that's so poetic. Who was it said that? Ronald Coleman. Uh-huh. You'll look like Ronald Coleman someday when you get gray. And you look better than any movie star right now. Really? Really. <laughs> Do I remind you of anyone? Alice Faye. Uh, you just guess. No, no, no. No, you do. You look like her. You're, uh, you're younger, of course. Everybody says I look like Betty Hutton. I mean, around the eyes. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Betty... Betty... Hutton. Oh, well... <sighs> Were you thinking of her? Or me? Don't. Come on, let's go find Harry and Elsie. Oh, Willie, I just love everybody tonight. I thought they'd never leave. So did I. Did you ever hear such a line? Yeah, they were really feeding it to each other. Oh, look at that moon. Mm-hmm. Lover's moon. For us? For us. You two are sure lovey-dovey. Oh, Willie. I don't know when I've had such a good time. You... You had a good time. Oh, Mary, I, I just began to live tonight. Personally, I feel like dying. Are you two going to stand here on the dock forever? Yeah. I got to get up at seven tomorrow. Hey, can't you save it for another night? Don't pay any attention to them. Mm. I won't, Mary. And I am going to save it. For all the nights of my life. With you. Willie. Thanks for the hot dogs, Harry. That's okay, Elsie. Hey, I sure enjoyed sitting them dances out. Yeah, so did I. And Harry. 
Yeah. Now, don't forget what I told you about Dr. Tonu's magic remover. Oh, no, no, I won't. And get the big size. Save half a dollar. Sure, that's half a buck. Okay. And I will see you tomorrow night. And Wednesday. And Thursday. Mm-hmm. I'll have to break a date both nights. Do you mind? Uh-uh. I'd lots rather be with you. Oh, boy. Say, healthy. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been thinking. I think you're wrong about that ketchup. You try mixing it with mustard for, uh, for a week, say. You'll never eat a hot dog any other way. Hmm. Hmm. Could be. Well, thanks again. Be seeing you. Yeah. Sure, I'll sit out of waltz with you any day. Yeah, night. this wall, see? It's the first piece we hear the band playing when we got on this excursion boat. Uh, me and Willie. Harry! Uh, You're gonna stand there and yammer all night? In a minute, Elsie. That's the old lady. Yeah, we were married six months ago. She's got fat feet. So have I. This makes us turn in early. Uh, what happened to Mary and Willie? Well, Mary got hooked up with a sailor she'd been corresponding with. And Willie... Ah, Willie, he's still playing the field, the jerk. Was This Waltz was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrot, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Heard tonight were Mary Lou Newmeyer, Sherman Marks, Janet Niles, Charles Irving, Tom Moore, Lucy Gilman, Clock Ryder, Tony Weinrot, Johnny Coons, and Adrian Moore. <laughs> has been won, but the fight at home continues. Yes, it is vitally important to save waste paper. Paper shipped overseas in the form of packages for our armed forces never returns. It can never again be used as a raw material to keep our paper mills operating. And the requirements for paper are even greater than before, both overseas and here at home. Overseas to keep our men supplied. At home, to provide the packaging for the increased civilian goods that will soon be available. Save your waste paper. It's important. It's vital. It's necessary for the peace we have won.
drive after the hour by Les Weinrot, originated in the studios of WBBM Wrigley Building, Chicago. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. <laughs> yourself. Make ready. For the clock's hands have come to rest at five after the hour. composition of Sal Stocco, and the orchestra is under the direction of Cesar Petrello. This is the play. Its title, Forty Winters. Name of deceased, Emily Amelon, age 80, no known relatives, cause of death, old age, burial, Potter's Field. This is it. Everything the old lady had is in this trunk. Just cleaned a room out. Rented it this morning. Not that there was anything much to clean. Miss Eminem kept her room neat and tidy, every pin in place. Well, I got to be going uh, back... Just a minute, please. The laws of the state require that you remain here as a witness while we go through the property of the deceased. And uh, we'll require one other witness. Land sakes, rules, rules, rules. I just told you the old lady didn't have kith nor kin in the world. She didn't leave no fortune in thousand dollar bills around either. The laws of the Commonwealth order this procedure, ma'am. We'll be obliged to you if you'll secure the second witness. Uh... Very well, I'll see if Mr. Budkins is in. He's retired. He's got one of the better rooms up front, so we a private there. Old lady didn't leave much, huh? <laughs> Camelback trunk. You know, there were any still around. Somebody must have brought that thing across the plains in a covered wagon. You know, death's a funny thing. Oh, no, don't tell me you're going to get philosophical. I don't know. You live and you collect things. All sorts of things. It means something, each of them, to you alone. Then... Then you cork off and we step in for the state. Yeah, then you die. And the things that meant so much to you don't mean a thing to anybody else. Yeah. Well, here comes the second witness. Oh, hey, looks like we'll be able to close the books on this case in no time at all. I'd like to drive over to Sam's for lunch. That's a good idea. Was a lady of distinction. She was genteel and correct in her every deportment. I shall consider it an honor to serve. Uh, this is Mr. Butkin. Oh, I do. How are you? I'm glad to see you, gentlemen, and glad to serve. As I was remarking, Miss Eminem was indeed a lovely old lady. Uh, yes. And now, if you'll sign here, and you, ma'am, here. Uh, not so fast, young man. I learned years ago never to sign anything I didn't read first. <laughs> well, so this you simply just... says that we're going through the effects of the deceased in your presence. Uh, oh. Well, all right. After you, ma'am. Now, if I may have the key, please. Thank you. Huh. See? Everything neat as a pin. What did I tell you? Uh, she was neat as a pin. Rest her soul. A perfect lady. A perfect lady. I remember well the first day she arrived here. Let me see. It was a year ago. Thirteen months, three weeks, and two days. Uh, went just like that. Just like that. Said she was tired. Tired of living. And she died. Hmm. Letters. 
documents, photographs. Maybe we'll turn up an insurance policy or something of value. Maybe we'll be able to save the old lady from Potter's Field. Uh, although to me, it wouldn't matter. I say when you're gone, you're gone. Yeah, hey, take these documents and read them off. I'll check these other papers and letters. Right. Such a fine lady. I always meant to engage her in conversation. Well, she never was one for just talking. First down to meals and the first to leave the table. No parlor visiting right up to her room. Except on Sundays. She was a church-going woman. Yeah, Here, here's a birth certificate. Emily Clarice Smith. Smith? That's what it says. Born September 12, 1865. Little girl, God bless her heart. A daughter, you old son of a sea cook. Bet she'll be a heartbreaker like her mother. I said it would be a girl. I knew it. That's why I crocheted everything with pink trimming. Hard to think of the old lady as a baby. 1865. Ford's Theater. President Lincoln was assassinated that year. Smith? Hmm. Wonder where the Eminon came from. That uh, looks like a school record. That's what it is. Record of public school attendance, Emily Clarice Smith. Got good marks, too. Excellence all the way down. She would have had excellent marks. She had such an intelligent manner about her. If she was born Smith, where did the Eminon come from? You don't think she... She must have been a vivacious little girl. Pigtails, gingham dresses, high shoes, black stockings. It was very thoughtful of you to volunteer to clean the slates, Emily. Very thoughtful. You must remember, my dear, remember all through life that one good deed begets another. Good deeds are like little seeds. We plant them as we grow up, and when we reach maturity, our good deeds grow with us. And eventually they become beautiful flowers from which we derive pleasure, or great shade trees from which we gain shelter. Yes, Emily, dear... The good deeds we sow as children blossom and bloom into the good things of life when we're at it. No value. Clock it on chain. No. Two pictures. Apparently a father and mother. No value. Uh, nice looking, her people. Uh, resembled her mother. Miscellaneous keys. Funny thing about keys. People always seem to hold on to them, whether they're for anything or not. The feeling of possession, young man. The key gets to mean something. After you open the door to a home or the drawer of a bureau. I know, but why hang on to them after the home's gone or the bureau's been sold? Maybe it's because a key represents security. A place or thing that is solid. Well, it looks like Miss Eminem Smith. might have had considerable possessions at one time. House keys. Luggage keys. Here's a strange one. It couldn't be for a vault or a strong box. No, a soube. Curious, too. It seems to be brass. I remember such a key. My father hung it in the kitchen. It was to our carriage house. I remember the lock on the door, too. Very fancy scroll work. Thieves were very ornamental in those days, you know. Emily. Yes, Edward? Here. For me? Yeah. It's a key. A great big key. It's my best swap. Johnny offered me his jackknife, the one with the broken blade, and a ball of twine for it. Oh, it's lovely. But I couldn't keep it. Here. It's for you. Keep it. Does... 
Does it mean anything? Well, it means that that as long as you keep it, you're you're my girl. Bye. Gotta be going. Gotta meet the fellas. I might bring in a few dollars to some curio shop. Market no value. Uh, no value. Those seem to be invitations. Yeah, they are. Invitations and dance programs. Miss Emily Clarice Smith is invited to attend a dancing party from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Refreshments. R.S.E.P. May I have the pleasure, Miss Emily? Oh, I'd be delighted. I love Strauss. You're light as a feather, Miss Emily. It's only because you're so skillful in leading me. Did you hear the news? Perfectly wonderful. Sarah Bernhardt has arrived in this country. They do say she's ravishing. So? Yes. She's going to appear at Booth's Theater in New York. And you know what? What? Oh, I, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. Please do. I shan't breathe a word of it. Well, if you promise not to tell, I heard Father telling Uncle that she appears in tights. Well, whatever those French women do doesn't surprise me. But isn't it perfectly daring and breathtaking? Oh, I don't know. The fellow I know has a picture of Lily Langtry and a kilted skirt and a sweater. I don't believe it. I saw it. Did... Did she look wicked? I wasn't interested enough to find out. Isn't... Isn't it hot in here? It is rather warm. Shall we have some punch? I, uh... I was thinking it might be nice and cool in the garden. But what would people say? Do you care? A lady has to watch her reputation. We could sneak out through the French windows as we pass by. Nobody would notice. And next dance, we could sneak back. I don't know. Where's your courage? Or do I pin the white feather on you? I dare if you dare. All right. Come on. Oh, it's beautiful out. The moon through the trees and... Oh. What's the matter? Look. Oh, they're spooning. It's Sandy and Jessica. You mustn't mention names. And I think we'd better go back. But, Emily... I'm afraid I'll catch a chill in the night air. Please. Oh, all right. That's Sandy and Jessica. Had to spoil everything. Just when we were getting started. You sure took her education seriously. Here's a whole string of report cards, notes, high school, finishing school stuff. Miss Murgatroyd, select school for young ladies. Preparation in the basic classics in domestic sciences. Notebook one. And so, ladies, my concluding remarks are these. What you learn today will not be pertinent to you until you are past 40. For the first 40 years of a woman's life, she is concerned with herself first as a young woman and then as a mother and homemaker. It is after those 40 years that education becomes important. For then the fledglings have left the mother's nest. Then the birds have flown. Then a woman has done her life's work, made her home, and reared her children. Then in the remaining span, if she is educated, if she has knowledge, her life will be rich and full. If she has not prepared her mind, her thinking patterns, she will be poor and bereft. Therefore, young ladies, it is of utmost importance that you pursue your studies diligently and assiduously. I knew she was educated. I knew it. It was in her walk, in her face, in her very approach. Uh, I guess you won't want to pour over these. They seem to be love letters from a gent named Henry H. Eminon. She was married. Well, I never... She didn't mention it once. Mm. It was a long time ago. Here's the license. Lovebirds and all. 
joined in marriage in the year of our Lord, 1885, on the seventh day of June. Oh, Henry, this is wonderful. I always dreamed of running away on my honeymoon. <laughs> Fooled them, didn't I, honey? Had the story behind the hotel. And they'll spend two hours searching for us. And we'll be on our way. Henry, now that I'm your wife... Mrs. Henry H. Eminot. I insist on knowing where we're going on our honeymoon. Where else, honey? Niagara Falls. Henry! And then New York. Oh. The finest cabarets, the best shows. Oh. And who can tell? I might even take you down to the Bowery in Chinatown. Henry! The old lady sure kept odd things. Look at this sheaf of paid doctor's bills. To Henry H. Eminon, Jr., Priscilla Eminon, Henrietta Eminon. Oh, bless her heart. Yeah, here are the pictures. Here's a little side there. I don't care if they do grow out of their clothes, Henry. I don't propose to have my children going around looking like scarecrows. I'll do without myself, and so will you. But our children are going to wear clothes that fit them now, not next year. Here's the answer, sir. If you'll permit me to read it. In that old newspaper, Cliffy? Why, it, it's crumbling with age. A lot more than this paper crumbled, or could have. A woman's entire world could have crumbled about her. Listen. Tragedy struck today at the household of Mr. and Mrs. Henry H. Eminon of this city. Uh, the date is June 7th, uh, 1905. On this day, the 20th wedding anniversary of the well-liked local couple, they were celebrating the event with their three children, Henry Jr., 17, Priscilla, 12, and Henrietta, seven, at Elm Woods on the Rock River. Mr. Eminon, who was boating with the three children, apparently lost his oars in midstream. The rowboat capsized, and all four lost their lives. Their bodies have not yet been recovered. <laughs> It was almost too much to ask of one poor soul. Makes me think of a quotation from Marcin Rousset. Up to 40, a woman has only 40 springs in her heart. After that age, she has only 40 winters. 40 winters. That's right. She was only 40 when it happened, and she was 80 when she died. Never a word from her about any of this. Never a scowl or a frown, never a complaint. Oh, rest her soul. She was a great soul, an important soul. She had the capacity of turning winter into spring. What do you mean? I, I think I understand this diary. Well, don't you feel sacrilegious opening it? Oh, it's my job, lady. That's why the Commonwealth pays me. Right. This is uh, in the line of duty. Go ahead. Today marks the end of my period of mourning. Today, the civilized world says I may lay aside my widow's weeds. But what of the sackcloth and ashes I wear upon my heart? What of the emptiness that is within me? Because those who filled my life are gone out of it forever. This I must face with myself. I must find a way of life for myself. I must continue to live. And more important, I must make such a life for myself that will enable me to carry on as though they were here. Here it is. The record of the day she worked for her living. And here are her charities. Infant welfare work, underprivileged children, Society for the Prevention of Delinquency. Oh, bless her. She was good. Bless her. 
she lived with. Forty years. Forty winters. What? <laughs> Nothing. We better wind up here. Yes, stay. Must she be consigned to Potter's Field? Unless someone claims the body and makes the funeral arrangements. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. The last will and testament of Emily Eminon. Being sound of body and of mind. I, Emily Eminon, do hereby make my final covenant. Of worldly goods, I have none. Of kith and kin, none remain to me. My passing shall affect no one, and none shall mourn. I have disposed of all and any monies I may have had, save the sum of five hundred dollars, which may be found concealed under the lining at the bottom of this trunk. It is my wish that four hundred dollars of that amount be given to the two charities designated below in equal amounts. The remaining $100 is to be used to defray funeral expenses. It is my wish that I be interred simply and plainly. There are to be no flowers. I have tasted the sweet of life. And the bitter, too. It has been a full life. I am thankful to have lived. was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrath, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Heard on tonight's performance were Joan Alt, Herb Butterfield, Johnny Coons, Lucy Gilman, Charles Irving, Sherman Marks, Maura Martin, Kay Miller, Adrian Moore, Tom Moore, Mary Lou Newmeyer, Norma Jean Ross, and Tony Weinrath. Forty Winters originated in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago. Next Wednesday night at the same time, you are again invited to set your dial to this station and to take note of the time. For when the minute hand reaches five after the hour, Les Weinrot will bring you another original radio drama. Until then, this is Ken Nordine. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot.
volume control on your radio, listener. Let the string sing sweetly, the reeds blow softly. For the time is five after the hour. music is the composition of Sal Stocco, and the orchestra is under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Good evening, good listeners. This is Les Weinrott. Tonight we concern ourselves with the distaff side. We particularize as we seek out the activities of a man's life and strive to explain it through his wife. Now, please to listen to assorted quotations on the subject of wives. A wise man in his house should find a wife gentle and courteous, or no wife at all. Euripides. She who ne'er answers till a husband cools, or if she rules him, never shows she rules, charms by accepting. By submitting sways, yet has her humor most when she obeys. Pope. Thank you. Under the subject of wives also comes Moliere's interesting observation. When questioned as to why in some kingdoms the king is of age at 14 but cannot marry until 18, Moliere replied, because it is more difficult to rule a wife than a kingdom. Which closes the documentary file on our subject except for one quotation from Shakespeare. This is an intriguing tidbit which goes, the, the light wife doth make a heavy husband. From this, we take our title for tonight's offering. Hence, the light wife. This is the music for the light wife. Notice that it is completely feminine. Notice that it, it, is, it is expensive. Notice that it, it is light, frothy, and not too intelligent. Now, uh, change the motif. Ah, enter the husband. Here is Basso Profundo. Note his pomposity. He is a heavy man. Very well. Now, uh, to find out about these two. Yes, Mr. Tornio. At once, Mr. Tornio. Immediately, Mr. Tornio. Were you on the wire, Mr. Tornio? Senator Retzel in here, Mr. Tornio. The chair lady of the subcommittee on feathered friends is waiting, Mr. Tornio. Revisions on your speech for tomorrow evening are completed, Mr. Tornio. Your barber, manicure, masseur, and psychiatrist are waiting, Mr. Tornio. It is quite apparent that Mr. Tornio is a man of paramount importance, that he controls the destinies of industries and individuals, that upon him rests the fate of a good share of the nation. He is important, spelled backwards or forwards. He is a man to watch. He is a power to reckon with. He is an outstanding citizen and a pillar. And now he speaks. My good friends, the honor you have paid me tonight touches me deeply. Deeply indeed. I am moved, touched by the spontaneous ovation. And I truly wish I could believe I am worthy of it. But at a time like this, a man must not look at his earthly possessions. A man must not enumerate his accomplishments. A man must not categorize his temporal doings. No, at a time like this, a man must look deep into his heart. Deep into his inner being. Deep into his soul. There and there alone he will find his answer. There and there alone, he will find the truth. What is the truth that prompts a man's success? What are the chemicals of honesty that impel a man to rise to great heights? So, the man speaks. Further, the great man acts. Frisbee! Frisbee, leave for England at once. Don't even stop for a toothbrush. Get to London and buy. If there's nothing to buy, sell. That is all. Yes, sir. The great man thinks. 
When I was a boy on the Mississippi, a poor boy, son of poor but honest parents, I learned a great truth. No one can take better care of you than you yourself. I have been taking care of myself since childhood. That is the secret. The very keystone of my success. Very well. We have shown certain facets of the great man's character. But this is the formulated character of maturity. Now to go back through the pages of his life. Always mind you with an eye toward discovering the role his wife played in his success. Early days. Come, children. Time to come in for princess. Why aren't you coming in, Marilyn? Well, I, um... I... I was worried about Terrence. I declare, Marilyn, you're quite young to be smitten. <clears throat> Come along, dear. Terrence Tornier was at his desk. He was fascinated by tomorrow's arithmetic problems and decided to skip his recess period. <laughs> It is quite obvious that from his early childhood, this titan preferred the world of finance to the frivolities of merriment. Also, it is quite obvious that he was most attractive to women from the very first. As the years progressed... Darling, you look simply wonderful. Darling, you look just grand. Oh, let me brush the rice powder off your shoulders. Oh, thank you. Isn't it terrible the way it sticks on everything? Oh, it certainly is. I'll uh, show you my dance program if you'll let me see yours. Oh, I'd be glad to, but I seem to have mislaid it. Isn't that it sticking out of your purse? Oh, oh, so it is. How silly of me. Well? I'd rather not. Why? Terry torn you? Yes. That's two dances with me he's missed. I feel like a wallflower. Look. You too. Oh. He's the original 23 Skadoo kid. I wonder why he does things like this. Gets on everybody's program. And why he doesn't come around for the dances. I saw him. He went into the smoking salon with Mr. Van Van. Mr. Van Van gave him a cigar just as they went in. Oh, that explains everything. With Terry, a woman's just a woman. But a good cigar is a business contact. There were the days and the years of the great man's twenties. By now, he had smoked numberless cigars and broken just as many dates. But he was well known in the offices of the mighty. He was well regarded in the labyrinth of the castles of finance. Ah, uh, that young Tornu. He's up and coming. Aggressive, that's what he is. Aggressive. And in the sequestered parlors of the women of these titans of finance, he was mentioned frequently also. More tea, dear, if you please. And the petty four? Oh, no, I couldn't. I'm having such difficulty with my wage. Oh, nonsense. You have a figure like Annette Kellerman. Oh, thank you. But Madame Lefou deserves the credit. My dear, she's a perfect wizard with uh, the stays, if you know what I mean. Oh, I must go to her. Oh, tell me, have you heard the latest about Terry uh, Tornew? Do you mean that unspeakable chorus girl? Oh, that's ancient history, my dear. He gave her some new furs and a few baubles from Cartier's, and she ran off and married the Count de Sade. Do tell. Mm, I'm talking about Hortense Van Van. Don't tell me. She snubbed him. At the Fair Oaks. Not really. Really? Cut him cold. Oh, <laughs> serves him right, fortune hunter. Tell me, my dear, how is your sweet, sweet Angeline? She's uh, leaving for the Grand Tour. In two days. How wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't she decide suddenly? Oh, good gracious, no, she's been planning it for months. Secretly, of course. My Angeline is such an intelligent child. Mad for things cultural. Plans to spend just months in the museums and galleries in France and Italy. How oh, wonderful. <laughs> she hasn't been seeing Terry lately, has she? Oh, dear, no, she's besieged by bows, hasn't time. Uh, more hot water, dear? Oh, thank you. Oh, oh I'm 
sorry how terribly clumsy of me. Uh, now, what were you saying? Yes, Terry Tornew was a name that was given frequent mention in those days, in formal parlors and in uh, quite informal dressing rooms. Button me up, will you, darling? Okay, turn around. Better take that bracelet off. You know how Mr. Schmelzer feels about us girls wearing jewelry. No oh, poo to Mr. Schmelzer. I won't be with the show long. What? what? You uh, well, I have a friend, and he said... Oh, don't that... tell me. Honey, you're too good to be a chorus girl. You ought to be starred in a show of your own. And he gave you the bracelet to prove that he meant it. And he doesn't think you ought to live in a boarding house. And a dress is everything, dear. And when it gets cold, furs are so warm. Especially furs on top of diamond bracelets. <laughs> okay, okay. But you'd better lay off or I won't invite you over. And Terry is sweet. Oh. Now, uh... Lest you get the idea that Terry Tornia was all work and all play, let's get the record straight. One day, an announcement was put into the mails. It was engraved, and you could trace your fingernail over the engraving and make a noise. The stock upon which it was printed to was of the finest rag and linen. But uh, before the announcement was sent out, there were some preliminaries. Uh, Hortense. Uh, yes, Terence. I, I ask you to invite me to your home directly after the opera tonight because... I must talk with you. Yes, Terence. Hortense, there comes a time in every man's career when he's faced with the most important decision of his career. Yes, Terence. That moment has uh, come into my life. Yes, Terence. As you know, I have never distorted the true facts to you. I know, Terence. I was born of poor but honest family. My people were pioneers. The stock that built this great land. I know, Terence. What I possess in worldly goods, I wrested from the world with, with my own two hands and my back. And uh, your brain, Terence. <laughs> you are very kind, my dear. Uh, I am aware of the position the Van Vans occupy, uh, both socially and... Uh, I know, Terence. Uh, therefore, this decision has been doubly hard to make. Uh, doubly hard. Oh, I appreciate that, Terence. But I made it. I made it because it is part and parcel of the American scheme. It is part of our great tradition that a poor log splitter may aspire to become president. I know, Terence. Like a cat looking at a king. Uh, well, uh, yes, something like that. Uh, therefore, Hortense, my dear, I, I now propose marriage to you. Will you become my wife? Yes. Will you grace my home? Yes. Will you share with me the sweet of living in the bitter, too? Yes. Will you go through life... Yes, Terence. Now, excuse me, I must talk with the father and mother about the arrangements. There was an elegant ceremony in an imposing and impressive church. There were photographers. There was rice. There were long and shiny limousines. And the society editors went into their stock tizzies. And the ceremony was concluded, and the bride and groom went off on a honeymoon in the Van Van's yacht. From time to time, of course, America was appraised of the whereabouts of the happy couple. Nep. Today, the Duck and the Duchess were hosts at a formal lawn party to the distinguished Americans, Senor and Senora Tornio. Are you there? Here it is. The hunting box of Lord and Lady Wendermast was occupied today by the distinguished Americans, Mr. and Mrs. Terence Tornio. The Prince of Herzegovina announces the sale of the priceless Rambo, entitled... View in an empty attic to the distinguished American collectors, Mr. and Mrs. Terence Tornew. And eventually, the distinguished couple returned to the United States and became part and parcel of the community. There was the great townhouse, rocks on rocks, and the country estate, trees among trees. Also, the plantation, julep retreat, and the shore place, sand on sand. There was also another retreat, which was unmentioned. A small flat, quietly furnished. Mm-hmm. Must have uh, 
private entrance and exit. Building bar. Mm-hmm. Price, no object. And, uh, under whose name shall I put the listings, sir? Uh, the name is, uh, uh Smith. John Smith. Life progressed apace for the great man. He had important decisions to make, and he made them. Sell. Yes, Mr. Tonio. Buy. Yes, Mr. Tonio. Sell. Yes, Mr. Tonio. Buy. Yes, Mr. Tonio. He was a good husband, and he called his wife at frequent intervals. I'm leaving at once for the coast, my dear. Hurry up, Fripp. Important matter. Yes, my dear. Can't make it for dinner tonight, my dear. Out of town guests on the Franston matter. Yes, my dear. I'll be gone uh, several weeks, flying. I'll call you every night. Yes, my dear. Thus, they planned together and were in perfect harmony. And the guidance of a good woman was evident in the activities of a strong man. And the years went by and the world progressed into a greater turmoil. And Terence and Hortense Tornew resolved themselves into the American scene. And only yesterday, the press sought out the great man for a statement. Mr. Tornew, you are an outstanding American. <laughs> Thank you, my boy. With all the social unrest that is prevalent in America, certainly you should have something pertinent to say about it. Would you... Care to make a statement? Care is an ill-chosen word, my boy. As an American, an elder of the nation whose counsel is being sought, I feel it my duty to make a statement. I feel it my duty to caution and warn America. Mr. Tornew cautions nation. Now, uh, I happen to have a few words that I jotted down this morning when I awakened. I shall read them to you. Oh, please do, Mr. Tornew. <clears throat> America is faced with one of its gravest problems today. The very foundation of the nation is threatened. The cornerstone of our civilization is in danger of being uprooted. We can save that cornerstone. We can shore up that foundation. But we must do it now. Mm -hmm. Action imperative now. The thing we must remember is that the foundation of these United States is not in Washington, not in New York, not in Chicago. It rests not on Wall Street, not on the stockyards, not on the fertile farms of America. No, nor does it rest on the rich or the poor alone, nor on capital or labor. No, my friends, the foundation of the nation rests on the family. Oh, wait, I want to get that down. On the family. You got it? Yes. On the wife that each man takes unto him. That is where we begin. Let each man who seeks to build a life for himself say, I will choose a helpmate, a co-worker, a partner, and together we will wind down the long road. Together we will meet the obstacles and overcome them. Together... We will make the nation strong and good and lasting. <laughs> that is all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tornio. Anderson? Uh, yes, Mr. Tornio? Uh, call my wife. Tell her I shall um, be unavoidably detained in the city tonight. Yes, Mr. Tornio. Oh, and Henderson? Yes, Mr. Tornio? Convey to her my very best regards. The Light Wife was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrat. Original music was the composition of Sal Stocco, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. <laughs> Oh.
heard on tonight's performance were Boris Aplon, Adrian Moore, Sherman Marks, Peg Hillius, Jack Petruzzi, Nanette Sargent, Betty Ruth Smith, Marge Calvert, Jane Brooksmith, and Florence Ravenel. Les Weinrod again, good friends. Come to take leave of you for some time. For these past months, it has been a privilege to be received into your homes with my writings. I hope you've enjoyed some of them. I trust you've found a few of them provocative. That you found cause to chuckle over one or two of them. Now, this series comes to an end. Soon I hope to return to the airlines again. Until then, again thanks and au revoir. <laughs> GIs must be returned home from overseas. Occupational forces must be adequately supplied. The U.S. Maritime Service needs volunteers from 17 to 35 who will train to sail the ships of the U.S. Merchant Marine. Upon the men who sail our ships depends the welfare of our troops everywhere. Quotas in the U.S. Maritime Service are unlimited. Apply in person or write to the United States Maritime Service Recruiting Office. Live after the hour, originated in the studios of WBBM, the Wrigley Building, Chicago. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Makers of Campbell's Soups present the Campbell Playhouse, Orson Welles, producer. Good evening, everyone. This is Edwin C. Hill, and I bring you exciting news. Tonight, Orson Welles takes over the direction of the Campbell Playhouse and offers you as his first production, America's bestseller, Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, with a great star, Margaret Sullivan. Exciting news indeed, for I am here to welcome the White Hope of the American stage as the director and star of the Campbell Playhouse, who writes his own radio scripts and directs them and makes them live and breathe with the warmth of his genius. There is no time to adventure into the story of his life, and that's too bad, because it is a tale that combines the best features of Baron Munchausen and Alice in Wonderland. If ever a boy was born for an actor, he was. At 13, he was directing the troopers in the Todd School for Boys at Woodstock, Illinois, where he produced 30 plays. At 16, 
He was playing leading parts in Dublin at the famous Gate and Peacock and Abbey Theatres. His American career is really too recent and too well known to recount here. He's been the leading man with Catherine Cornell, with John Houseman. He founded the Mercury Theatre and has operated it with magical success. He had four hits last year on Broadway, which beats Noel Cowell's record from here to Kalamazoo. And he's generally recognized today as being the most gifted stage director and actor of our time. His radio productions have attracted universal attention. His broadcast of the War of the Worlds last month, which I dare say you remember, made radio history and a national sensation. Why did a fantastic story of an utterly imaginary invasion from Mars produce this totally unexpected result? The result, Mr. Wells, of course, greatly regretted. It was because, as in all his radio productions, Orson Welles is a master of realism over the air and radio. Unique, exciting. He shocked you. He sent the cold shivers racing up your spine. But that is not the thing he does best or best likes to do. He loves to tell a story, a great human story, welling up from the heart, brimming with deep and sincere emotion and lively with comedy. And such are the stories, thrilling, delightful, amusing, he will bring to the Campbell Playhouse. And because of all his gifts, his genius at playwriting, his ambition, his dynamic direction, his amazing character acting, he has been selected by Camels as the ideal man to conduct the Campbell Playhouse. And so tonight, Orson Welles makes his bow as the outstanding program director of the air. And I have the very great pleasure of presenting him now, Mr. Orson Welles. Thank you, Mr. Hill. It's a great big chance for me and a great big challenge. My faith in radio and the makers of Campbell Soups have enough confidence in me to give me the direction of the Campbell Playhouse. Let's hope nobody is mistaken. Mr. Wells, could you tell us something of your aims, perhaps something of the kind of thing you hope to do with the Campbell Playhouse? Well, everybody likes a good story, and I think radio is just about the best storyteller there is. The Campbell Playhouse is dedicated to the radio production of good stories. Stories from everywhere, from the stage, from moving pictures, and from literature. Next week, for example, we're doing a comedy called It a Day, and then, and then Campbell's annual Christmas present to America, Lionel Barrymore in Dickens' Immortal, A Christmas Carol. And after that, there'll be Counselor at Law, a very human portrait of present-day people, Aerosmith by Sinclair Lewis with Helen Hayes, William Archer's The Green Goddess, Hector MacArthur's hilarious 20th century. In other words, all kinds of stories, mostly modern, and all of them chosen for their suitability to this medium. That's about all, except I'm going to try to tell them just as well as I know how. Well, I know you'll ring the bell. You know, the makers of Campbell Soups don't believe in all this talk about the radio audience having the average mentality of an eight-year-old child. They think the radio listeners are the same people that go to the pictures in the theater and read books. They reason that even the most popular radio entertainment should be addressed to the adult citizenry of America. I can only hope that what I do with the Campbell Playhouse will prove how much they mean it and how right they are. I know it will. And now, just before you ring up the curtain on the first act, will you give us a word or two about the play? Gladly, Mr. Hill, but if you'll pardon me, it's not a play, it's a story. You see, I think that radio broadcasting is different from motion pictures and the theater, and I'd like to keep it that way. The Campbell Playhouse is situated in a regular studio, not a theater. We have no curtain, real or imaginary, and as you see, no audience. There's only one illusion I'd like to create. The illusion of the story. But the star, too, is important, Mr. Wells. Is that not so? Oh, yes, indeed. And I'd like to say how very fortunate I am in having with me tonight the loveliness and the magic gift of Miss Margaret Sullivan. For Miss Sullivan is my first choice for a great part, and a great part it is, too. The most coveted of the season... The Scarlet O'Hara of 1938. The heroine of Daphne du Maurier's best-selling novel, Rebecca. Rebecca is going to be made into a movie by David Selznick. It ought to be one of the ten best. It's this year's contender for the five-foot shelf. Your best bet for anything from a weekend to a desert island, and it's a book you should read. The ideal Christmas gift to yourself. Miss du Maurier has flattered me with her confidence in permitting the Campbell Playhouse the great privilege of making for radio the first dramatization of her book. I'm meeting her for the first time tonight before this broadcast is over by special shortwave communication. She'll speak to us from London. So, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. Moyer, 
The Campbell Playhouse is obediently yours. The Campbell Playhouse presents Rebecca, starring Margaret Sullivan and Orson Welles. We can never go back to Mandalay again. The past is still too close to us. The things we have tried to forget and put behind us will stir once more. But sometimes in my dreams I go to Mandalay again. I see the house, the gray stone shining in the moonlight of my dreams. The terrace slopes to the lawn, and the lawn stretched to the sea. Like a sheet of silver under the moon. Light comes from the windows. The curtains blow softly in the night air. And there in the library, the door stands half open, as if we had left it, with my handkerchief on the table beside the bowl of autumn roses and the charred embers of our log fire still smoldering against the morning. I wonder what my life would be today if Mrs. Van Hopper hadn't been a snob. Mandalay? Mandalay, my dear. Why, even you must have heard of Mandalay. That's Max de Witter at the table next to us. The man who owns Mandalay. They say he can't get over his wife's death. An appalling tragedy. The papers were full of it, of course. They say he never talks about it, never mentions her name. She was drowned, you know, in a bay near Mandalay. Oh, Mrs. Van Hopper, I know he can hear you. Nonsense, my dear. Go up to my room quickly and find that letter from my nephew. You know the one written on his honeymoon with a snapshot? Bring it down to me right away. Oh, Van Hopper, I don't worry. Really... my dear, do what you're told. Don't argue. Hurry. When I came down, she had him sitting beside her on the sofa. He looked like no other man I'd ever seen. A man out of a long, distant past. Oh, there you are, my dear. This is Mr. DeWinter. Mr. DeWinter's having coffee with us. How do you do? You know I recognize you, Mr. DeWinter, just as soon as you walked into the restaurant, and I thought, why, there's Mr. DeWinter, Billy's friend. I simply must show him those snapshots of Billy and his bride taken on their honeymoon. Look, here are the snaps. Here they are sunbathing at Palm Beach. He met her at that party where I first met you at Claridge's in London. <laughs> but I dare say you don't remember an old woman like me. On the contrary, I remember you very well. Excellent snapshots. Bright, very pretty. I don't think I should care for Palm Beach. Well, of course, if one had a home like Mandalay, I'm told Mandalay's like fairyland. There's no other word for it. I wonder you can ever bear to leave it. Mr. DeWinter is so modest, he won't admit it, but he has one of the loveliest homes in England. They say that the minstrel gallery at Mandalay is a gem, and the gardens are simply the most perfect. The next morning, Mrs. Van Hopper woke up with a sore throat and a temperature. At noon, I went down to the restaurant alone. I expected it to be empty. Nobody lunched generally before one o'clock. He was sitting at the table next to ours. I sat down looking straight before me. I unfolded my napkin and knocked over the vase of flowers on my table. Oh, you can't sit at a wet table, Clark. Come on, get up. Wait up. But they don't have lunch with me. No, no, I couldn't possibly. Why not? Well, you're being polite, but really... I'm not I, being polite. I'd like you to have lunch with me. You're very kind. You don't believe me. Well, never mind. Come on, sit down. We needn't talk to each other unless we feel like it. Tell your friend. She seems a good deal older than you. What is she? A, a relation? Have you known her long? Well, she isn't really a friend. She's an employer. You see, I'm what's called a companion. She pays me 90 pounds a year. I didn't know one could buy companionship. What do you do it for? Ninety pounds is a lot of money. How old are you? Nineteen. And you're not afraid of the future? <laughs> no. Haven't you any family? No, they're dead. Well, then we've got a bond in common, you and I. We're both alone in the world. I have no companion. I shall have to congratulate Mrs. Van Hopper. You're cheap at ninety pounds a year. <laughs> you forget. You have a home, and I have none. An empty house, my dear, can be as lonely as a full hotel. The trouble is that it's less impersonal. I remember 
remember the feel of the leather seats in his car as we drove in the afternoons along the Mediterranean. I remember still my ill-fitting flannel suit and how the skirt was lighter than the coat. I remember now, glancing at my watch, I would think to myself, this moment now, now at 20 minutes past three, this must never be lost. Never. You're a very silent companion. What are you thinking? I wish... I wish I were a woman of about 36, dressed in black satin with a string of pearls. You wouldn't be in this car with me if you were. <laughs> Mr. De Winter, you're going to think me impertinent and rude, I dare say. But I would like to know why you asked me to come out in the car day after day. You're being kind, that's obvious, but why do you choose me for your charity? Because you're not dressed in black satin with a string of pearls, nor are you 36. <laughs> you know, it's not fair. You know everything there is to know about me. That's not much, I admit, because I haven't been alive very long, and nothing very much has happened to me, except people dying. But you, I know nothing more about you than I did when we met. And what'd you know then? Well, that you lived at Mandalay, and that you'd lost your wife. Yes. My memories are bitter. I prefer to ignore them. Something happened to me a year ago that altered my whole life, and I want to forget my existence up to that time. Those days are finished. They're blotted out. I, I want to begin living all over again. Oh, I'm so sorry. You've been so kind to me. I didn't mean to remind First you... your puritanical, tight-lipped little speeches, and your talk about kindness and charity... I ask you to come with me because I want you in your company. And if you don't believe me, you can leave the car now and find your own way home. Go on. We'll open the door and get out. Well? What are you going to do about it? Please, drive me home. Well, suppose you're young enough to be my daughter. I don't know how to deal with you. Forget all I said to you just now. That's all finished and done with. Don't let's ever think of it again. My family used to call me Maxim. I'd like you to do the same. You've been formal long enough. Something the matter? I've come to say goodbye. We're going this morning. Come in. Shut the door. What are you talking about? It's true. We're leaving today. I, I was afraid I wouldn't see you. I felt I must see you again to thank you. Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, Mrs. Van Hopper only decided today. Her daughter sails from New York on Saturday, and we're going with her. She's taking you with her to New York? Yes, and I don't want to go. I shall hate it. I shall be miserable. Well, my name's then Gold. Sit down with me while I eat my breakfast. Have you had yours? Yes. Oh, I really haven't time. I ought to be downstairs now, getting the tickets. You can sit with me for five minutes. Oh, I shouldn't. So, Mrs. Van Hopper's had enough of Monte Carlo. Now she wants to go home. <laughs> so do I. She to New York, I to Mandalay. Which would you prefer? Take your choice. Please don't make a joke about it. It's unfair. If you think I'm one of those people who tries to be funny before breakfast, you're wrong. I repeat, the choice is open to you. Either you go to America with Mrs. Van Hopper, or you... Come home to Mandalay with me. Do you mean you want a secretary or something? No. I'm asking you to marry me, you little fool. I don't understand. I'm not the sort of person men marry. What the devil do you mean? I'm not sure. I, I don't think I know how to explain. I, I don't belong to your sort of world. What is my world? Well, Mandalay. You know what I mean. You think I'm asking you to marry me for the same reason you thought I took you out in the car. To be kind, don't you? Yes. One day you may realize that philanthropy is not one of my strongest qualities. Are you going to marry me? My suggestion doesn't seem to have gone too well. I'm sorry. I rather thought you loved me. I do love you. I love you dreadfully. I've been crying all morning because I thought I should never see you again. Oh, so that's settled, then. Instead of being companion to Mrs. Van Hopper, you become mine. 
And your duties will be almost exactly the same. I also like new library books and flowers in the drawing room and someone to pour my tea. And... Oh, I'm being rather a brute to you, aren't I? This isn't your idea of a proposal. We ought to be in a conservatory with you in a white frock with a rose in your hand and a violin playing a waltz in the distance. Poor darling, what a shame. Never mind. I'll take you to Venice for our honeymoon and we'll hold hands in a gondola. But we won't stay too long because... I want to show you Mandalay. Mandalay? Now then. Am I going to break the news to Mrs. Van Hopper? Or are you? Oh, no. You tell her. She'll be so angry. I'll tell her. I'm not afraid. You wait for me here. When he had gone, I looked around his room. There was a book on the table near his bed. I picked it up. On the title page was a dedication. Max. From Rebecca. May 17. Written in a curious, slanting hand. The ink had run too thick. So that the name Rebecca stood out black and strong. Rebecca. Rebecca. We pause now on our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Rebecca. In just a moment, we will resume the story. But first... Here is my associate of long standing, Ernest Chappell, with an important message. Thank you, Mr. Hill. The time was, and it was not so long ago, when chicken was a rare and special treat. What magic the words chicken for dinner conjured up in our young minds, and how we looked forward to these great events. With proud gusto, father would dexterously separate wings and legs and then carve tender white slices from the breast, while each of us silently prayed to be granted his special favorite part. And then on the second day, there came another treat. The remaining meat and the carcass went into Mother's soup kettle to be simmered slowly, seasoned gently, and served forth as a suppertime delight. Today, if you have wistful memories of that glorious old home chicken soup, then Campbell's chicken soup is just made for you. Because Campbell's chefs follow faithfully the good home recipe, only changing it to make an even better soup. They use, for example... All the good meat of the chickens, fine, plump chickens they are, too, such as you'd choose proudly for your own table. Such chicken soup with snowy rice and tender chicken pieces is a special treat indeed, but one you may enjoy on any day. Your grocer has Campbell's Chicken Soup, and it's yours for the asking. Remember, Campbell's Chicken Soup. Now we return to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Rebecca with Margaret Sullivan and Orson Welles. We came to Mandalay in early May. There it was, the Mandalay I had expected. Lovelier than I'd ever dreamed. Built in its hollow of smooth grassland and mossy lawns. The terraces sloping to the garden and the gardens to the sea. A servant was standing on the steps waiting. An old man with a kind face. Well, here we are, Chris. Feeling well? Yes, thank you, sir. Glad to see you home, sir, and hope you've been keeping well. And madam, too. Yes, thank I'm you. both well. Thank you, Chris. I'm tired from the drive winning our tea. Hello, Jasper, old man. Chris, who are all these people? All oh, the servants. I didn't expect this. Mrs. Danvers orders, sir. Mrs. Danvers? I might have guessed it. Come on, darling. Mrs. Danvers was Rebecca's housekeeper. She simply adored her. They're all curious to do what you're like. You won't mind, will you? No. Soon be over. My dear, this is Mrs. Danvers. Mrs. Danvers took me to my room. She was a tall, gaunt woman dressed in black with prominent cheekbones and great hollow eyes that gave her skull's face. Parchment white, set on a skeleton's frame. Her eyes never left mine. Mandalay is a big place, madam. Not so big as some, of course, but big enough. And a show place. Mr. De Winter lets the public in to see it once a month. You can't see the sea from here, can you? No, not from this room. You can't even hear it. 
I did not know the sea was anywhere near. Not from this room. I'm sorry about that. I like the sea. Mr. De Winter gave special orders in his letter that you would have this room, madam. Oh, then this was not his room originally. No, madam. He's never used the rooms in this wing before. Oh, he didn't tell me that. I... I suppose you've been at Mandalay for many years, Mrs. Danvers. Longer than anyone else. I came here when the first Mrs. De Winter was a bride. Mrs. Danvers, you, know, you, you must have patience with me because this sort of life is new to me. You must just go on running things as they always have been run. I shan't want to make any changes. You would dare to carry out your orders, madam. I hope I shall do everything to your satisfaction. Can I do anything more for you now? Oh, no, thank you. No, I, I am sure I have everything. I should be very comfortable here. You made the room so charming. I only followed out Mr. De Winter's instructions. Of course, the most beautiful rooms are in the west wing, overlooking the sea. The bedroom is twice as large as this, and the windows look down across the lawns into the sea. I suppose Mr. De Winter keeps the most beautiful rooms to show to the public. Those rooms are never shown to the public. They used to live in those rooms when Mrs. De Winter was alive. That big room I was telling you about that looks down to the sea, that was Mrs. De Winter's room. Next morning there was a heavy mist pouring through the open window. When I came down to breakfast, Maxim had already gone out. Uh, Mrs. De Winter? Yes, Fritz? Mr. De Winter told me to tell you, madam, that he'd gone out with Mr. Crawley. Mr. Frank Crawley is Mr. De Winter's friend who manages the estate. Mr. De Winter said to tell you he'd be back for luncheon at one. Thank you. Oh, Fritz? Yes, madam? It seems rather cold this morning. I wonder if you'd please light the fire in the library for me. The fire in the library is not usually lit until the afternoon, madam. Mrs. De Winter always used the morning room. She always did her telephoning and correspondence in there after breakfast. There's a good fire in there. If you should wish to have a fire in the library as well... Oh, no, no. I wouldn't dream of it. I'll go into the morning room. Thank you, please. If you will allow me, madam, I will show you the way. This was a woman's room. Graceful, fragile... The room of someone who had chosen every particle of furniture with great care. That is strange and startling kind of perfection. I opened the drawer at Hazard, and there was a letter addressed to Mrs. M. De Winter. Mrs. De Winter. Mrs. De Winter. Who is it? What do you want? Mrs. De Winter. I'm afraid... You've made a mistake. Mrs. De Winter has been dead for over a year. It's Mrs. Danvers, madam. Mrs. Danvers. I'm speaking to you on the house telephone. It's about the menu. It's Mrs. Danvers speaking, madam. After lunch, it was still raining. Frank Crawley and Maxim were in the library working. I got a raincoat out of the flower room and started out across the garden down towards the sea. Soon I was in the woods. The dog ran on ahead. The woods came right down to the water. At the fringe was a long, low building, half cottage, half boathouse. There was a buoy anchor there in the cove, but no boat. And there was Jasper wagging his tail at a solitary figure on the beach. As I drew near, I saw that the figure on the beach was a man with the small, slit eyes of an idiot and a red, wet mouth. Good day. Dirty, I was... I'm afraid it's not very nice weather. Jasper, Jasper, come here. Digging some shell. No shell here. Been digging all day. I'm sorry you can't find it. That's right. No shell here. Come on, Jasper. Good dog. Come on. He won't go. Why not? He ain't your dog. No, he's Mr. DeWinter's dog. I want to take him back to the house. Come on, Jasper. Come along. Good dog. She ain't been here lately. What do you mean? The other one. 
You're not like the other one. What do you mean? What other one? Tall and dark, she was. She gave you the feeling of a snake. By night, she'd come down to the cove. I seen it. I looked in on her once here in the boathouse. And she turned on me, she did. If I thought you looking at me through the window, she had her put in asylum, she said. I won't stay as a man, I said, and I touched my cap like this here. She's gone now, ain't she? I don't know what you mean. She's gone in the sea, aren't she? She won't come back no more. No, she'll not come back. You won't put me in asylum, will you? I never said nothing, did I? I never said nothing, ma'am. I never said nothing. I never said nothing. Where did you get that piece of string? I got it for Jasper. You ran away. I found it in the cottage on the beach. Is the door open? I pushed it open. The string was in the other room where the sails were. Oh, I see. That cottage is supposed to be locked. The door has no business to be open. Did Ben tell you the door was open? Ben... Oh, never mind. Maxim. Yes, what is it? I'm sorry I went down to the cove. If you didn't want me to go... What makes you think I didn't want you to go down there? Maxim, how should I know? I'm not a thought reader. I know you didn't want me to go. That's all. I could see it in your face. See what in my face? I've already told you I can see that you didn't want me to go. You're quite right. I did not want you to go down to the cove. Will that please you? I never go near the place. If you had my memories, you wouldn't want to go there either or talk about it or even think about it. There. I hope that's satisfied you. Please, Maxim, please. What's the matter? I don't want you to look like that. Please, Max, let's forget all we said. I'm sorry, darling. Please let everything be all right. We ought to have stayed in Italy. We ought never to have come back to Mandalay. I was a fool to come back. The weather that May was wet and cold. From the terrace, I could hear the murmur of the sea below me, low and sullen. And every morning, a heavy fog would come rolling in from the sea. I could not forget that cottage on the beach and the white, lost look in Maxim's eyes. Somewhere at the back of my mind, a frightened, furtive seed of curiosity grew slowly and stealthily. Frank Crawley was in the library taking tea with me, waiting for Maxim to get home. There were things that I had to know. You, um, you'll be down to the cove, then. Miss Frank. Frank, in that cottage down there, are those all Rebecca's things? Yes. I wondered. Why is the buoy there in the little harbor place? Uh, the boat used to be moored there. What boat? Her boat. Oh. What happened to it? Oh, was that the boat she was sailing when she was drowned? Yes. It capsized and sank. She was washed overboard. Couldn't someone have got out to her? Nobody saw the accident. Nobody knew she'd gone. She often sailed alone at night. How long afterwards was it they found her? Oh, about two months. Where did they find her? Near Edgecombe. About 40 miles up Channel. How did they know it was she after two months? How could they tell? Maxim went up to Edgecombe to identify her. Oh. Frank, I know what you're thinking. You can't understand why I ask all these questions just now. You think I'm being morbid and curious, but it's not that, I promise you. Only when I go to call on all these people, his friends, I know they're looking me up and down and thinking, what on earth does Maxim see in her? Always I know that whenever I meet anyone new, they say how different she is from Rebecca. Frank. Yes? There's just one more thing, one question I must ask you. Will you promise to answer it quite truthfully? I'll do my best. Tell me, was Rebecca very beautiful? Yes. Yes, I suppose she was the most beautiful creature... I ever saw in my life. Here it is, madam. This is it. 
One moment while I turn on the light. Come in, madam. Is this her room, Mrs. Danvers? Yes, ma'am, this is her room. Now you're here, let me show you everything. I know you want to see it all. You've wanted to for a long time. It's a lovely room, isn't it? The loveliest room you've ever seen. I haven't touched a thing. There are flowers on the dressing table, and that's her bed. It's a beautiful bed, isn't it? Here is her nightdress. This was the nightdress she was wearing for the last time before she died. Would you like to touch it? Feel it. Hold it. I did everything for her, you know. You look after me better than anyone, Danny, she used to say. Well, I wouldn't have anyone but you. See? Here's her wardrobe. What's the matter, madam? Aren't you feeling well? I'm all right. I just... I didn't expect to see all of her things this way. I believe Mr. De Winter liked her to wear silver, mostly. But, of course, she could wear anything. She looked beautiful in this velvet. Put it against your face. It's soft, isn't it? Scent is still as fresh as though she'd just taken it off. These are her slippers. Put your hands inside the slippers. They're quite small and narrow, aren't they? When they found her, the rocks had battered her to bits so no one could recognize her. You know now why Mr. De Winter doesn't use these rooms anymore. He hasn't used these rooms since the night she was drowned. I come up every day and dust them myself. If you want to come again, you have only to tell me. Sometimes, when Mr. De Winter is away and you feel lonely, you might like to come up to these rooms and sit here. They're such beautiful rooms. You wouldn't think she'd been gone now for so long, would you? You'd think she'd just gone out for a little while and would be back in the evening. Do you think she can see us talking to one another now? Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? I don't know. I, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if she comes back to Mandalay and watches you and Mr. De Winter, you sitting in her chair in the library before the fire, stroking her dog, talking to her husband. Stop it! Stop. It's no use, is it? You can't do it. You'll never get the better of her. She's still mistress here, even if she is dead. She's the real Mrs. De Winter, not you. It's you that's the shadow and the ghost. It's you that's forgotten and not wanted and pushed aside. Well, why don't you leave Mandalay to her? Why don't you go? What do you mean? Why don't you go? We, none of us want you. He doesn't want you. He never did. He can't forget her. He wants to be alone in the house again with her. You who ought to be dead, not Mrs. De Winter. Come here now to the window. Let me show you something. When the window is open, you can hear the sea down there. Look down there. Look. Let me go. Don't be afraid. I won't push you. But there's not much for you to live for here at Mandalay. Why don't you jump now and have done with it? Then you won't be unhappy anymore. Why don't you try? Go on. Go on. Don't be afraid. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. And so we end the second part of our presentation of Daphne du Maurier's best-selling book, Rebecca, with Margaret Sullivan and Orson Welles. In a few moments, we shall return you to the Campbell Playhouse. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Edwin C. Hill again bidding you welcome to the Campbell Playhouse on behalf of the makers of those fine Campbell suits. In a moment or two, we shall resume our presentation of Rebecca, the best-selling novel by Daphne du Maurier, and starring, as I've said, Margaret Sullivan and Orson Welles. And also, we shall hear from Miss du Maurier herself, direct by short way from London. But first, I bring you a message. For many years, I've been interested in the human side of the news. As a newspaper reporter for all those years, I've found that there's a very human side to business. 
And that is what I want to speak about for just a moment or so. All of us are familiar with businesses which provide us with something to eat or drink or wear, or we buy a radio or a suit of clothes or a can of soup. But the actual thing we buy is about the only contact we ever have with the people who make such goods. But the character of those people is of vital importance. If the manufacturer of a product is honorable in the conduct of his business, his product will be as trustworthy as his word. For in business as in every walk of life, honesty pays real dividends. Honest enterprise is the only kind which has a chance to win and to hold the patronage of intelligent and discriminating buyers whether it's a matter of a piano or a spool of thread or a trip to Europe or a can of soup. And that, as I see it, is the human side of business of the products that last over the years, that serve you well and merit your confidence. I know the Campbell kitchens, the Campbell men, the Campbell soup. The fact that these soups are used more and more every year in most homes and are sold in more than 460,000 grocery stores throughout the land is no accident, believe me. It's due to the human side of this business, its aims, its policies, and its character. And now to the Campbell Playhouse, where we resume our story, Rebecca. Go on, go on, go on. Why don't you jump now and have done with it? Why don't you try? Go on. Go on. Don't be afraid. Jump. Go on. Go on. The damsel is close behind me now. Her hand on my arm. And before me was the open window. And the white mist coming in from the sea. Go on. I shut my eyes. The mist lay upon my lips, rank and sour. My head began to swim. And suddenly the mist had parted. There was a flash in the sky. on the reef, half a mile offshore, with her bows pointed towards the cliff. There were a number of small boats around her, and the Coast Guard cutter lying along. I hear the rockets, but not sure they want. Most throw off the window. You look like a Dutchman, I say. German or Dutch? Good thing there's no sea running. That shallow water she's in. Did you pass? I don't know yet. Does the diver come over from Keris? she be going down to see if she's broken her back. She's on a reef. She's a goner. Have you seen Mr. DeWinter? Have you seen Mr. DeWinter? Uh, Mr. DeWinter? Uh, yes, ma'am. He was one of the first down here after the rockets went. He was down by the cove. Had the dog with him. Do you know where he is now? He went off to Keris 20 minutes ago with one of the crew, the Berengers. Oh, thank you. Good day. Good day, ma'am. Good day, ma'am. I went back to Mandalay the long way through the woods. The fog had cleared. I looked down and saw the stranded ship offshore. The diver must have come up, for I saw a little group of people on the deck of the boat alongside, leaning over, staring into the water. There's a man waiting to see you, madam. He says it's important. He asked for Mr. DeWinter first, and then for you. He's in the library. Who is it, Fritz? He says his name's Captain Thurl, madam, the harbor master from Kerith. Oh, yes, I'll go in and talk to him. Yes, madam. Mrs. DeWinter? I'm sorry my husband isn't back yet. I know, I can't get hold of Mr. Crawley either. The fact is, I've got some news for Mr. DeWinter, and I hardly know how to break it to him. What sort of news, Captain Searle? Well, Mrs. De Winter, it, it, it isn't very pleasant for me to tell you either. We're all very fond of Mr. De Winter around here. It's hard on him and hard on you that we can't let the past lie quiet. Yes, go on. Well, you know, we sent the diver down to inspect that ship there on the reef. Well, while he was down there, he came across something else. The hull of a little sailing boat lying on her side, not broken up at all. He recognized it at once. That boat belonged... To the late Mrs. De Winter. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is it necessary to tell Mr. De Winter? Couldn't the boat be left there as it is? It's not doing anybody any harm, is it? The cabin door was tightly closed and the ports were closed too. The diver broke one of the windows with a stone from the seabed and looked into the cabin. 
And then he got the fright of his life. There was a body in there, lying on the cabin floor. Now you understand why I have to see your husband, Mrs. De Winter. It's all over now. The thing has happened. What thing? The thing I've always foreseen. The thing I've dreamt about day after day, night after night. We're not meant for happiness, you and I. What are you trying to tell me? Rebecca has won. I remember her eyes as she looked at me before she died. I remember that slow, treacherous smile. She knew this would happen even then. She knew she'd win in the end. Maxim, what are you saying? What are you trying to tell me? Her boat. They found it. The diver found it this afternoon. I know. Captain Searle was here and he told me. You're thinking about the body. The body the diver found in the cabin. Yes. It means she wasn't alone. It means there was someone out sailing with Rebecca at the time. And you have to find out who it was. There was no one with Rebecca. She was alone. It's Rebecca's body lying there on the cabin floor. <gasps> the woman I identified wasn't Rebecca. There never was an accident. Rebecca was not drowned at all. I killed her. I shot Rebecca in the cottage down in the cove. I carried her body to the cabin and took the boat and sunk it there where they found it today. It's Rebecca who's lying dead there on the cabin floor. Will you look into my eyes and tell me that you love me now? Oh, darling, you can't lose each other now. We've got to be together always. No secrets, no shadows. Please, darling, please. There's no time. We may have a few hours, a few days. How can we be together now that this has happened? I told you they found the boat. They found Rebecca. What will you do? I don't know. I don't know. Does anyone know? Anyone at all? No. No one but you and me? No one but you and me. Oh, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? The time we wasted when we might have been together. All these weeks, all these days. You were so aloof. You never came to me like this. You were strange with me. Awkward, shy. How could I come to you when I knew you were thinking about Rebecca? How could I ask you to love me when I knew you loved Rebecca still? Whenever you spoke to me or looked at me, I thought you were saying to yourself, this side did with Rebecca, and this, and this. What are you talking about? What do you mean? It was true, wasn't it? You thought I loved Rebecca? You thought I killed her? Loving her? I tell you, I hated her. Our marriage was a farce from the very first. She was vicious. Damnable, rotten, through and through. We never loved each other. We never had one moment of happiness together. Rebecca was incapable of love, of tenderness, of, of decency. She knew how I loved Mandalay. She knew how to hurt me most. She stood there that night in the cottage in the cove, smiling at me. I'm going to have a child, she said. It will grow up here at Mandalay, bearing your name. That's a joke, isn't it? And when you die, Mandalay will be his. You can't prevent it. Have you ever thought how hard it would be for you to make a case against me in a court of law, I mean, if you wanted to divorce me? We've acted the parts of a loving husband and wife rather too well, haven't we? They'll be happy, won't they? All those smug friends of yours, all your blasted tenants, thinking it's your child. It's what we've always hoped for, Mrs. De Winter, they'll say. I'll be the perfect mother, Max, just as I've never been the perfect wife. And none of them will ever guess. None of them will ever know. She turned and faced me. Smiling. Then I killed her. She was smiling still. I fired at her heart. She didn't fall at once. She stood there, looking at me. That slow smile on her face. Her eyes wide open. You have heard all the 
testimony in this case, gentlemen. You have heard how the body of the deceased was found in the cabin of her boat. You have heard the testimony of the boat builder. You have heard Mr. De Winter's story. You have heard how on the night of the tragedy, Mrs. De Winter went down to the cottage where she was in the habit of sleep. Gentlemen, how do you find? The verdict did suicide. Is it was almost dark when he started for Mandalay. He held my hand in his. He didn't speak for a long time. I must have dozed, for I woke suddenly with a start. And heard the first sound of thunder in the air. The air was hot against my face. No rain fell. What is it, darling? Maxim. Maxim, don't drive so fast. I want to get home. I'm worried. I have a premonition of disaster. When everything's over, I don't understand. I want to get home. I want to get back to Mandalay. What time is it? Almost nine. It's funny. It's almost as though the sun was still setting over there beyond those hills. Can't be though it's too late. The wrong direction. You're looking east. Why, oh, yes. It's funny, isn't it? It's in winter you see the northern lights, isn't it? Not in summer. That's not the northern lights you're looking at. That's Mandalay. Maxim, what is it? I don't know. Maxim, look. A fire. Maxim, it's Mandalay. It's burning. Mandalay, it's burning. We have both known fear and loneliness in very great distress. But we have come through our crisis. Of course, we have our moments of depression. But there are other moments, too, when time, unmeasured by the clock, runs on into eternity. And catching Maxim's smile, I know we are together at last. No barrier between us. can never go back to Mandalay again. The past is still too close to us. But sometimes in my dreams I go to Mandalay. I see the gray stone shining in the moonlight. Light comes from the windows. The curtains blow softly in the night air. And in the library the door stands half open as if we had left it with my handkerchief on the table beside the bowl of autumn roses and the charred embers of our log fire still smoldering against the morning. So ends our story. The Campbell Playhouse presentation of Daphne de Maurier's novel, Rebecca. In a moment, I shall bring you Margaret Sullivan and Orson Welles in person and Daphne de Maurier on the long-distance phone from London. In the meantime, here's a man with a message worth hearing. A man who keeps one eye on the dining table and the other on the pantry. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Ernest Chappell. Thank you, Mr. Hill. May I remind you once again of that grand dish, Campbell's Chicken Soup? Remember what I told you about it and make it a point to try it soon. Because until you taste your first glorious spoonful, you're really missing something. Imagine a rich golden broth slowly simmered from plump and perfect chickens, simmered with all the patience and skill of the most particular home cook. 
And imagine an abundance of selective rice, white and fluffy, drifting all through the broth, every grain saturated with its delicious flavor. Then add tender pieces of chicken meat, each a delight to your taste, and you have a picture of Campbell's chicken soup. But only tasting can really tell you how good it is. Why not plan to have Campbell's chicken soup tomorrow? You'll please the family and, incidentally, make a busy day a little easier for yourself. Now, here's Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of Rebecca is standing beside me at the microphone. I'd like to tell her that one of my favorite characters in modern fiction was tonight forever endowed with the personality of Miss Margaret Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Welles. I hope that the novelist approved me, too. I want you to know how much I've appreciated playing once more with the Campbell Playhouse tonight. Especially in this story, which is one of my favorites. Yes, it is a grand story, and I do believe the most important factor of radio entertainment is a good story. I quite agree, too. You know, two things I like very much are good stories and good soup. And when I tell you my idea of a great soup is Campbell's chicken soup, that, Mr. Wells, is no story. I'm glad you feel that way. Nice of you to say so. Oh, by the way, Mr. Wells, I'd like to ask you a question. Very kind of you. Can you tell me the name of the character? Will you repeat that question? What? is the name of the character I just played. Well, that's the major literary mystery of the year. Seriously, she hasn't any name. And our audience, Miss Sullivan, is probably just as curious as you are. And I haven't the answer. Well, Miss Dumarier must know it. She's phoning us from London in a few minutes, so we'll ask her. You know, Miss Sullivan, there's a question I'd like to ask you. Yes, Mr. Wells? Until rehearsal started for tonight's performance, I had never, to put it very bluntly, had the pleasure of your acquaintance. Yes. And, uh, well, now, in six and one-half minutes, Miss Sullivan, you will have gone out of my life. The point is, the point is, I am the director of a theater, the, um... The Mercury Theater. The Mercury Theater. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> what I started to say was that I'd like to know you better. What are you doing next year? Are you speaking as a director? Yes, Mrs. Hayward, as a theater director, if you can be tempted. Have you a script for me? I'll bring it to you tomorrow. Excuse <laughs> me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you'll forgive me for trying to date up one of the nation's most gifted and attractive young actresses. I'm sure you sympathize, and I hope Miss Sullivan understands. We are ready with London, Mr. Weller. Thanks. Are you ready, London? Good evening, Mr. Wells. Good evening, Mr. Moyer. It's nearly three o'clock here in London. It's not often that an author has the chance of hearing the voices of her own characters speaking to her from across the Atlantic Ocean. I've enjoyed it enormously. Thank you. And Miss Moyer, may I present Miss Sullivan? How do you do, Miss Sullivan? I'd like to thank you and Mr. Wells for your splendid interpretation of Mr. and Mrs. De Winter. Ah, oh, thank you. It's been a great privilege. Mr. Marier, there are two questions I'd like to ask you. Your descriptions of Mandalay are so vivid that America is curious to know if there is anywhere in England a house on a state like Mandalay. When you next come to London, Miss Sullivan, get into a train at Paddington Station and travel west. When you've been 250 miles, get out of that train and walk southeast for half an hour. You'll come to some iron gates, a lodge, and a narrow, twisting drive. If you ever find your way to the end of that drive, you may discover Mandalay. <laughs> One thing more, Mr. Marier. Can you tell us the name of the heroine of Rebecca? You haven't named her in the book. Thank you very much, Miss Sullivan, and thank you, Mr. Wells, for your production of Rebecca. It's been very nice speaking to you both. Well, Miss Sullivan, I'm afraid that doesn't answer your question. Uh, hello, Mr. Moyer. Mr. Moyer. Mr. Moyer. Is London off the air, Mr. Chapman? Uh, yes, it is, Mr. Wells. Pardon me, Miss Sullivan, but all we can salvage from the silence overseas is this cryptogram just brought in to Mr. Chapel by a carrier pigeon. Would you care to read it? In the office memo from Daphne du Maurier to Margaret Sullivan. The name of the heroine of Rebecca is Mrs. Max. The winter. Thank you, Miss Sullivan. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wells. 
Next week, Miss Beatrice Lilly interrupts her rehearsals of Noah Coward's new musical to be my wife and call it a day. This is a discreet account by Miss Doty Smith of some indiscretions committed one bonny day in April by a nice family who might just as well be living next door to you and you and you. It is a composite case history in three stages and six symptoms of that perilous and delightful malady known so well to you and you and you and me as spring fever. Until then, my sponsor and I and all of us in the Campbell Playhouse remain obediently yours. Tonight's broadcast was Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, starring Margaret Sullivan and Orson Welles. Featured were Mildred Natwick as Mrs. Danvers, Ray Collins as Frank Crawley, and George Colouris as Captain Searle. Frank Reddick was heard as the idiot, Alfred Shirley as Frith, Eustace Wyatt as the coroner, and Agnes Moorhead as Mrs. Van Hopper. Music for the Campbell Playhouse is composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. Makers of Campbell Soups invite you to join us again next Friday evening at this same time when Orson Welles will present his production of Dodie Smith's delightful excursion into the private lives of a typical suburban family. Call it a day, one of the most successful comedies of its type, which was originally presented on Broadway by the Theater Guild. Our guest on this program will be the always charming and amusing Beatrice Lilly with Jane Wyatt, a young lady who's marching quite swiftly along the road to motion picture fame out in Hollywood. And Jean Dante, who created the part of Anne in the original New York production of Call It a Day. This is Edwin C. Hill speaking for Campbell Soups. I thank you and good night. <laughs> This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. yourself in the position of a certain Matt Dennant, who is the center of some interest in this week's broadcast. I invited you to conceive of yourself as a decent young man, just out of Sing Sing, the rest of your trousers. I sketched in for you the outlines of a scene to be played by yourself as this Matt Dennant, and a certain lady, played by Miss Wendy Berry. Then I said good night, we went off the air. Tonight, my better instincts oblige me to admit that while there were no misrepresentations of fact, 
My whole appeal was designed simply and frankly to lure you back to the Campbell Playhouse. Probably my choice of high spots will not be yours. Perhaps I have led you to expect something between an Al Woods farce and a Drury Lane melodrama. If so, you will be pleasantly surprised. Because John Galsworthy's escape, in spite of its faintly catchpenny title, and even abetted by certain elements of undeniable adventure, is a highly civilized, high comedy indeed. In London, theater audiences remember it for Nicholas Hannon's and Sir Gerald de Moyer's deaf performances of Matt Denon. And in New York, Leslie Howard made another of his very considerable successes in the same part. We shall strive to please. But you'll be glad to know that Wendy Berry, as promised, is here to help us. And now, before escape, and before Wendy Berry, Ernest Chappell. Mr. Chappell? Thank you, Orson Welles. If I were to ask each one of you to name aloud right now your favorite soup, and if I could hear your replies, I'm almost certain the soup that would top them all would be Campbell's tomato soup. The reason, of course, is the magic, matchless flavor of tomato soup as Campbell's make it. A flavor that speaks to every appetite. Watch a hungry man enjoy to the last drop the racy flavor of this smooth blend of luscious tomatoes, delicate seasonings, and fine table butter. Set a fragrant plate full of Campbell's tomato soup before a tired appetite and see its lively tang take hold of that appetite from the very first sip. And the way a child and a spoon and a bright glowing bowl of Campbell's tomato soup make friends is a delight to mothers. Indeed, because everybody, from the youngest to the oldest in the family, enjoys this soup so much, I'm tempted to call tomato, of all soups, the soup of the seven ages. It's always a happy choice for the main dish at lunch or supper, a welcome beginning for the day's main meal. That's why Campbell's tomato soup is the steady favorite with most families. The soup served often and enjoyed always. Have it again soon, won't you? Perhaps tomorrow. And now, our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Escape with Wendy Berry, and here is Orson Welles to set the scene. In our American version of the Galsworthy play, the scene is New York. In New York, there's still a place or two where a civilized man can take his nightcap rather late with leisure and without a floor show. One of these is the grill room of the plaza. Across from the plaza are the last of New York's almost extinct horse carriages. A brace of withering Victoria, some of us still charter these autumn nights when we'd like to take a girl around the park or smoke a pipe before turning in. The night of the murder, Matt Denon found himself alone and after a spot of something in the grill with a pipe to smoke and an urge to smoke it in the open air, he hired the dowdiest of these dowdy old dowagers and started off. That's where our story begins. Yes, sir. Business ain't what it used to be. Why, well, I remember when I bought this mask. Elsie's her name. Get along there. Twenty-eight years ago, that was... You could hardly get through the park on a Sunday morning for the Hansons and the Flies and the Victorias. Hey, Gus. And on a nice warm evening uh, like this. Driver. Yes, sir? Uh, will you stop here by the lake, please? Sure thing. Warm air, warm. Yes, sir. Nowadays, you're lucky if you get two rides a night. Warm. Warm. And if it wasn't for a few steady customers like you, Mr. Dennett, men that's fond of horses... Thanks. Uh, here you are. Getting off, Mr. Dennett? Yes, I, I think I'll walk from here. In this part of the park, at night? Sure, what's wrong with this? Okay. Good night, Mr. Dennett. And thanks. Good night. Get up there. No. Hello. Got a light? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Thanks. I've been holding the cigarette for half an hour. Want one? No, thanks. I have a pipe. Oh. 
That's right. I didn't notice. Not very observing, are you? Sure. Sometimes. I know where you've been today. Yeah? You've been to the track. How'd you know that? Sit down on the bench here. I'll tell you. All right. Well, how? Easy. There's a racing form in your pocket. And you got field glasses. How'd you make out? Pretty fair. Fella took me to Bowie last year for the precinct. Who'd you have? A mother. <laughs> and it didn't rain. You like horses? Well, beautiful. Most beautiful things in the world. More beautiful than women? I think so. Present company accepted, of course. Thanks. You mean that? Mm, as much as I mean a lot of things. You learn to say a lot of things about women and horses. You don't like women, do you? I'm reliable compared to horses, and not so much spirit. Thanks. Of course, there's nothing wilder than a wild horse. You used to break them out west. What about a wild woman? Well, women have the excuse of horses. They've been tame ever since Eve gave Adam his coffee. I guess I'll be getting along. What's your hurry? Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. So long. Well, thanks for the light. Maybe I'll see you again sometime. Maybe. If you ever feel like giving me a ring, here's my phone number. I see. What's the matter? Don't you like me? Sure I do. Why the rush? Say, aren't you scared sometime you ask the wrong guy for a light? Sure I'm scared. But what am I going to do about it? That's right. What do you do? Wall Street? I used to. What now? Just walking around. Got money of your own? A little. If I had money, do you know what I'd do? Get rid of it. Fast. That's just what I wouldn't do. Oh, I wish you used to talk. Sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. <laughs> just just give me the guy that does every time. He doesn't hurt half so much. Pretty rotten, isn't it? What? Oh, the whole business. But I'm anxious now about the human race. Give me horses and dogs any time. I got a cat. Persian? Siamese. He's a beauty. Why don't you come up and see him? <laughs> no, thanks. I'd better be getting along. All right, go ahead. Oh, don't be angry now. I'm the point. Good night. Yeah. Suppose I follow you to make sure. Take my word for it. Good night. Wait a minute. Hey, don't go so fast. Maybe I'm going your way, too. Just a minute, sister. Why? You're not going anyplace. No, who says so? I do. Let me go. I ain't done nothing. Yeah, I know, I know. I was only talking to a friend of mine. I know. Anyway, he spoke to me first. Ask him if he didn't. He'll tell you. Hey, mister. Come on, sister. Mister. You're making a help yourself. Mister, he'll tell you. What seems to be the trouble? I didn't bother you, mister, did I? You talked to me because you wanted to, didn't you? Yes, yes, of course. Sure, I did. It's going to approach you. I saw her sitting here when you come by. Who are you? Detective Murphy, 27 precinct. I've been watching this woman for some time now. This is the first time I've seen her. I don't know about the other times, so officer. If you're wrong about this. I spoke to her of my own accord. Well, I know that's a lie. What's the matter? Can't two people talk together? I'm making no complaint. Look, mister, you keep your nose out of this. I know what I'm doing. I got my orders. It's the third time I watched her. That's a lie. I've never seen them in my life. Well, I've seen you, sister, plenty. So come on, get going. Let her go, officer. On your way, wise guy. I'll run you in, too. You heard me. Let her go. You want to come along, too, huh? All right, you asked for it. I would have a little company. I asked you to let go of that girl. Do I have to do it for you? You're an officer, huh? Now, listen. I've had enough out of you. You need a little of this. You dropped that blackjack. Drop it. Now then. Hey, Mr. Don't hit him. Don't hit a car. I'll show you. I'm going to make you. I'll go. Don't hit him. Don't hit him. You should have done that. Go on now. Better beat it before he comes to. Oh, but he... Run. Go on. Run. Look at him. I know. I hit him hard. Sure you did. But look at his head. He hit his head on the railing. Railing? What railing? Here. Say, that cop don't look right to me. What do you mean? Look at his head. Come on, let's get out of here before they come. Hold here, take us. I get the water from the fountain. No, come on. Suppose he, suppose he's dead. Go on, get some water. Hey, look out! There's somebody coming. You better go. What about you? Go on, do as I say. Run for it, quick. All right. Good luck, Mister. Thanks. Hey, what's going on here? Give me that light. It's Murphy. He's out cold. Yeah. Hey, feel his heart. I'm afraid he hit his head. Huh? Who are you? What are you doing here? He had an argument. I hit him. He fell and. He hit his head on the railing. I'll say he did. What's your name? Matt Dennis. You say you hit him? That's right. Ryan, put in the call to headquarters. Mr. Dennis, you come along with me. Sure. Sure, 
I hit him. I didn't kill him, though. It was the railing that killed him. They gave me five years for a railing. Five years, huh? Yeah, manslaughter. The cop? Lucky you didn't burn, pal. It was the girl that saved me. She hadn't turned up at the trial and supported my story. Yeah, that was a break. That kind of a dame don't often stick her neck out like that. How much more time you got to do? Three years. Three years of making shoes and hoeing potatoes. I never did like potatoes. You're kind of a high-toned guy, ain't you? High-toned? I don't know. I was thrown out of college, and I object to being spoken to like a dog, if that's what you mean by... Take it easy. What's the matter? There's a screw just across the fence there. You can't see us in the fog. No, but that don't stop me from here. Fog's getting thicker. Yeah? Think it'll last? This time of year, yeah. Maybe round us up in a minute. You see if they don't. This fog and rain makes them nervous. That's when the boys make the breaks. Breaks? They say no one ever gets away from this place. Maybe not. But there's been some good trying. Hmm. I wonder... What's that? I'd like a try. A break? Now, yeah. oh, don't you do it, pal. Not alone. You gotta have clothes and money and a car and friends on the outside. Even then they get you. Oh, I don't know. Once you get going... Don't kid yourself, brother. It can't be done. Here's the screw. Forget it. Now, uh... Look at this here. Here's a nice big spot. Nice color. Shut up. No talking there. Keep working. When you finish that roll, line up with the rest of them on the road. Well, do you hear me? Okay, we get it. Then thanks, all. And get gone. I'll be back in five minutes. I want that roll finished. Nice guy, ain't he? Hmm. Want that finish? Put Mr. to bed early tonight. Like a dog. Three more years of it. Like a dog. Ah, oh, they ain't so bad. It's the fog and the rain, that's what it is. Makes them nervous. When a man's nervous, they get used to it. Yeah. Well, I can't get used to it. All right, all right. Kind of touchy, you high tone guys, ain't you? That is the way it was brought up. Listen. Listen. Where's Haberstraw? Over to the left, about three miles away. And you sit here? Not a five and I act. Not act, was I? Not a twelve, and it's tough going all the way. Good. Don't do it, buddy. You haven't got a chance. The only thing you get in this rain is a case of lungs. Yeah, it's better than this. And after they pick you up, it's bread and water and solitary for three months. It's worth a try. They don't have any dogs here, do they? No, but they got a screw between him and a wall with a gun. How far's the wall? About 50 yards. Did a hundred screw in 10 three. Yeah, not in that outfit you didn't. Look, you're nuts, pal. That screw will plug you before you can count five. They can see in the dark, them guy. A nice, quick slug in the back. Hmm. Well, at least that'd be a change. Well... That's the way you feel about it. Now, look. If you get over the wharf, stick to the main road and keep going. And this fog will have to take us back before they start after you. There's some woods about a mile down the road on the left. You're safe there. It'll be dark in an hour. Thanks. Will it have done raw potatoes? Never tried it. Here, take this. What is it? Piece of bread I saved today. Thanks. Hope you make it. Wish I was going. Ain't got the gut. Okay. I'll turn you out the other way. And start counting. When you get to 12, I won't be here. And, uh, give my love to the warden. So long. One. Two. Three. Four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Good morning, ma'am. Eighteen, nineteen, leaving the matter, ma'am. Twenty, twenty-one, not a thing. I brought your arm juice, ma'am. Twenty-two, thank you. Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. That's better. Are you sure there's nothing the matter, ma'am? No, just had a nightmare. Hmm. I dreamt there was a man in my room. Oh? 
After a nightmare, I always come up to pity to make sure I'm awake. So I draw the curtains, ma'am? Please. <laughs> Ellen, what sort of a day is it? About the same as yesterday, ma'am. Still foggy and raining. Oh, dear. You know that contest for the skate? They haven't caught him yet. Oh, how exciting. Been out almost two days now. You know who he is? Mm. It was in the papers. He's the one that killed a detective in Central Park two years ago, remember? The Playboy killer? The one that made such a fuss? Dennis? Yeah, yeah. That was his name. Oh, well, and it might have been worse. I should think in weather like this, he wouldn't have any trouble keeping away from the police. Yeah, but he's got to eat and get clothes, don't he? And when he comes in for that, that's when they'll catch him. Mm. I'll close the window, ma'am. Oh, oh, I suppose I'll have to get up. Oh, this awful weather. Can't ride or fish, can't even go walking. Uh, Ellen? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Ellen, shall I get up or shall I stay in bed all day? Just as you please, ma'am. Oh, I suppose I'd better get up. Shall I turn the bath on now? Yeah. yeah, and hand me that dressing gun, will you? The one on the chair there. Oh, it runs like an ice house. Here you are, ma'am. Thanks. Sorry, ma'am. The water's not very hot this morning. Well, that settles it. I'll not take a cold bath. Yes, ma'am. Ellen, you go right down and find out what's the matter. When the water's hot, you call me. Yes, ma'am. Until then, I'm staying right here in bed. Yes, ma'am. Oh, what a day. Hey. Hey, what's going on there under my bed? Oh, shh. <gasps> Is that a man? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Don't nine. Don't worry. Everything's all right. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. What are you doing in my room? Really, I'm terribly sorry. Fifteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, quiet, twenty. Quiet. I wonder if you'd mind very much speaking pianissimo. Oh, I know who you are. You're the... Yeah, that's right. Well, how did you get in? Through the window. I've been under the bed for hours. Oh, have you? I'm sorry. How was I to know it was a lady? You mean because I don't snore? No, that's not an infallible test of sex. I didn't either. You'd have heard me. You mean to say you went to sleep under my bed? Sure, quite soundly. Of course, if I'd known. Really? Well, aren't you going? I'd like to, but where? Well, really, I can't tell you. Look at me. Where can I go in these clothes? Oh, the stripes. Yeah, yeah that's right, I... Do you expect me to lend you some? Hardly, but I would be eternally grateful if you could give me something to eat, anything. Well, some candy on the table Thanks. over there. Thanks. Have one? Well, you know, you've got quite a nerve. I ought to turn you over to the police. I could do it, you know, just by ringing this bell. Oh, of course you could, but then I don't think you will. No? No. I know who you are. Do you? Your name's in the paper. Now, look. Do you realize my position? Sorry, I'm afraid I only realize my own. Well, what am I going to do? Suppose I don't hand you over. How are you going to get out of here without being seen? Mind if I finish the candy? It's not very good. I've been 40 hours on two raw potatoes and a piece of bread. Mind if I pour myself a drink of water? No, of course not. Thanks. Officer. What are you doing? Nothing. Why'd you go over there so quickly? To signal? No, no, I didn't signal. I... Well, whatever you must know, I put my things into a drawer. This room looks awful. <laughs> Do you know that you're only three miles from the prison? Yeah, I do, I do. The first night I thought I'd get to have a straw, but I walked around in circles. I said, is that a razor there on the washstand? It's my husband, and don't you dare touch it. After all, there's a limit, you know, I'm not going to hand you a weapon. Oh, no, of course not. But you wouldn't mind if I shaved, would you? With this beard, I haven't a chance, even if I did have clothes. I'm a very quick shaver. Give me one minute. I do very few and a half strokes. I'll show you. Oh, I go ahead. There's his brush and his soap. Thanks. I'm sorry there's no hot water. Can't be helped. Uh, have they come close to catching you yet? That's why. Twice I've been within 20 feet of the hound. The hound? Human hound. You know, there's nothing so awful as a shave like that. Oh, I'm this. sorry. Except, of course, not having it. Can I use this towel? No, take the blue one. Thanks. Oh, that's better. That's why I put on my shoes out of the bed. Uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. So you actually slept under my bed, huh? I did. Well, that's amazing. Amazing? It will be if I get away. No one ever has, you know, from that place. Uh, tell me, Mr. Dunham, weren't you a Todd with my brother? He used to talk about a Matt Dennis who did the 100-yard dash in 10-3. Quite likely. I was a part of a lot of brothers. What is his name? Uh, no. No, I can't tell you that. You're right. Never tell a convict anything he can tell anybody else. Well, I really don't see what else I can do to help you. I don't either. Worse luck. I read your trial. Was everything you said true? Gospel. Oh, I suppose the police do keep after those girls. No wonder you lost your temper. But you know, I didn't. I wasn't really angry with him. I hit him. I'm sorry enough for the poor guy after all. Yeah, I have, huh? Well, well, Mr. Dennett, what, uh, what happens now? You've been very kind. I don't want to impose on you any more than I have to, but you know I'll never get out of here this way. Why not? Take a look out of the window. See that man down there is the police. Oh, oh. I could signal to him just now so easily. Good night. Good night. You wouldn't. People don't give away their own kind. Oh, no? Go try some of the other rooms in this place. Try the couple next door to me. Oh, uh, yes? Oh, no, no, thank you. Oh, 
Frank, not right now. Do you think she had it? I hope not. Well, thanks again. You know how swell it's been after two years in jail to talk to a lady. I won't leave any traces. What are you going to do? Wait till the gent downstairs is looking the other way, sneak along your balcony, drop down at the end of it, and run for it again. Are you still a good runner? Pretty fair. I wasn't so stupid. Oh, no. Now, look here. When I go to my bath, I'll make sure there's no one in the hall. If I don't come back, go downstairs. Hanging by the door, you'll find my husband's raincoat, a long tweed on the sting, and a fishing rod in a basket, and an old hat with flies in it. Put them on and go out the front door. The river's down to the left. Can you fish? Yes. Oh, well, you better then. I won't be able to see you, but if you get by safely, whistle... Um, what's the ladies in love with you? Do you know it? Do you know it? Sure. We used to hear it in jail on the radio. I can't thank you enough. I think you're wonderful. Oh, good luck. Oh, no, wait. Here. Take this flask. If you see anyone looking at you, drink. Well, Nothing well. gives people more confidence in a man than to see him take a drink. Right. What are you going to say to your husband? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll worry about that when he comes home. Oh, oh, and, and here's ten dollars. It's uh, all I've got with me. You know... I think you're sublime. I doubt it. If I'm caught, I'll swear I stole everything if I get out of this. Forget it. I get behind the door now. Here we go. All right. The coast is clear. Oh, no, wait. Get back. Here comes the maid. Uh, uh, Ellen? Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you mind getting me the dress I sent down to be pressed last night? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Is your husband back, ma'am? No. Why? Oh, I thought I heard you talking. Oh, I wasn't talking to anyone, Ellen. Just counting. Just counting to myself. All right, ma'am. I'll get the dress now. That's the gray one, isn't it? That's right, Ellen. Very well, ma'am. <sighs> this is getting a little hectic. <laughs> now go on. Quick. And when you get into the street safely, don't forget to whistle. No, I won't. Goodbye. Goodbye. here a while. Have you fish? Uh, of course not. Uh, my name's Underwood, Judge Underwood. I'm retired. How do you do? Paid up too well for you, I'm afraid. Uh, it's a bit bright now, yes. For fishing, I mean. Yes. Best eating in the world, our local trout, except maybe the blue trout out in Washington. Let's see. One, two, four, eight. Eight of them, eh? Yeah. Delicious with butter and potatoes. I'll say. Pretty foggy this morning, wasn't it? There's quite a lot of these fogs here in the valley. Only good for convicts, eh? Uh, escapes, you mean. But they never get away, I believe. No, so I'm told. But they try, you know. They do try. Yes. I've always wondered what I'd do if I bumped into an escaped convict. Yes, you'd have quite a problem there, wouldn't you? Well, between the law and one's instincts as a gentleman, if it's gentlemanly to hold conversation with a felon, what do you think? Well, seems to me anyone who tries to escape must have a lot of nerve. He's taking a long chance. Yes, I don't envy him. This is getting to be a pretty law-abiding country these days. Evading the law isn't quite the glamorous thing it used to be. It's always rather appeal to me. I've done some escaping myself. Oh, is that so? From school when I was a boy. Ran away, huh? <laughs> That's right. I was ahead of them for two days before they caught up. With two me. days? Yeah, very interesting. Good way to lose weight. Ever been on a raw potato diet? By the way, I hear convict got away from Ellsworth the day before yesterday. Yes, I saw that. Yes. Of well, the name of uh, Matt Dennett. I read his case at the time. Very interesting. How did it strike you? Don't believe I remember it. What? That Central Park case? Oh, yes. There was some girl they were trying to arrest. 
You know, in a case like that, they might wait until someone complains, don't you think? Well, technically, I suppose the detective was doing his duty. And yet, in those cases, there's always an element of doubt. The young man didn't complain, I think. You have to remember? As far as I remember, he said that he and the girl were having an intellectual conversation. That's right, I remember that. Uh, cigar? Thanks. Uh, I've got into a bad habit of coming out without tobacco. Mm. That? Thanks. I suppose one might run into that convict fellow any minute, unless they caught him. Be a little like uh, meeting a copperhead. We got a lot of them around here. Poor thing only wants to get away from you. And yet, if you don't break its back, ten to one, it'll bite something. I had two dogs die of snake bite. So it's a duty, perhaps. Uh, don't you think so? Duty? Probably. I don't always do mine. Oh, don't you? Well, I'm glad of that. Neither do I. Hmm. Do you know that prison he got away from? The dreary sort of place. Oh, from the outside, I mean. Ellsworth? Yes, I know it. Fact is, I've had the misfortune to send a good many people to prison in my time. And in those days, I made a point of seeing a prison now and then. I remember I used to give my juries a pass to go and see where they sent their fellow human beings. And out of the lot, how many do you think had the curiosity? None. How'd you guess? Well, who'd want to go into a prison? I just assume this is the morgue. The bodies there aren't living anyway. You tell me prisons are much improved nowadays. They've introduced a human feeling. Have they? Splendid. What was the date of that? Tell me they don't shave their heads anymore. You, you know any convicts? I... No. Well, yes, I know one. Really? Is he interesting? The most interesting man I know. Um, tell me. Suppose this man we were talking about, the escaped convict, suddenly turned up here. What would you do? Run like a hare. Mm. Yes, I suppose it would depend partly on whether anyone else was around. Human nature is very uh, sensitive. Do you like this climate? The Hudson Valley has quite a reputation. Overrated, I think. Been here before? Uh, no, this is my first visit. Staying long? I uh, hope not. Beautiful spot, Grassy Point. I like it better across the river. Well, I think I'll call it a day. Oh, anything wrong? You're not ill, are you? I'm afraid I'll have to abandon the excellent cigar you gave me. I've enjoyed it, but I'm smoking on a rather empty stomach. Oh, yes. I know that feeling. I got it once just before I was to speak at some sort of testimonial dinner. Tobacco must be one of the things you really miss in prison, eh? Yes, I suppose they get tobacco now and then, though. And empty stomachs, too, I guess. Yes. Here's another cigar. Try it later after you've eaten. I will. Would you pass me my basket there? Thanks. Really going, eh? Well, I must be getting on, too. It's been very pleasant. I've enjoyed our little talk. My time of life, one doesn't often get new sensations. Good heavens, have I given you any? Well, I don't remember ever having talked before to a man who'd escaped... Uh, from school. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Dennett. Huh? I hope you have a pleasant journey. Especially as no one seems to have noticed our little chat. Would you mind telling me how you spotted me? Oh, the way you kept looking at your trout. Uh, wolfishly, I think that's the word. Then if you'll excuse me, those striped trousers of yours, that coat only goes so far down, you know. I guess I hoped you'd think I was a leader of fashion. And uh, there was another thing. Your obvious sympathy for yourself. Yes, that's a prison habit. You're not allowed to sympathize with other people for fear of contaminating them, so you sympathize with yourself. Before I got sent up, I don't remember ever feeling sorry for myself. Now I doubt if I'll ever feel sorry for anyone else. Mm, it's very natural. Well, it's been most interesting, because now you see, if I were to meet an escaped convict, I know what I should do. Do you mind if I ask? Well, Mr. Dennett, this time, I say this time, I wink the other eye. So good day to you. Good day, son. Thanks. Swallow well, you. The moment I feel quite human again. You know, that's been rather the effect on me. Well, good day. This is Classic Radio at 90.7 WFUV-FM, New York. Broadcasting System.
This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment, we will resume our presentation of Escape. For just a moment now, I'd like to talk about another kind of escape. I mean the happy escape for Mother from so many of the labors of the kitchen. Time was, and it was only yesterday, when Mother all but lived in the kitchen. She had to do so in order that her family might have tempting and wholesome dishes. Soup making, in particular, was a long and tedious family need, and so she patiently devoted herself to her soup kettle. Today, times have changed. The home soup kettle is more and more going the way of the candle mold and the spinning wheel, as women everywhere have tried Campbell's soups. They've tasted these soups of Campbell's and realized that they are indeed made the true home way. Delicious and wholesome and nourishing. Women have watched their families enjoy them. And they've heard their husbands say there's just no sense either going to all the bother of making soup anymore. Not when we can buy such fine soups as these. And so I'd like to invite you, if you haven't already done so, to try some of the 21 tempting Campbell soups. Try, for instance, Campbell's chicken soup for its rich chicken flavor. Or try Campbell's vegetable soup with its hearty beef stock and 15 different garden vegetables. If you will, I'm pretty sure that when your family tastes them, they'll say to you, too, let's have these soups of Campbell's right along. Now we resume our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Escape, starring Orson Welles and Wendy Berry. For Matt Dennett, age 28, height 5 feet 11 inches, serving five year sentence for second degree murder, escape from Ellsworth Prison Farm October 13th, reported last night on highway number 9W, believed heading south, was last seen wearing gray raincoat, gray felt hat, no trousers. <laughs> it's cleared up, my Nero. So it's cleared up. I made a mistake. So it's cleared up. So maybe after this, you wouldn't be so smart about the climate. <clears throat> it's going to rain. And you, Mrs. Smarty, you never make mistakes, I don't suppose. you got to have arguments you two all the time. Just because you're married don't mean you got a legal right. People are all ready, Mama. Certainly. So now we are here, we're having a picnic, and everything is nice. Certainly, I think it's right. Everything's very nice. I sure was hungry. Potato salad? There you are, Ivy. Help yourself. So eat, please, everybody. Remember, it's free. Grab the sand for nothing. <sighs> Enjoy yourself. Oh, a cheesecake for dessert. Max, I made special for you the cheesecake. Thank you. Say, so, Ivy, you brought your clarinet? Sure, I got it. Yeah, give a tune, I think. Make a little lively in the party, huh? Yeah, how about the one you played the other night? It's Spanish or something. Spanish? Yeah, I know how this is going. Lamping them. Just a moment, Pop, please. Can't you see that I'm thinking? You quit thinking, but I know how it's going. I don't. I Wait, I'll check it. I'll give you exact all. Lampin' Pampa in the Impa. Please, I know the song. It's Rancho Grando. Yeah, that's right, Rancho no. Grando. Girls, go ahead, play. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to you. I wonder if you could put me right for Nyack. I seem to have got lost. Nyack? Oh, that's some height, buddy. That must be about 10 miles. 15. That far, is it? Yeah, sure. You see, you go south through Pearl River you want to stand, and then you go up the hill and to the left. And you'll see the signs. Uh, maybe if you wait a while, we'll give you a lift. No, thanks. I like the exercise. Then, uh, fishing? Oh, question to ask. Uh, profession, trout. And the uh, lock? Hey, it's rather small. Here they are in the basket. Mm. Oh, hey, they look good. Oh, you like them? Oh, I didn't mean that. Don't refuse, Rosie. This is an insult. That's very nice of you, Miss Fair. It certainly is. Thanks. Hey, give me the newspaper serving. I'll wrap them up. Oh, uh, here you are. Here you are. Thanks. That's all right. I'll write it already. Turned out to be a nice afternoon, didn't it? You drive far? Spring Valley. Yeah, oh, I think he's Rosie's boyfriend. He took us in his machine. He's got relations, you know. Anything there of an escaped convict? A skype convert? Sure, Irving. I told you about it this morning. You remember? I was speaking to you. I 
He got away in the fog the night before last. I'm sure you... You know what it reminds me? Yes, like in a movie I saw with Georgie Rapp, where he comes into the bedroom, you know, and then you see his hand come right over her pillow. I thought I'd die. Uh... Hey, maybe it's hearing the paper there about him. Move the fish over and give a look. Of course it's on the paper, Pop. Didn't I tell you about it this morning? Don't you remember? That's here fellow from Park Avenue, the one who killed the cop in Central Park. Don't you remember, Pop? The Playboy killer. Everything he knows. Everything he knows. First he's out mentioning the weather, and now he's a police. Never mind, Pop. Never mind, I'm a policeman. I thought half the cops in the state is after him right now. So let him look, and I hope they'll catch him. That's no good. I thought he had some tough luck, you know. So that's tough, huh? He hit a detective, he busted his head, and he killed him. So where did he come out to catch him? The jury found it was a quarrel. The man made no attempt to evade arrest. Besides, when the detective said he hit his head on a railing, and the doctor said he died of concussion. <laughs> concussion. And if I would have been the judge, I would have given him absolutely the electric chair. Already is a judge now. He only got off because he was society. Absolutely. You understand, buddy? The whole thing is with the social structure. Say, is that man... your car out there on the road? Sure is, buddy. How does she run? Absolutely perfect. Would you believe, mister, that I could take you in places and that machine that half your big cars wouldn't even get you in there? Uh-huh. Nice, no, a mechanic. Really? That's swell. A mechanic he is, is a judge, a social service. Listen, come on, everybody. We're going. All right, please, Pop. Never mind. Well, Never good mind. afternoon. I hope you enjoy the fish. Are uh, you sure you don't want us to give you a lift? No, thanks. So long. Good night. Well, Goodbye. 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 And thanks for the fish. A thoroughly charming, nice young fellow. A nice boy. Hey, such a nice young man. Uh, pass me the cheese, please. Hey, Pop, did you see what he did? Will you please pass me the cheese? But, Pop, did you see what he did? All right, then, what did he do? He snitched some of the food. He snitched some of the food. Why would a man like him snitch other people's food? Listen, I saw him with my own eyes. He took the cheesecake. <laughs> he took the cheesecake. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. What are you talking about, Rose? He took the cheesecake. Why should he take that cheesecake? He... He took it! He took... Say, Pop, I just thought of something. That's what I did you thinking. Pop, did you notice his pants under his coat? I am not interested in pants. I'm looking for cheesecake. What but was the matter with his pants? He wasn't wearing any. Listen, listen. First is a judge, then he's a mechanic, then he's a social fighter. No, he's a detective. Pop, please, don't you get the pants. He wasn't wearing any pants. Hey, what's that? Max, the machine. I think the shabby. How's that for a trade? Did I tell you this morning? That a rich should have rain. Hey, Joe. Look. Where? There. Behind the haystack. It's a man. Man? Yep. He's asleep. He's wearing a raincoat. Sam. Yeah? You know what I think? You think so? Look at his legs. He's waking up. Uh, good afternoon. Seems to be the trouble. What seems to be the trouble? He was just talking. Hey, would you mind pointing that pitchfork the other way? Police told us to be on the lookout for an escaped convict, and we thought maybe you was it. <laughs> uh, that's good. Well, now you see that I'm not. We don't know who you are, Mr. Which place is this? Old man Conklin. I'll see Mr. Conklin. I uh, guess Mr. Conklin will be wanting to see you, too. Joe, you go get the old man. Last the orange and tomato patch. Okay, I'll be back. Don't let him go, Sam. I won't. Well? This, um, convict fellow must be around here somewhere. Stole a car. Found it a little ways up the road, in a ditch. What's the car got to do with me? Hey, Sam... Leave that to Mr. Conklin to decide. All right, what are we waiting for? Let's go down and see this, Mr. Conklin. No, I reckon you better sit right here for a spell. Anything you say. Uh, how are the crops this year? Uh, yes. The rain must have done them a lot of good, eh? I, the rain... Oh, come on, now, do I talk like a convict? Can't say. Never heard a convict talk. And if you ate him, 
What was you doing hiding in the haystack? What do you mean hiding? We say he had fish rod with him, too. Convict fishing through ditches. Might be. Look here, I've had enough of this. You stay where you are, I'll run you clean through this pitch fork. Hey, what's trouble, Joe? And there he is, Miss Cox. He's up there. Stop, but look at the man. Yeah, look at the house, like I told you. Oh, Paul. Warren. Now then, what's going on here? Mr. Compton? That's me. My name's Matthew. John Matthew. I'm staying at New City. These men of yours seem to think I'm a convict. Well, I'll tell you, we're trying to toast the state prison. Yes, I know. You've got to be careful when there's a break. And the state trooper says this is the worst dangerous man they've ever had. Sarah, get along with you. Oh, Pa, I want to stay. You can't. The youngest daughter's here. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Hello. State trooper here less than an hour ago. He a description that fits you pretty well, mister. You better get him back here and let me talk to him. That's an idea. Joe, go down to the house. Call Santelli at the courthouse. Tell him to come over. All right. Sarah, go along with Joe. Oh, Pa, I want to stay. Now then, mister. What did you say your name was? Uh, Matthew. 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 You say you're staying at New City? Yes. Maybe you can tell me the name of the place you're staying. Uh, I never pay any attention to names. You can tell me the name of the place you're staying at. No, I'm afraid I don't. That Ever. porch on the side with three windows? Uh, y- yes, I had breakfast in there this morning. Well, that porch burned long. down two years ago. I guess you left in a hurry after breakfast because you forgot to put your pants on. Under your coat. All right, Mr. Conklin, you win. Gee, Pa. <laughs> I kind of thought you was here. The minute I saw you. Sam? Yes, Mr. Conklin? Get out of the house, run. Catch Joe. Say it's a convict, all right. Come to bring out the wagon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, be a sport. Give me a chance. <laughs> Can't do that. No use asking me. I suppose not. Oh, well, I gave them a good run for their money. I've had 48 hours free. See, you have a cigarette. Use a plug, myself. Haven't you? Uh, no, thanks. Hey, mister, would you sign my book? Now, Sarah, that's no way. Well, i got to get somebody, don't I? It's no fun collecting autographs if I don't get somebody. Well, all right. Here, mister, sign the book for the little girl. Oh, all right, sir, I'll sign it. If you want it in ink or in blood. Gee, that'll be swell. Mine or yours? Uh, got a pencil? Here. She's got a fountain pen. Put... To my friend, Sarah Conklin, uh, devotedly. Mm-hmm. To my friend, Sarah Conklin, devotedly. All right. Yeah. Gee, thanks, Mr. Mister Dennis. Now, when you're an old lady, you'll be able to say you've met murderous maps. Mr. Conklin. Yeah? Won't you give me a chance? He's a better criminal? <laughs> not me. Oh, of course not. It was foolish of me to ask you. Well, that's that. I guess there's nothing more to say, is there? Goodbye. What are you talking about? I said goodbye. I'm going. Going where? Hey, you can't do that. Why not? I don't see who's going to stop me. Can hey, you? Put on my pitchfork. Joe, Sam. Too bad you sent them away. Joe, Sam. I'm come back here. Wait for them now. Sorry. So long. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Dennis. Hey, come back here. Come back. Joe. Sam. I don't care, sir. What is it, Mr. Conklin? I'm getting the wagon. There he goes, Miss Conklin. Add a boy, Mr. Dennis. There he goes. Hiding behind those coats in the vestry. Oh. You're the convict they've been looking for. You oughtn't to have come here into a church. I don't know where I'll go now. Wait. Close the door. I think I read about you. You're that Matt Dennis. Yes. Poor fellow. I didn't mean to kill him. I've been sorry. Where have you come from? Who was chasing you? Farm down that way. Conklin and Farmer, two hired hands, a state trooper, Lord knows who else. My parishioners. And you came to me for sanctuary. Sanctuary. I wonder. This is a situation I've never had to face, Mr. Dennis. If you just let me rest a bit, that's all I'll ask for. Of course. Sit down. Thank you. I locked the door. About that window? Oh, no. No, they can't see in. I expect you're hungry, too. No, thanks. I'm beyond it. You know that feeling? No. I'm afraid we of the church lead to regular lives. Well, Father, how does it look? Can you give me up? Father. As one man to another, who am I to give you up? I can't help you to escape, but if you want rest, 
Yes, you're welcome. I wonder what our Lord would have done. Well, that, Mr. Dennant, is the hardest question in the world. Nobody ever knows. Very tired. I never thought one could feel so tired. I have a little brandy here. Sometimes someone gets faint in church. Thank you, Father. Here, drink it down. Thanks. I don't mind here. I wonder if you'd return this flask for me. It's empty. And here's the address. I ripped the label out of the coat. You might say, with unending gratitude. But please don't give that name away. I'll see to it. What made you escape? Hmm? Stick a bobcat in a cage and open the door by mistake and see what happens. <laughs> yes, I know what you're thinking. I've done my time and more. Didn't you have a fair trial? You can't try bad luck. Oh, bad luck. Well, I oughtn't to have hit him, of course, but for an ordinary knockout, six weeks or something like that, that's about all you get. I got five years because of a railing. If you're quiet in your own mind, that's the only thing. Well, you needn't worry, Father. I'll be caught, all right. I'm not worrying about that. What bothers me is my own peace of mind. I don't like the thoughts that keep rising in it. Your parishioners, eh? Yes. When you've gone, shall I be entitled to have been silent about you without telling them that I've been silent? Am I entitled to refrain from helping the law without letting my parishioners know it? And if I let them know it, can I keep what little influence I now possess? And is it right for a priest to go on where he has no influence? That's my trouble, Mr. Dennis. I see. Okay. Uh, here. Who is that? Me, Father. Thank you for a No, Thomas, I'm busy now. I can't let anyone into the church till service time. Very good, Father. My sex to the hospitality of the Lord. I shan't forget, Father. I don't want to be on your conscience. I'll be moving. No, wait. I'll have vespers in a few minutes. There'll only be a few gathered together, I'm afraid. You can rest in the vestry through the service. Nobody comes in here. Thanks, Father. You're all right, but I'd rather go and take my chance again. It's dark now, and I don't like to give up. I'll give them another run and be caught in the open. You might give me your blessing, Father. Oh, no. I'm not certain enough of myself. Not certain enough. It takes a bishop at least to give a blessing. Mm -hmm. That's the real thing this time. What is it? Open the door, please. Who is it? Open the door. Open, please. I give up, Father. Get behind those coats in the pockets. Right. Sorry, Father. I didn't trouble you, Father, but it's about that escaped convict. I told you, Thomas, I could see no one until after Vespers. I know, Father. I know, but this officer here thought you ought to be told I saw a man coming in here a while back. What's all this about, officer? It's the escaped convict, Father. This man says he found him in a haystack on the South Mountain Road, but he gave him a slip. Then he came in here. You have been here long, Father? An hour, at least. Our door's locked, but I have a minute to side. I'm sure he's not inside. In the church. I don't know whether you have the right to search a holy place, but... Well, look for yourselves. As quietly as you can, please. Look behind me. Thank you. You go with them, Thomas. I'll stand here. Look, supposing that can't be quite all right. Yes, Father. Now, quick. Up there, up church. No use to coming back. Anywhere in there. Oh, Conklin looked already. Hey, Doctor. My customer. We're catching here, though. He got away from you. Yes, he did. Run and twist like a rabbit, he can. He's got you, he is. Say, what's behind them coats? More coats, I think. I'll look. Yes, that's all there's been there. A few coats. Now, that sure is a funny thing. Tell us why I'm coming in here. Sure, he's all right? Oh, I saw him, all right. Well, sorry to have caused you all this trouble, Father. It's got to be done, you know. Quite all right. Thomas, it's time to ring the bell for Vesper. Yes, Father. And I'm afraid I'll have to ask you all to go, too, please. Unless, of course, you'd like to stay for the service. No, no, can't do that. Have to keep after him. Yes, I understand. All right. Let's go. Hey, just a minute. You'll pardon my asking, Father. But are you certain you haven't seen this man? What is it you're asking me? Father, I'm asking you on your honor as a Christian whether or not you've seen the escaped convict. Of course I... he hasn't. Sorry, Father, I was hidden in there. I give up, officer. <laughs> Thought we wouldn't look in here, didn't you? We saw you heading this way. Do you think we wouldn't see you? All right, Dennis. The party's over. Let's go. Please. Please. Be quiet in this place. Forgive me, Father. Oughtn't to have come in here. It wasn't fair. It's all right. The trouble is, it's one's decent self one can't escape. Ah. Uh, bless it. One's decent self.
concludes our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Escape, starring Orson Welles and Wendy Berry. In just a moment, Mr. Wells will return to the microphone with Miss Berry. Meanwhile, I'd like to take long enough to tell you just what it is that gives Campbell's tomato soup its superb, its really matchless flavor. First, of course, are the tomatoes. Campbell's use only tomatoes grown under their supervision. Tomatoes that are extra luscious, heavy with fine flavor and deep in color. And then Campbell takes these specially grown tomatoes and smoothly blend them with golden table butter and add delicate seasoning to bring out all the full, rich tomato flavor. Have you had Campbell's tomato soup lately? I say lately because this has been a great tomato year and you'll enjoy more than ever the taste these fine tomatoes give to Campbell's tomato soup. So won't you take this as a friendly reminder of the rare good eating that awaits you in a steaming plateful? And remember, too, you can delightfully vary your way of serving it sometimes by adding an equal quantity of milk instead of water to enjoy a luscious, extra-nourishing cream of tomato. Won't you want to put on your grocery list tomorrow Campbell's tomato soup? And now, here is Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our guest of the evening, one of the gayest and most charming ladies in Hollywood, Miss Wendy Berry. Thanks, Austin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Miss Berry's brief life has been full of surprises, ladies and gentlemen. She was born in Hong Kong, China. By the time she was 17, she'd been around the world six times. Seven. And in, out, uh, in, in and out of no less than seven young ladies' academies. Six, Austin. I'll never get this right, but thank you, Wendy. <laughs> her going into pictures was accidental. I'm sure I'm right about this. Alexander Corda caught sight of her at a luncheon table. A dinner. Uh, uh, dinner table. Within a few hours, she was playing one of the lovely ladies who brightened Charles Lawton's life. As Henry VIII. Well, that's roughly the way it happened. And it? in her latest picture, RKO's highly successful five came back. Is that right? It was only by the closest of margins that she did not remain on the banks of the Amazon, a prey to bloodthirsty savages. The headhunters, also. The headhunters. I, for one, and I'm sure all of you, ladies and gentlemen, are extremely glad that she did not escape from the headhunters and survive to be with us on the Campbell Playhouse tonight. <laughs> well, I'm glad too, Orson. Terribly glad. It's been a lot of fun playing here with you tonight. Thanks, and I hope you'll be back with us very soon, Wendy. <laughs> Campbell Playhouse presentation of Escape, Miss Wendy Berry, our guest, played the lady in the hotel. Ray Collins was more than ordinarily busy in the roles of the murdered cop, the forgiving judge, and the unforgiving farmer in the order name. Regoli number two was Everett Sloan, who started off as the convict, made a quick change into the character of Irving, the young picnicker, and rounded out the evening as the second farmhand. Edgar Barrier was the priest and the caddy. Jack Smart was another cop and another farmhand. The girl in the park was played by B. Benaderet, who was also present at the picnic. Henriette Kay was the maid, and Mabel Albertson was Bessie. And here comes the surprise. In case you didn't guess, the foremost picnicker of them all was that really great and really inimitable Benny Rubin. Music for the Campbell Playhouse, as always, was conducted and in part composed by Senor Bernard Herman. And now just a word about next week's story. Next week we transplant another fine play from the other side of the ocean. And hope it does as well here on the radio as it did there on the stage. If this one does not, you can blame me for it because this one is probably the biggest hit that ever clicked in seven languages and plays have been written in prose. The story is Lillian. Need I say more? The star is Helen Hayes. Can I say more than that? Until then, until next Sunday night at this same time, when Helen Hayes rejoins us on the Campbell Playhouse, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soup, and all of us on the Campbell Playhouse remain as always obediently yours. Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we will bring you one of your most favorite plays, Lillian, featuring Orson Welles and Miss Helen Hayes, our exclusive Campbell Playhouse star. Remember, Campbell Playhouse next Sunday evening. Meanwhile, if you've enjoyed tonight's presentation, won't you tell your grocery store tomorrow when you order Campbell's tomato soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. A great new daytime show for radio listeners. Lanny Ross, radio's popular star, singing your favorite songs.
Hear him every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning over most of these stations. See your daily paper for time and station. Why not make a date for tomorrow with Lanny Ross? The Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Tonight we broadcast our version of what is generally regarded as one of the greatest of the modern mystery murder novels. In some peculiar fashion, it seems to have become necessary to defend the murder mystery as a form of entertainment. Heavy artillery is brought up in its behalf. President Wilson, it is proclaimed loudly, could not go to sleep or could go to sleep, one does not remember the point exactly, until a certain number of conflicting clues had managed to efface the days from his... And with a mysterious solved only after suspicion has been aimed at every adult in the neighborhood, he's not particularly shameful. I have never understood the need for this defense. Murder mysteries are, among other things, our most moral form of entertainment. The wrongdoer is regularly apprehended. If he is not, I have incredibly missed some fascinating black sheep of an author in a flock otherwise startlingly white. And one learns an obvious lesson that to be suspected wrongfully is in due course to be triumphantly cleared of suspicion. Life doesn't always proceed according to this admirable pattern. The apologists would do better to defend life, I sometimes think. To help us solve the mystery of the murder of Roger Ackroyd here tonight, we are fortunate in having a very powerful ally, a most distinguished lady and one of your favorite actresses. A lady in whose ears a nation's applause is still ringing for her latest brilliant success in drums along the Mohawk. Miss Edna May Oliver. But before we delve into the mysteries of this night's doings, Ernest Chappell has a comment to make on something which appears to be no mystery at all. Mr. Chappell. Thank you, Orson Welles. I'd like to ask all of you if you'll do this. The next time you're out in the car driving along the highway... Just note the great number of eating places that display as their main invitation to you the words chicken dinners. The reason, of course, is simply that the proprietors of these eating places know by long experience that to nearly all of us, one dish that is a symbol of good eating is chicken. Now, because chicken is a favorite dish with nearly everyone, it's really no mystery at all why Campbell's chicken soup continues to grow steadily in popularity. You see, in every drop of the glistening golden broth, there's the rich chicken flavor you like so much. Steeped in deep chicken flavor, too, is fluffy white rice in every fragrant plateful. And you'll also enjoy the pieces of melting tender chicken meat that Campbell's add. Yes, here is chicken soup, deep and full and rich. And you'll appreciate that from your first brimming spoonful. If you've already enjoyed this homey old-fashioned chicken soup as Campbell's make it, won't you remember to have it again soon? And if you haven't yet tried it, won't you do, do so at dinner tomorrow night? Because I promise you, just as sure as you like chicken, you'll like Campbell's chicken soup. And now our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd with our guest of the evening, Edna May Oliver. And ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, I think you'd like to know that we have with us in the studio tonight as a surprise visitor... <clears throat> None other than the celebrated Belgian detective, Mr. Hercule Poirot. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have a you good evening. Uh, if we had time, which we have not, I'm sure nothing would please us more than to hear from Mr. Poirot, unfortunately... Why unfortunately when we have here a microphone? But, Mr. Poirot, you, you don't understand... I that... understand only that since my arrival in your country some weeks ago, I observed that there is circulate an impression of my person which I must now publicly refute. I trust that the embarrassment of my presence here tonight in Mr. Wells' studio will ensure from him an honest and lifelike portrait. It has been said that I am a little man. Regard for yourself that this is not so. I have five feet two inches of high. 
My head is perhaps egg-shaped, and I carry it perhaps a little to one side, the left, but my eyes shine green when I am excited. Beyond this, my mustache are the largest in Europe, and my force is in my brain and not in my feet. If these things are made clear, and Mr. Wells is a little tribute to Hercule Poirot, I will be satisfied. The results of my little uh, gray cells will speak for themselves. If you will show me where I am to sit, please. I thank you. Uh, uh, this is Mr. Poirot, Miss Oliver. How do you do? Miss Oliver, you have often wanted to meet me, I am sure. I compliment you. Uh, please, please, Mr. Poirot. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd. <laughs> Well, let me to start with give you some idea of the little village of King's Abbot, of which I have for so many years been the leading, I must admit, also the only physician and surgeon. My name, by the way, is Shepherd, James Shepherd. We have a large railway station, a small post office, two rival general stores, very few able-bodied men, a staggering number of unmarried ladies, none of whom are getting any younger, and an amazing number of retired military officers, all of whom are getting older. In fact, the only newcomer for many months is next door to me, concerning whom little is known, despite the earnest and tireless investigations carried on in respect to him by my sister Caroline. Caroline and her little group of earnest ferrets, or maiden ladies like herself, have been forced to content themselves with the simple fact of his nationality, which is alien, of his name, which is Poirot, the obvious fact that he potters around his garden all day growing cucumbers, and the suspicion, based chiefly on malicious deductions, he's retired hairdresser. Let's see. Now, the main house of any importance in King's Abbot is Fernley Hall, owned by Roger Ackroyd, who's always looked more like a country squire than any country squire could really look, but who's actually an immensely wealthy manufacturer of wagon wheels, nearly 50 years of age, rubicon of face, and genial of manner, and general the life and soul of our, to this week, the peaceful village. The other house of any importance has been left to Mrs. Ferrars by her late husband. Uh, Mrs. Ferrars died on the night of the 16th of September, a little less than a week ago. It seems longer than that. I've sent over for a Eight o'clock in the morning of the 17th. There was nothing to be done. She'd been dead some hours. I turned to my home as soon as I decently could, looking forward happily to the warm breakfast I had missed and rather unhappily to the certainty of a relentless cross-examination by my sister Caroline. Is that you, James? What on earth are you doing out there in the hall? Just hanging up my overcoat, my dear. Oh, Mrs. Farrow's died in her sleep, didn't she? Bacon is cold. How did you know? Out of the dawn securing information instead of warming the bacon, is that it? I suppose you're going to tell me she died of heart failure. Annie told me. The milkman told her. He had it from Brass Cook. Since you are bound to hear sooner or later, Caroline, from the greengrocer or the postman, I might as well tell you myself. She died of an overdose of sleeping medicine. She hadn't been sleeping well later. Nonsense. She took it on purpose. Well, now, why on earth should Mrs. Ferrars wish to commit suicide? A widow still fairly young, very well off, good health, nine of you would enjoy life. And looking forward to marrying Roger Ackroyd. Don't forget to do that out. That's an item of fact only in your local gossip circle. A fact's a fact. And there is such a thing as remorse, James, even if you're as wealthy as Mrs. Farrar. Remorse? I have always been convinced she poisoned her husband, and I'm more than ever convinced of it now. If you'd arranged an inquest a year ago, as I suggested, you You're should... talking nonsense, Caroline. Then you're absolutely satisfied it was an accident. I'm satisfied this bacon is not going to get any warmer by itself, and it's time I went to the surgery to see my patient. All right, James, you don't have to be grumpy about it. Oh, by the way, Mr. Ackroyd's butler, Parker Cole. Well, what about Mr. Ackroyd wants to know if you'll dine with him this evening. He says he'd regard it as a great favor if you cancel any other engagement. Of course I'll go and... Don't worry, Caroline. I may tell you all about the dinner tomorrow. Oh, then I'll give you something to tell Mr. Ackroyd tonight. Rafe Payton is back. Rafe Payton? Yes. And he's staying at the Dog and Whistle. I know he's taking particular pains to be sure that Mr. Ackroyd doesn't find out about it. I wouldn't dream of telling him Roger Ackroyd's relations with his stepson are his own affair. Believe me, Caroline, according to every interpretation except your own... I can't help it if people tell me things. In answer to question. Well, you'd better rush along to that precious surgery of yours. You've got four patients waiting. How do you know? Well, one can't help seeing through a window. If one is looking through a window... The distance from my house to Fernley Hall, Roger Ackroyd's home, is a little over two miles. I remember that evening as I walked that the subject of Caroline's latest piece of gossip kept returning to my mind. Rafe Payton was in King's Abbot. Rafe Payton, whom I'd known and liked since he was a child. Adopted by Ackroyd upon the death of his mother, he'd grown up to be a handsome but what our narrow little village regarded as a rather wild young man. 
There have been many stormy scenes between his stepfather and himself before he finally left for London. According to Caroline, he was secretly engaged to Flora Aykroyd, Roger Aykroyd's niece, who with her mother was now living in Fernley Hall. Uh, according to Caroline, I say, and Caroline's information, I'm afraid, is always exact. However illegitimate her source may be. What's the trouble, Aykroyd? A bit under the weather? Yes, Doctor. I've had a little of that pain out of food lately. You must give me some more of those tablets of yours. I thought as much, Aykroyd. I brought some up with me. My bag in the hall. I'll get them. Oh, no, don't trouble. Uh, make certain that window is closed, will you, Shepard? Of course. Well, the latch one's open. I'll put the latch across, will you? All right. I think it's really bothering you, Aykroyd. The, uh, the door's closed, isn't it? Yes. Shepard, nobody knows what I've gone through in the last 24 hours. What's the trouble? You're an old friend, Doctor. My oldest friend, perhaps. You attended Ashley Ferris in his last illness, didn't you? Yes, I did. Did it ever enter your mind that he might have been poisoned? Well, frankly, I don't think I... He was poisoned. By whom? His wife. She told me so herself yesterday. Yesterday? You mean a few hours before she died, she told me? Yes. Some weeks ago, I asked Mrs. Ferris to marry me. She refused. Last week, I asked her again, and she consented. Yesterday, I called upon her. I noticed that she'd been very strange in her manner for some days. Now, without the least warning, she broke down completely. She told me everything. Her hatred of her swine of a husband, her growing love for me, and then, a year ago, the dreadful means she had taken to free herself. It was poison, Shepard. Murder in cold blood. Murder? Are you sure, Eric? That wasn't all. It seems there's one person who's known all along what she did, who's been blackmailing her for huge sums. It was the strain of that that drove her nearly mad. Who was the man? She wouldn't tell me his name. Are you any suspicion? I don't dare have a suspicion. Something she said made me think that the person in question might actually be a member of my household. But that can't be so. I, I won't let it be so. I must have misunderstood her. What would you say to her? What could I say? She made me uh, promise to do nothing for 24 hours. And she refused to give me the name of the scoundrel who'd been blackmailing her. I never dreamt she'd kill herself. Shepard, will you hand me that letter on the table there, in the blue envelope? Uh, this one? Thanks. It's from her. It arrived during dinner. She must have written it just before she... You think she wrote you the little bit she didn't tell you, is that it? Name of the man? Yes, I think so. I've got to open it, and yet I... I'm afraid. What's that? What? I thought the match of the door gave a bit. Yes? I'll see if there's anyone there. No one. Uh, no, as I expect. Are you sure you shut the window? Yes, it's closed. Well, I'll read it. If I read it to you, it won't seem so bad. I won't be facing it alone. No matter what the name. My dear, my very dear Roger, a life calls for a life. I see that. I saw it in your face this afternoon. So I'm taking the only road open to me. I leave to you the punishment of the person who made my life a hell on earth for the last year. I would not tell you the name this afternoon, but I propose to write it to you now, dear Roger, now that I have nothing more to fear. Will you forgive me, Shepard, but I see I must read this alone. It was meant for my eyes and my eyes alone. Do you think that's wise, Roger? I'd rather wait. Well, if you insist on not letting me help you. If you must put it that way, yes, my dear friend, I do insist. I'm sorry. <laughs> I left Fernley Hall at a quarter to nine. From Fernley Hall to my house, it takes, as a rule, about three quarters of an hour. The night of the moon shining, and I did it and left. From the road, I noticed the lights blazing in our parlor. Caroline was entertaining. Through the window, I caught sight of an egg-shaped head, partially covered with suspiciously black hair, two immense mustaches, and a pair of watchful eyes. James, come in, come in, come in. You're just in time for hot milk and crackers. Oh, thank you, Caroline. Oh, excuse me, I'm This is my brother, Dr. Shepherd. I am enchanted. James, this is Mr. Hercule Poirot. How do you do, sir? Mr. Poirot is our new neighbor. If I may be permitted the one slight correction, my name is Hercule Poirot. Your good sister proceeds on the familiar English assumption that we are not English. 
do not know how to pronounce our own silly names. <laughs> You're just making fun of me, James. He has a very dry wit. We've had quite an interesting conversation. I question that it was two-sided. And do you know what Mr. Poirot told me? He's a policeman. Uh, pardon, mademoiselle. Not yet I see do you appreciate Hercule Poirot. It is true worth the name Poirot, mademoiselle. is known today in every continent, every land, nay, in every city of the world. I am become the mode, the last word. I am as much a specialist as an early street physician. Well, that's what I said, didn't I? A detective? Yeah, consulting detective. That's what I said. I'm afraid, Mr. Poirot, you find little to occupy a man of your talents in this village. Mr. Poirot tells me what he's looking for just now is peace and quiet. Precisely, mademoiselle. That and the correct soil, which you have in so great abundance here in King's Abbot for the cultivation of cucumbers. Oh, I'll answer it. It's probably Mrs. Bates and her rheumatism. Never mind, Caroline. I'll take it. Oh, all right. Hello. Hello. What? What's that? Certainly, of course. Of course I will. It was. What, what is it? It's Parker, the butler, calling from Fernley. Just found Roger Ackroyd. Murdered. <laughs> Dr. Shepard. Where is he, Parker? I beg your pardon, sir. Mr. Ackroyd, don't stand there staring at me. Have you notified the police? The police, I sir. What's the matter with you, Parker? You call me to tell me your master's been murdered. The master murdered? Didn't you telephone me not five minutes ago and tell me Mr. Ackroyd's been found murdered? Me? Oh, no, sir. My English is not of the best, Dr. Shepard, but there seems to be a peculiar misapprehension. Why, Dr. Shepard, I never... I'll give you the exact words I heard just now on the phone. This is Parker, the butler at Fernley speaking. Will you please come at once, sir? Mr. Ackroyd has been murdered. But, Dr. I... Where is Mr. Ackroyd, Parker? Why, he's in the study, If you don't mind waiting down here a moment, Monsieur Poirot, I won't be a minute. This way, sir. But of course, of course. I, uh, I'd rather not intrude on him, sir, if you don't mind. Well, I will, then. Door's locked. Well, Mr. Ackroyd must have locked himself in and possibly just dropped off to sleep, sir. Ackroyd! Ackroyd! Look here, Parker. I don't break this door in, or rather we are. But, Dr. Shepard... I'll take the responsibility. Oh, if you say so, sir. All right, here we go. Let's get now. What? Inspector, head sideways, permitting the dagger to penetrate the jugular. Death was instantaneous. Ah. Has the body been moved? Beyond making certain that life is extinct, I haven't disturbed the body in any way. And you didn't touch the dagger, did you, Doctor? No, Inspector. No, oh, good. Well, we'll want that for fingerprints. Ah, rummy-looking thing, isn't it? Foreign-looking. Moorish silver. Mr. Ackroyd was quite a collector. There are his, his silver cases over against the wall. Eh? Who are you? My name's Raymond. And Mr. Ackroyd's private secretary. That's right, Inspector. He's been with Mr. Ackroyd almost two years now. Oh, very well. Now, uh, <coughs> Doctor, how long should you say he's been dead? Half an hour at least, perhaps longer. And you had to break down the door, eh? What about the window? The uh, English people, they have a mania for the fresh air. The big air is all very well outside where it belongs. Why admit it to the house? Hey, who are you? How did you get in here? You call yourself unfortunate man an inspector of police, and you say to me, who am I? Hercule Poirot, master detective, possessed of the finest brain in Europe, known in every continent, in every land, in every city. Not in my part of the world, you ain't. I never heard of you. How about you, Monsieur Poirot, inspector? It's my house the phone call came, Mr. Ackroyd's death. Oh, 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 well, all right then. You can stay. But this is my case, and don't you forget it. Now then. When was Mr. Ackroyd last seen alive? I don't know, probably by me. And I left, let me see, a little before nine. Mr. Ackroyd was certainly alive at half past nine. I, I heard him in here talking. Who to, Mr. Raymond? I don't know. I just heard his voice. But I know it was 9.30. You didn't hear any of their conversation, did you, Mr. Raymond? I did catch a fragment of it. It did strike me as a trifle odd. Well, remember, please, the words exact. It is very important. I'm not sure that I can. But the words exact. Uh, wait a minute, uh, Mr. Pallard. Who's conducting this case? You or me? Now then, Mr. Raymond, what was these words you heard Mr. Ackroyd say at 9.30? Well, come on. I'd swear under oath the exact words were... The calls on my purse have been so frequent of late that I find it impossible to accede to your request. Thank you, Mr. Raymond, very much. I, uh, I beg pardon, Inspector. Well, what is it, Parker? I just remembered. 
Miss Flora saw Mr. Ackroyd later than 9.30, about quarter of ten. She was just coming out of this room. You mean she was just closing the study door? No, sir. She'd already closed the door when I saw her. Oh, she told me Mr. Ackroyd was not to be disturbed again tonight. Where's Miss Flora? Upstairs in the room. Shall I ask her to come down? No, no. Uh, I'll go up. One moment, if I might be so humble, Monsieur <laughs> Inspector. Could I ask our friend Parker for a little information? Well, well, what is it? Thank you for your so gracious permission, Inspector. Tell me, Parker. Is this room exactly as it was when you entered it with Dr. Shepard? Well, to tell you the truth, sir, I felt myself that this chair here was drawn out a little more. It has been puzzling. The grandfather chair between the door and the window. That's right, sir. That's very curious. No one would want to sit in a chair in such a position. What are you talking about? When a man wants to sit, he sits, don't he? Who pushed it back in place, I wonder? Did you, Parker? No, sir. No, sir. I, I was too upset at seeing the master and all. It... It isn't important, is it, sir? It is completely unimportant. That's why it is so interesting. You're very late for breakfast, James. I was up quite late, Carol. I'm afraid I forgot your natural anxiety to learn details you're not supposed to know. Well, don't worry about me, James. Mr. Poirot was working his cucumbers at daybreak this morning. Six thirty-seven, it was. And I've been with him ever since. Good. Well, perhaps you have some information for me, Caroline. Perhaps I have. Perhaps I have. Or are you going to pretend you know what suddenly occurred to Mr. Poirot in the night? So that he couldn't sleep for an hour or two after he got home? Inasmuch as I haven't seen our friends, he went to bed. Well, I don't feel very much like telling you either. If I didn't know that he'd tell you himself, I don't think I would. Well, he was worrying about the prints of some shoes outside the window. The way the rubber studs were worn down, he says, should mean something to him. But he doesn't know what. Did you explain it to him, Caroline? Hasn't the cook been of any help to you? Or the milkman, or the ladies' aid society, or... Needn't always be facetious, James. Hasn't the bacon needn't always be cold, I dare say, but it is, and so am I. Not cold, but facetious. James, James, do you know what Mr. Poirot said? He said I had the makings of a born detective in me. He particularly admires my wonderful instinct into human nature. And he told me a lot about the little gray cells of the brain. He says his are of the first quality. It's slightly above that, in fact. I'm sure they are. He thinks you're very intelligent, too. Ah, uh, good morning, good shepherd. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Poirot. A beautiful morning, is it not? See, how is this for a cucumber? Beautiful, now, my friend, it is yours. I give it to you. All together, my good shepherd, I have a wonderful morning. Everywhere I learn things new and wonderful things. And all the time the gray cells of Hercule Poirot, they are working, working. Miss Caroline, she tells me so much about this Ray Payton. This morning I go to the hotel. It's what you call it. The uh, uh, Thank you, Miss Caroline. And I think I will talk myself to Ray Payton. And they tell me at the uh, Dog and Whistle... Uh, that was here last night. Another gentleman asking for Mr. Phaeton. Why, James, I certainly well, think you, you might must have to... No, Caroline, I thought someone ought to inform Ray of his uncle's death. I... The least one could do, since no one but myself, the members of your intelligence service, knew that he was in King's Abbot at all. Matter of fact, Ray Payton left the door and was at 9 o'clock last night never came back. Well, what on earth do you think happened to him? Ray Payton has a right to come and go as he pleases. He might have gone anywhere. He might have even have gone back to London. Leaving his luggage behind? I wonder. Oh, by the way, my good shepherd, the telephone call. Oh, you mean the one that came while you were at the house of Mr. That Pilar. is the one. Tell me, do you think it is possible that someone could have telephoned you and imitated Parker's voice sufficiently to deceive you? Well, he said it was Parker. James really doesn't know Parker's voice well enough. Yeah, of course, of course. But the telephone call was traced this morning by my friend Inspector Hempstead. It didn't come from Fanny Hall at all. It was put through to you at 9.50 last night from a public call office at King's Abbott Station and at 23 the night mail is for Liverpool. It is the inspector's opinion that the murderer may have left King's Abbott on that very train. Ah, then you do believe that Rafe Payton? I believe nothing, mademoiselle, until it is proved. Well, then, what do you think? I think, Miss Caroline, that uh, Roger Ackroyd was murdered. Outside of that, I think that I will have to think a good deal more. Oh, it's an outrage. That's what it is. A little man, not even an Englishman. A 
foreigner with moustaches comes into this home, a British home, a house of mourning, unsolicited, unwelcome. Oh, Mother, do be quiet. No, I will not. He comes in here, into my own brother-in-law's house, questions us like a lot of criminals, besmirches our kiss oh, and kin. Mrs. Ackroyd. Mr. Poirot, you must excuse my mother. My uncle's death was a terrible shock. I understand, mademoiselle. It is very little that Hercule Poirot does not understand. Honestly, no, Mr. Poirot, you're on the wrong track. Great Peyton has nothing to do with this crime. The mere fact that he was hard-pressed for money... Was he hard-pressed for money, Mr. Oh, Mr. Raymond. Raymond, now you made it seem as though... Miss Ackroyd, I'm merely telling the truth. Yes. He was hard pressed. He was always applying to his stepfather for money. But Mr. please, Poirot, the madam was had he done so of late, Mr. Raymond, during the last week, for example. Mr. Ackroyd didn't mention such a fact to me. Of course, Mr. Payton will never again have to apply to anyone for money. You mean that uh, Mr. Ackroyd's will? Exactly. After paying certain legacies and bequeaths, servants, charities, and so on. Ah, including yourself, uh, Mr. Raymond. Mr. Ackroyd was good enough to remember me to the extent of 1,000 pounds. Mm, it's not surprising. Go on, please. Well, Miss Flora Ackroyd inherits 20,000 pounds outright. The residue, including this property and an outstanding control in the business, goes to rape Payton. Uh, you have been familiar with this will for some time past, Mr. Raymond. Roger Ackroyd's confidential secretary. Uh, of course, of course. Um, and Mr. Ackroyd possessed a very large fortune indeed, had he not? Fortune that would have been regarded as large even in less tax-ridden times. Then the immediate inheritance of such a large sum would have eased very considerably the present difficulties of Mr. Ray Payton. Mr. Poirot, you don't... Is think that so, Mr. Raymond? Yes, that is so. You awful little man, talking that way, when you know how Flora feels about Ralph Patton. The idea that you suspect him of killing his father. Him no more than any other, madame. You know what I think? I think Roger's death was an accident. Roger was so fond of handling curios. His hand must have slipped or something. He was really a very strange man. Would you believe it? He never gave Flora and me an allowance. His own family. And of course, we didn't have a penny of our own. Why, at this very if moment... If you give me ready money, Mrs. Ackroyd, Mr. Ackroyd cashed a check for a hundred pounds yesterday for wages and other expenses due today. The money was never spent. And where, if you please, is this money? He always kept his cash in his bedroom. I suggest that we see if the money is there. Why, Mr. Poirot, surely... Am I to understand, you miserable little foreigner, that you're intimating that I lie? merely intimate, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, we see if the money is still there. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there are here only 60 pounds. Oh, that's impossible. Let me see. 10, 20, the... The man's right. It is 60. I, this is terrible. Dr. Shepard, Mr. Polo, I hope nobody believes me. One must believe there are 60 pounds where they were hundred. However, I'm sure no one would suggest that you, Mr. Raymond, or you, Mrs. Ackroyd, who alone knew of the money... Mr. Poirot, I forget. Just one moment. Go I took the money. I'm a thief. I'm a common, vulgar little thief. Now you know. I'm glad that it's come out. I am glad also, Miss Flora. You are? Yes, because now we comprehend why Parker thought he saw you coming out of your uncle's room at a quarter of ten. But he did see her coming out of the door. He said so. No, that's just what he did not see. He saw Miss Flora outside the door with her hand on the handle. He did not see Miss Flora come out of the study for a good reason. Miss Flora was never in the study. But where else could she have been? Perhaps on the stairs. Well, those stairs only lead to Mr. Ackroyd's bedroom. Precisely. Then you knew I took the 40 pounds? I knew nothing, but I suspected much. As even now, I suspect that this money you have taken, you did not take it for yourself. I took it for myself. You can take what steps you please. I assure you, Miss Ackroyd, no steps will be taken. Only one thing. Why did you not tell me sooner? Me, Hercule Poirot, who in the end will know everything. Why do not all of you tell me the truth? Just because Flora made a little mistake. That's no Silence, to... silence, madam. Ladies and gentlemen, I am amazed. I, my powers might not be what they were. In all probability, this is the last case I shall ever investigate. But Hercule Poirot does not end with a failure. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, I mean to know, and I shall know in spite of you all. How do you mean, in spite of us all? But just that, monsieur. Every one of you in this room is concealing something from me. It may be something trivial, which is supposed to have no bearing on the case. 
Each one of you has something to hide. I appeal to you. Tell me the truth now. The old truth. Miss Laura. My good shepherd, Mrs. Ackroyd, Parker, Mr. Raymond. Will no one speak? There. It is a pity. You are listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Murder of Roger Ackroyd with Edna May Oliver. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment, we shall resume our presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Meantime, I'd like to call your attention to this interesting fact. Authorities tell us the young people of today are healthier than the youth of any previous generation. And they say that a big contributing cause is the broader use of the right kind of foods. Take soup, for example. Women have always realized the value of good soup in the weekly diet. But it took a long time to make it. Then came Campbell soups. And women, one after another, tried them. They compared them for wholesomeness and nourishment with their own homemade soups. They saw how much their families enjoyed the fine flavor of these soups of Campbell's. And because women no longer had to find time to make it, soup began to come to the table more and more frequently. Today, soup figures more importantly than ever before in the preparation of sensible, nourishing family meals. And now Orson Welles continues our presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd with Edna May Oliver. I am a village surgeon, and Hercule Poirot is a distinguished Belgian detective, so it was scarcely for me to tell him I thought he was wasting his time. It was certainly not for me to tell him that he was getting on my nerves. Not that I didn't admire his extraordinary cleverness and insight. Poirot's right, for instance, about the dagger. Police investigation confirmed his suspicion that the fingerprints on the handle of the dagger were those of Roger Ackroyd, the murdered man. Though the position of the dagger definitely precluded suicide. It was Poirot who established that it had not been Parker, the butler, who summoned me on the phone that night to what has become a house of death. And again, it was Hercule Poirot who made it indubitably clear that nobody had seen Roger Ackroyd alive after 9.30, at which time Raymond, the secretary, had heard Ackroyd's voice in the study. In spite of all this, it seems to me that Hercule Poirot was making little real progress in solving the mystery of Roger Ackroyd's death. Furthermore, it seemed to me a curious thing for a detective of his self-proclaimed standing to be spending so much of his precious time in idle chatter with my sister, Caroline. I had a very interesting chat with Mr. Poirot, James. He thinks me uh, very intelligent. So you've told me. Is it just a coincidence, Caroline, that on those occasional mornings when the bacon is both warm and crisp, it should be so far away from me that I can't reach it? Too much bacon isn't good for you. No such thing as too much bacon. Now I'll be the judge of what's good for me. I rather fancy that at least is something I know best, Caroline. Hmm. You know so many things, James. You're so self-complacent. That's why it's difficult to talk to you. That's why you get the idea that I, that people, are trying to pump you. Some more bacon, please. Poirot says I, uh, I've met an excellent detective. Did he? Mm. We had a very interesting chat. I wonder if Monsieur Poirot found it interesting. He said I was more valuable than anyone he's met here. He told me a lot about his life, too. About a mad nephew of his. Do you know that Prince Paul in Mauritania, the one who just married the dancer? Well, he I do like... not know her. You do not know her, and I do not care to hear about her or about his mad nephew either. 
Did he ask you any questions, Caroline? No questions. We just chatted and chatted. More bacon, please. I have a little theory of my own, James. Mr. Poirot didn't ask me, but he might have. Whom do you suspect? I don't suspect anybody. I know he's sure to have taken some. As a matter of fact, that's been my theory right along. Roger Ackroyd was poisoned in his food that night. <laughs> Answers. He was stabbed in the neck. You know that as well as I do. After death to make a false clue. I examined the body and I know what I'm talking about. That wound wasn't inflicted after death. It was the cause of death. And don't look so omniscient. Next you'll be telling me you know more about medicine than I do. Perhaps you think you could take over my practice. Oh, don't be ridiculous. You know I haven't a license. <laughs> That afternoon, Caroline had a mahjong party made up of her little group of village gossipers, in whose opinion, I now learned, Ray Payton was mysteriously concealed somewhere in Cranchester, the only big town in the nearest. Of course, that was true. Uh, Miss Gannett's maid, it seems, had contributed the additional information that while taking a walk that afternoon on Cranchester Road, she'd seen Monsieur Poirot in a large black car coming from that direction. After that, I was not surprised to learn that Monsieur Poirot had been invited to my house for dinner. Caroline believes, whenever possible, in getting her information directly from headquarters. A little more raspberry shape, Mr. Poirot. <laughs> Under no circumstances, I am already a man of a uh, corpulence so great. It would hardly become me if I, uh, well, if I, yes, yes, there is no harm in a little raspberry shape. There you are, Mr. Poirot. I beg your pardon, Caroline, if I might have my first helping. Oh, I'll sort with Dr. James. There you are. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Poirot, sir, what do you think about Rafe Payton now? What I think would scarcely be regarded as legal evidence in the courtroom, mademoiselle. Dear, 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 man. You, you are incredulous, mademoiselle Chevron. I am incredulous. You have a theory, Paul. I don't have a theory. I know. Oh, Caroline. James, don't meddle about in what you don't understand. There are several points to this case. Yes, mademoiselle. Point number one. Mr. Ackroyd was heard talking to someone after after half past nine. Point number two. At some time during the evening, Rafe Payton must have come in through the window as evidenced by the prints of his shoes. Point number three. Mr. Ackroyd was nervous that evening and could have only admitted someone he knew. Point number four. The person with Ackroyd at 9.30 was asking for money. We know Rafe Payton was in a scrape. Admirable. Oh, and one other thing, Mr. Mr. Poirot. I found out something for you today. The boots Rafe Payton was wearing that night, they were not brown. They were black. Ah, you have found that out for me. Thank you, thank you. You are sure, mademoiselle, they were brown or black? Positive. Too bad. Too bad if they were only black, those boots. I mean, if, if they were. You, you mean... Yes, I understand. Rafe Payton is guilty or innocent according to whether his boots are brown or black. Really, Mr. Poirot? It could easily be. For murder, there was with Mr. Payton so many motives. First motive, blackmail. Rafe Payton may have been the man who blackmailed Mr. Sutter. Reason, his general money needs. The second motive, the certainty of a great inheritance through Mr. Eckroyd's death. And the third motive, Caroline? Very simple, very simple. Mr. Ackroyd's violent disapproval of Rafe's proposed marriage to Miss Flora. Well, after listening to you, Caroline, I'd say the case looks very black against him. I haven't a case, James. I know. Late that afternoon, Monsieur Poirot called on me to ask if I could arrange a little conference room at his home that night. Those would be present... Mrs. Ackroyd, Flora, Raymond, and Parker. I think Caroline, who was present when he called, would have given ten years of her life to have been added to the list. For my part, I would have been only too glad to yield her my place among those who in that particular evening gathered around the beaming countenance of the Belgian detective and cucumber breeder. <coughs> yeah, I'm clearing my throat. That is an accepted signal in this country that a meeting is about to begin. Quiet, everybody. I'll read the list. 
You, you will please answer to your names. Uh, Raymond. Yes. Uh, Parker. Yes, sir. Mrs. Eckroyd. Yes, but I want to speak to you. Yes, little. will be sufficient. Miss uh, Flora. Yes. Mr. Flora, what's the meaning of all this? The list I have just read is the list of suspected persons. Every one of you present had the opportunity to kill Mr. Eckroyd. I won't stand for this. I'm going. You will not go, madame. Until you have heard what I have to say, I clear my throat again. <clears throat> And now I commence at the beginning. <clears throat> Until now, ladies and gentlemen, we have all been trying to answer to ourselves one principal question. Who was in the room with Mr. Aykroyd at 9.30? Not Dr. Shepard, since I myself can prove that he was at home. Not Miss Flora, nor Mrs. Aykroyd, nor Mr. Raymond, with whose actions on that evening we are well acquainted. Nor Parker, who has furnished me with a satisfactory alibi. Who then? This is the part of Hercule Poirot, the cleverest, the most audacious question. Was anyone with him? Are you trying to make me out a liar, Mr. Poirot? I tell you, I distinctly heard voices. I distinctly heard the words that Mr. Ackroyd was speaking. Mr. Raymond, the words that Mr. Ackroyd said. The calls on my purse have been so frequent of late that I believe it is impossible for me to accede to your request. Ah, does nothing strike you as odd about him? The style, for example. No, he frequently dictated letters to me using exactly the same style. That is precisely what I seek to arrive at. Would any man use such a phrase in talking to another, huh? Ah, you think not. My friends, you have all forgotten one thing. This stranger who called at the house in the proceeding weekend, the firm he represented. You remember, Mr. Raymond? Dictaphone company. A dictaphone? That's what you think. Mr. Aykroyd had promised to invest in a dictaphone, you remember. Me, I had the curiosity to inquire of the company in question their reply, Mr. Raymond, was that Mr. Aykroyd did purchase a dictaphone from their representative. Why he concealed the matter from you, his confidential secretary, I do not know. Must have meant to surprise me with it. It's quite a childish love of surprising people. Oh, there's only one man who could have done it. You mean my face? Mother. Oh, let's face it. If he's innocent, he should be able to prove it. If he isn't... If only he'd come forward. That is your advice, Mr. Raymond. That he should come forward. Certainly. Do you know where he is? Me? I know everything. Remember that. The truth of the telephone call of the footprints on the window sill of the hiding place of Ray Payton. Where is he? Not very far away. Where? In Cranchester. Where? No. He is not in Cranchester. He is here, in the doorway of this room. Really? Please, please follow, my darling. Have I not told you all at least 36 times that it was useless to conceal things from Hercule Poirot? That always I discover the little secret. It is my business. From Dr. Shepard's sister Caroline, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I learned that uh, the doctor and Dory Payton, they are old friends. Dr. Shepard knows that things look very black against his friend Payton. He tells him the old story. Yes, he did. He explained to me how suspicion was bound to fall on me, and I had no real alibi. And with the best of intentions, people sometimes make errors. That's why Dr. Shepard consented to do what he could to help Mr. Payton. He was successful in hiding him from the police. Where? Yeah. In his own house? Uh, no, indeed, Mr. Raymond. You should ask yourself the question that I, Hercule Poirot, did. If the good doctor is concealing the young man, what place would he choose? It must necessarily be somewhere near at hand. I think of Cranchester, a hotel. No, lodgings, even more impractically. No, where then? Ha <laughs> ha. I have it. A nursing home. I make inquiries. Yes, at one of them, a patient was brought there by the doctor himself early on Saturday morning. That patient, I had no difficulty in identifying him as right. He arrived at my house yesterday, and now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the point of this evening's meeting. Ray Payton says he is innocent of the killing of Roger Ackroyd. Oh, I am. I, I swear by heaven please, I am. Please, Mr. Payton, please. You have just heard Mr. Payton declare he is innocent. Yet he has three motives for the murder and no alibi. Well, I certainly don't see how you can sit there. I am possessing the floor, Mrs. Ackroyd. Listen carefully, everybody. 
To save Mr. Payton, the real criminal must confess. I will speak to you. Hercule Poirot. I know that the murder of Mr. Ackroyd is in this room now, at this table. Tonight! Tomorrow in the morning, the truth goes to the police. You mean you know who... Yes. At the moment, I know. I alone. For the murder of Roger Ackroyd, there is only one way out. And that way does not lead to freedom. And it is to the murder or not that I speak. This is a matter of life and death. And I, Hercule Poirot, am not joking. Good night. What are you doing out there in the hall? Today, am I overcoat, my dear? Well, aren't you coming in to chat? I'm very tired, Caroline. But at least you can tell me what happened last night. Mr. Poirot told us all about his little gray cells again. Oh, does he think Rafe Payton is guilty? No. Well, he's crazy. You can go over and tell him so in the morning. Good night, Caroline. very tired. My arm aches from writing. I've written it all out. Now Peyton will be cleared. As I think back, I'm not quite certain why I urged Ackroyd to read that letter before it was too late. Perhaps I subconsciously realized that with a pig-headed chap like that, I had best chance of getting him not to read it. His nervousness that night was interesting psychologically. He knew danger was close at hand, yet... He never once suspected me as the blackmail of Mrs. Sellers. The dagger was an afterthought. I thought of a very little weapon of my own, but uh, I saw the dagger lying on the silver table. It occurred to me how, how much better it would be to use a weapon that couldn't be traced to me. I suppose I must have meant to murder him all along. As soon as I'd heard of Mrs. Sellers' death, I felt convinced that she'd have told him everything before she died. So I went home and took my precautions. The dictaphone he had given me two days before to adjust. Something gone a little wrong with it, and I persuaded Ackroyd I didn't have a go at it instead of sending it back. I did what I wanted to it, took it up with me in my bag, study that evening. When it was all over, I looked around the room for the door. Quite satisfied, nothing had been left undone. The dictaphone was on the table by the window, time to go off at 9.30. The mechanism of that little device was rather clever, based on the principal alarm clock, and the armchair was pulled out so as to hide it from the door. I never dreamed that Parker would notice that Notice that chair. Certainly would not have remembered Poirot hadn't asked him. Having the American sailor with a toothache call me from King's Abbot that night was a stroke of genius. There's no way for anyone listening to have told that it was not Parker. <laughs> Still don't know how Poirot sat that one out. My only regret is about Caroline, and yet I feel I can trust Poirot. She'll never know the truth, and I'm glad of that. I shouldn't like her to know she's fond of me, and then too she's proud. I guess it would be a grief to her, but grief passes. When I finished writing, I shall enclose this whole manuscript in an envelope, address it to Poirot. And now, because I'm tired, take some sleeping powders. Because I'm very tired, I will take more sleeping powders than I should. More than anybody should. I suppose I ought to feel sorry. I am sorry. Sorry that Hercule Poirot ever came to King's Abbot to grow his cucumbers. concludes our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the murder of Roger Ackroyd. In just a moment, Orson Welles will return to the microphone with our guest of the evening, Edna May Oliver. Meanwhile, I'd like to take just time enough to say this to every woman listening. We at Campbell's know good cooking, and so, of course, do you. Speaking, therefore, as one good cook to another, 
we'd like you to try our chicken soup. Try it, if you will, in the same friendly yet critical way you'd sample a neighbor's good dish or send in one of your own for her to try. And if you'll do that, I know you'll find this soup deep and full and rich in chicken flavor from the first spoonful to the last delicious drop. Indeed, I promise you, just as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. And now, here is Orson Welles with Edna Mayala. Uh, never mind, uh, Orson Welles. What about me, F.Q. Poirot? Miss Olive, uh, have I not the little gray cells? <laughs> you and your gray cells. If you ask me, I think Rafe Peyton committed the murder. After listening to my explanation so careful? Especially after listening to your exclamation so careful. Now, in the days when I was a detective... Scotland Yard? No, RKO. You and your one little murder. Why, when I was a detective, no, no sooner did I establish the identity of the murderer than he was murdered. And I had to start all over again. It is well for you, Miss Oliver, to be literally genius of Hercule Poirot. But remember this. Hercule Poirot always laughs last. Attend. I laugh last. Ha, ha, ha. I accept that as a laugh. Go on. I have observed the proceedings here in the studio, and I have detected a circumstance which has indubitably escaped you are untrained to watch for such things. Almost it had escaped me myself. Not only did I discover that the gentleman who told the story, Dr. Shepard, was himself the murderer of Roger Ackroyd, but I now reveal to you that he was enacted in Mr. Wells' little anecdote by none other than that beloved portrayer of dramatic roles, that celebrated delineator of character, that unparalleled purveyor of protean portraiture, that internationally celebrated... You refer to Orson Welles, I take it, Mr. Welles? I do. <sighs> now I would like to be allowed a little observation of my own. Excuse me, Moreau. Avez-vous la blume de matin? What? I'm not finished yet. Où est le chapeau de ma mère? That's all right, Mr. Poirot. I just wanted to see if you could really speak French. Attend, Mr. Poirot. I laugh last. <laughs> Good night, Edna May Oliver. And may I say I hope that this will not be the last time that you will put me in my place in this program. <laughs> In tonight's Campbell Playhouse production of The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, the role of Caroline Shepard was played by Edna May Oliver. The part of Roger Ackroyd was played by Alan Napier, Mrs. Ackroyd by Brenda Forbes, and Flora Ackroyd by Mary Taylor. George Colouris was heard as Inspector Hempstead, Ray Collins as Mr. Raymond, and Everett Sloan as Parker the butler. Dr. James Shepard, who committed the murder, was played by Orson Welles and Hercule Poirot, who arrested Dr. Shepard, was played by Orson Welles. The music for tonight's production, with the exception of an old coward melodies, was composed and, of course, conducted by Bernard Herman. And now, Mr. Wells, I see we have just a moment. Can we have a word about next week's story? Next week, ladies and gentlemen, it will be our proud pleasure to give you The Garden of Allah, starring Claudette Colbert. For Robert Hitchens' masterpiece, both as a book and a play, has engaged the affections of the peoples of the world for 35 years with its ageless story of a great love and a greater renunciation. If Miss Colbert is listening in, I want her to know how eagerly we're all looking forward to the privilege of having her with us in the Campbell Playhouse. No other actress that I know is more ideally suited than Miss Colbert for the part of Domini the English girl who found in the great Sahara Desert the love that gave the final meaning to her life. And so until then, till next Sunday in Claudette Colbert in the Garden of Allah, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us here in the Campbell Playhouse remain obedient to yours. <laughs> Make
makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we bring you The Garden of Allah with Claudette Colbert as our guest star. Meanwhile, if you've enjoyed tonight's Campbell Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's chicken soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. of Campbell Soups presents The Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Tonight we take you to Shangri-La in the Valley of the Blue Moon. You may not believe this story, but ladies and gentlemen, remember please that ever since the human race was articulate, men have returned with tales of such a place as Shangri-La. Usually they've been laughed at. Always they've been doubted, but it's never yet been proved that their stories were untrue. And so tonight we bring you James Hilton's Lost Horizon and as our guest of the evening, Miss Sigrid Gurry. But before our story begins, before we move on into the future, as embodied in the earthly paradise of Shangri-La, Ernest Chappell invited us to hark back for just a moment to an occasion or two, and here he is. An occasion or two, ladies and gentlemen, when dinner and the choice of a main dinner dish were especially important. Perhaps it was a birthday celebration or a wedding anniversary, and you were eating out. Together, you consulted the menu, looked up, and... Well, dear, this is your occasion. What looks good to you? Um, let's have chicken, shall we? Mm, that sounds good to me. Oh, here's our waiter now. And then when important company was coming to dinner at your house... But what shall we have for dinner, darling? I say let's have chicken. That's something everybody likes. Let's have chicken. Haven't you said those very words yourself many and many a time when you wanted to enjoy or to serve an especially fine dinner? I'll wager you have, because there's no disputing the fact that just about all of us do have an exceptional liking for chicken in one form or another. And I think it must be this general liking for chicken that accounts for the constantly growing popularity of Campbell's chicken soup. Every golden drop of this chicken soup brims with rich chicken flavor. Steeped in the taste of chicken, too, is the fluffy white rice Campbell's measure into this homey, old-fashioned chicken soup. And you'll enjoy pieces of tender chicken meat in every fragrant plateful. Have it soon, won't you? Perhaps tomorrow. I promise you, just as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. And now, Orson Welles in James Hilton's Lost Horizon with Secret Gourie. I say, Sanders, did you ever know a chap named Conway? You mean Glory Conway? Oh, yes, of course I do. Remember him very well. Wonderful fellow. He was. Our civilization doesn't breed people like that nowadays. Remember the uprising at Basco? Some of the fall last. Yes, I remember. They sent Conway up there, you know, to take over. That's right. And there was a wild yarn going about, wasn't there? But one of the planes that went out never came back. Yes, the plane did disappear. There were four people in it. Conway and three others. I can only tell you the story as he told it to me. I don't ask you to believe it. I wouldn't believe it myself, except for one small fact. There were four of them in that plane. There was Conway. There was Melanson, his assistant, just a youngster, but he'd come to be quite fond of him during the six months they'd worked together at Bath School. And two others he didn't know. Miss Brinklow, a missionary, and an American named Barnard. Conway said he was dog-tired. All he wanted to do was sleep. As a matter of fact, they were hardly off the ground, he said, before he was dozing off. And he doesn't know exactly, but he thinks he must have slept for several hours. Conway! 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 Conway
Conway! Conway! Conway, look, there's a break, break in the cloud. Conway! Conway, where are we? I don't know, Mallon. Hey, what is it? Something wrong? I think we're way off our route, Mr. Barnett. Off our route? We're being kidnapped. Kidnapped? Hey. I've been thinking for some time, Mr. Conway, that something was wrong. Well, I'll be darned. What's he doing it for? Where's he taking us? Yes, there aren't any tribes being around here. We're far past the frontier country by now. Oh, we'll be in Tibet by morning. If the gas holds out. Why, nobody but a lunatic would fly into this sort of country. Yeah, nobody but a darn fine airman could. What's wrong? What's happening? Moses are icing up. That's the land. How the fellow can see the land in pitch blackness, I don't know. Well, at any rate, I'm glad it's over. Conway, he's going to crack up. Well, here we go. <laughs> Rotten landing, rotten. Oh. Cracked up his left wing. Well, we're at the stable we are now. That's sudden. Come on, Conway. I'm going forward. Melanson. I'm not scared of this fellow on land, wherever he is. I'm going to tackle him right away. Go after him from the outside. Oh, oh, my dear. That's all about. Looks like the end of the world. Better stop him, Conway, before he does something foolish. Yes. Melanson. Melanson, come back. Melanson. Is it Conway? It's queer. I think the pilot's dead. He's all doubled up over his panel. All right, come on. Let's get him out of the cockpit in the open. That's right. Oh, lay him down here. Well, what's happened now? Let's have a look at him. Strike a match, will you, somebody? Here, here. No, no use in this wind. Mm, his heart's very faint. Say, this isn't our pilot. He's Chinese. <laughs> Be quiet, Melanson. Well, I can't help it. We look such fools standing about striking matches over a corpse. He isn't much of a beauty, is he? Look, well, he's coming too. I hate you so sorry. My sight. Can you understand him, Conway? Shh. How are you? Shangri La. Well, what's the matter, Conway? He's dead. Could you understand anything he said? Very little. That we're in Tibet, which is obvious. And I gather there's a place near here, along the valley. Some sort of monastery, it sounds like. We can get food and shelter there. He kept saying we must go there. He said his name. It was Shangri-La. I shall never forget Conway's vivid description of that lonely place. It was like a vast emptiness, he said, with mountains on every side. Mountains rising on top of mountains. There was a range of them gleaming on the far horizon like a row of dog teeth. But it was the wind, I think, that impressed him most. Not an ordinary wind. Not even a strong wind or a cold wind. A sort of frenzy that lived all around us. That's how I spoke of it. And all through the night, he watched. At dawn, the wind dropped. And in the lessening gloom, the valley took shape. The floor of rock and shingle sloping upwards. And then, suddenly in the distance, he saw climbing down the steep incline of the mountain, coming towards him, a party of men. Tibetans, they looked like. There were a dozen or more carrying with them a hooded chair. In this sat a figure, an elderly Chinese, gray-haired, clean-shaven, robed in an embroidered gown of rich blue silk. My name is Xiong. We have with us food and wine, if you will honor me by accepting our slight hospitality. After that, we can start at our journey is long and somewhat difficult. Well, if we could uh, borrow a couple of your men for guides and uh, some stores, I think we can get along all right by ourselves. I'm afraid that would be quite impossible. I regret that it will be necessary for you to return with me to the lamissary. The lamissary? Yes. I shall try to arrange for guides for you there. I'm sorry we must intrude on your hospitality this way. We are always delighted to receive guests from the outside. Well, we, uh, we won't be there long, I promise you that. And we'll pay for everything we, ha we have. We'll pay for our journey, journey and our guides back. We want to return to civilization as soon as possible. My dear sir, are you so very certain that you are away from it?
From the plateau to the Lamasery, it took them ten hours. It was bitterly cold. At one time, they were forced to rope themselves together. Conway seemed very pleased that here, at least, he was of some use. He'd done a lot of mountain climbing in the Swiss Alps and knew all the tricks. And then, very late in the afternoon, without warning, Conway said, they stepped out onto level ground. Out of that mist and cold into clear, sunny air. Far below them, under the setting sun, is the Lamasery. A group of colored pavilions cling to the mountainside with the chance delicacy of flower petals impaled upon a crag. That's how he described it. And beyond that, in a dazzling pyramid, shimmering against the deep electric blue of the evening sky, was the most beautiful mountain on earth. It was so radiant, so serenely poised, that for a moment he wondered if it was real at all. There's our valley. And there is our lamasery. It is called Shangri-La. Triple dinner has pleased you, Mr. Barnard. Well, I've been around a lot, Mr. Chang, but I've never tasted food like this. I've never seen anything like this place. Bathtubs from Akron, Ohio, steam heating. Lord, what haven't you got? You see, here at Shangri-La, we are less barbarian than you expected. We have a rather complete library for our monastery. A certain of our art treasures. Mm, that girl up there playing. I've never heard 17th century music played so well. She's charming. Who is she? Her name is Lutzen. She has much skill with Western keyboard music. Why, the girl looks hardly more than a child. How old is she? I am afraid I cannot tell you. <laughs> Not giving away secrets about a lady's age, is that it? <laughs> Precisely. Yes, yes, well, that's all very interesting. Uh, but it's uh, time we began to discuss plans getting away, Mr. Chang. I, I am sorry. I'm very, very sorry. Well, surely you uh, you can do something. You have maps, I suppose. Oh, yes, yes. A great well, many. Well, all right. I, I suppose you must have some communication with the outside world. How far is it to the nearest telegraph lines? Well, where do you send... Where do you send to when you want anything civilized? It is quite true, Mr. Mallison, that from time to time we do require certain things from distant parts. And there is such a consignment expected shortly. Perhaps when the port has arrived... When do they arrive? The exact date is, of course, impossible to forecast. Oh, all right. All right, Lamar. Well, I'll say no more, then. Not tonight. But in the morning, I warn you that in the morning, I intend leaving. Good night. I'm sorry my friend is so upset tonight. I, too, am sorry. You will, none of you, I am sure, regret your sojourn with us in our little valley in the shadow of Caracal. Caracal. Is that the name of that mountain we saw? Yes. It is beautiful, is it not? And very tall. Over 28,000 feet. Caracal. In the valley tongue, Mr. Conway, Caracal means blue moon. Blue moon. Stop, Mr. Conway. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I didn't hear you come in, Lord Sandy. You play very well. Oh, no, not really. I, I lead a pretty busy life, and I don't get near a piano very often. Please go on playing. If you don't, I shall have to go away. Oh, but why? It is not usual in the beginning that we talk with the guests. But uh, it's not forbidden. No, but but I'm not sure that Jan would approve. There are subjects we do not discuss, Mr. Conway, either with you or amongst ourselves. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Your friend, Mr. Mallinson, is not so polite. He tries to make me talk. Oh, you, you mustn't mind Mallinson. He means all right, but he's rather an excitable young man. I don't think he's very happy here. No, he's not at all happy. It is sometimes very lonely. Oh, well, he's young. That makes a difference. Yes. Yes, it makes a great deal of difference. Conway said that in that place it was difficult to estimate the passage of time. He said it must have been about a fortnight after they got to Jangrila that Jung came to him one day with a message. The message was a summons from the High Lama. Together they went across the empty courtyards, then up a steep spiral staircase, and as they climbed, Conway said he was aware of a strange sensation. A dry, tingling warmth, as if all the windows were tightly closed and some kind of steam heating plant was working at full pressure. Then, finally, they were standing before a door which opened and closed again, and Conway found that he was alone. He said he stood there for a moment, hesitant, breathing an atmosphere that was not only sultry but full of dusk so that it was several seconds before he could accustom himself to the gloom. Then, slowly, he became aware of a small, pale, and wrinkled person, motionlessly shadowed, like some fading antique portrait in the warm dusk. He felt dizzy under the gaze of those ancient eyes. So... You are Mr. Conway. I am. It is a pleasure to see you, Mr. Conway. Please sit down beside me. I am an old man and can do no one any harm. Oh, I feel it a signal honor to be received by you. Thank you, my dear Conway. I shall call you that according to the English fashion. Zhang tells me that you have been asking many questions about our community. And it's a fair... I'm certainly interested in them. Then if you can spare me a little time, I shall be pleased to give you a brief account of our foundation. Tell me, my dear Conway, are you familiar with the general outline of Tibetan history? I found in your excellent library some interesting annals of these regions. But curiously enough, nothing of the history of Shangri-La. There is a reason for that, as you will see. And in all the maps of this area... Both ancient and modern, there is no mention of Caracal or the Valley of the Blue Moon. That, too, is for a reason you will soon understand. The ancient history of Shangri-La is the history of a Catholic priest named Father Perrault. Before devoting himself to Far Eastern missions... Perrault had studied at Paris, Bologna, and other universities. He was something of a scholar. But he was not an ascetic. He enjoyed the good things of the world and was careful to teach his converts cooking as well as catechism. In the year 1719, Perrault set out from Pekin with three other Capuchin friars. They traveled southwest for many months by Langchao and the Coconor, facing terrible hardships. The 
three others died on the way, and Father Perrault was not far from death. When, by accident, he stumbled into the rocky defile that remains today the only practical approach to the valley of the blue moon. Perrault began to preach here in the year 1734, when he was 53 years of age. His was a full life, and he had accomplished much when in the year 1789 news descended to the valley that Perrault was dying at last. He lay in this room, my dear Conway, where he could see from the windows the white blur that was all his failing eyesight gave him of Caracal. But he could see with his mind also. His mind had straightened to a snow-white calm. He was ready, willing, and glad to die. He gathered his friends and servants round him and bade them all farewell. Then he asked to be left alone a while. And it was during such a solitude, with his body sinking and his mind lifted to beatitude, that he had hoped to give up his soul. But it did not happen so. He lay for many weeks without speech or movement. And then, my dear Conway, he began to recover. He was then a hundred and eight. When the last of the old monks died in 1794, Pero himself was still living. He was then 113 years of age. You will wish to know how he spent his time during those unprecedented years. You see, Father Pero's attitude may be summed up by saying that as he had not died at a normal age, he began to feel that there was no discoverable reason why he either should or should not do so at any definite time in the future. Having already proved himself abnormal, it was as easy to believe that the abnormality might continue as to expect it to end at any moment. I think I understand, Father. Can you indeed? And can you understand anything else after this long and curious story of mine? It seems impossible. Yet I can't help thinking of it. It's astonishing and extraordinary and quite incredible. And yet, not absolutely beyond my powers of belief. What is, my son? That you are still alive, Father Perrault. Listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Lost Horizon with Sigrid Gurry. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chapel, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment, we shall resume our presentation of James Hilton's Lost Horizon. And in that moment, I'd like to take you back across the high plateau of Tibet, back from this strange corner of the world to the familiar surroundings of your own home, in order to remind you that more soup is eaten in December than in any other month of the year. There are a number of good reasons why December is the top soup-eating month, but of them all, I think these two are most important. First, December ushers in winter. And most mothers realize that good hot soup in the winter diet not only nourishes and warms us pleasantly, but served frequently can help fortify us. Second, December is of all months the month of entertaining, of open house when relatives and friends drop in and gather at the table. And wise hostesses have learned that no dish can more quickly or more successfully transform even a simple meal, give it a festive holiday touch, than a well-chosen soup. Will soup be on your table frequently this month? And will you let Campbell's make this soup for you as millions will? 
I know that whatever Campbell soups you may select, you'll be delighted to find the same full-flavored, nourishing soup that you would strive for in your own kitchen. And now Orson Welles resumes our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Lost Horizon with Secret Gurry. Another whiskey, Sanders? Hey. Say when. Well, that'll do. Oh, it's getting awfully late. Never mind. Please go on. About Conway. Yes, it is quite a story, isn't it? You see, from the time Conway got to that monastery place till the night when he told me about it, nearly a year had passed. And heaven only knows what he'd been through. But the way he told his story, and the way he described it all, it was as though he were living it all over again. Every minute. Every detail of it. I remember the tone of his voice as he spoke of the High Lama. I remember the silence, exactly as he described it. The silence between him and that ancient figure in that airless, half-lit room. It may have lasted but a second, though it seemed an hour, an eternity, that he sat there staring at the ancient face of the High Lama. It was disembodied. It seemed to glow out of that yellow dusk like a fragment of an old parchment. In the course of those next years, a few rare strangers found their way to the valley and were welcomed. A Chinese merchant found his way here in 1822. A Greek trader in 1830 and in 1845, a French musician, a pupil of Chopin's. Later, an Englishman, two Russians and a German. And night and day, sentries kept constant watch on the entrance to the defile. And more than one party of explorers, glorying in their first distant glimpse of Caracal, encountered messengers bearing a cordial invitation, one that was rarely declined. Just as we were greeted and welcomed? Yes, my dear Conway. Of course, our invitation is subject to one very important and invariable proviso. And that is? You intend to keep us here? That, I take it, is the important and invariable proviso. You have guessed correctly, my son. In other words, we are to stay at Shangri-La forever? I should greatly prefer to employ your excellent English idiom and say that we are all here for good. (laughs) For good. What puzzles me is... Why, out of all the rest of the world's inhabitants, we four should have been chosen? In recent years, our number has been shrinking. Even in Shangri-La, we are mortals. And a serious problem was beginning to arise. You mean that pilot was sent out deliberately to bring someone back by air? My son, you are still, I should say, a youngish man by the world's standards. Your life, as people say lies ahead of you. Yes, in the normal course, you might expect only 20 or 30 years of gradually diminishing activity. Youth and old age between those two clouds. What small and narrow sunlight illumines a man's lifetime. But you, it may be, are destined to be more fortunate Since, by the standards of Shangri-La, your sunlit years have scarcely yet begun. You will have time. Time, that rare and lovely gift that your western countries have lost the more they have pursued it. You make no comment, my dear Conway. I've been deeply impressed, Father Perot, by the things you've told me. I still don't entirely comprehend their significance. Here in Shangri-La, my son, we have a dream and a vision. It is a vision that first appeared to me when I lay dying in this room in the year 1789. I looked back then on my long life, as I have already told you, and it seemed to me that all the loveliest things were transient and perishable. 
and that war, lust, and brutality might someday crush them until there were no more left in the world. I saw the nation strengthening, not in wisdom, but in vulgar passions and the will to destroy. And I perceived that when they had filled the land and sea with ruin, they would take to the air. I foresaw a time when men, exultant in the technique of homicide, would rage so hotly over the world that every precious thing would be in danger. Every book and picture and harmony, every treasure garnered through two millenniums, the small... The delicate, the defenseless, all would be lost like the lost books of Livy or wrecked as the English wrecked the summer palace in Peking. I share your opinion of that. And that, my son, is why I am here and why you are here and why we may pray to outlive the doom that gathers around us on every side. You think that when that time comes that Shangri-La will escape? Perhaps. We may expect no mercy, but we may faintly hope for neglect. Here we shall stay with our books and our music and our meditation, conserving the frail elegances of a dying age and seeking such wisdom as men will need when their passions are all spent. We have a heritage to cherish and bequeath, let us take what pleasure we may until that time comes. Yes. And then? Then, my son, when the strong have devoured each other, the Christian ethic may at last be fulfilled, and the meek shall inherit the earth. I believe there's a storm coming up. Somehow I never expected that here. All right, I don't think it'll touch us here in the valley. Sure hate to be out there in that pass, though. That place is murder. Well, well, we've all got to face it sooner or later. All four of us. Those portals be here any day now. I don't imagine we'll have perfect weather all the way to India. No, I don't think we will. That's one of the reasons why I think I'll let this first trip pass. There'll be other porters later. You, you mean, sir, you're not coming with us? That's it. Well, I, I suppose it's... Uh, your own affair, that nobody can prevent you from stopping here for all your life. It's not what everybody would choose to do, but ideas differ. What do you say, Conway? I agree. Ideas differ. As a matter of fact, there's a very practical reason why I think I'll stay on. I don't know whether you people guessed it or not. It was not Barnard. Not Barnard? Never was. I'm Chalmers Bryant. Chalmers Bryant. Oh. Yes. You don't mean that Wall Street fellow? The international swindler? That's me. I had some friends in Woodstock that lost all their heads through you. I'm sorry. Well, you certainly played fast and loose with a lot of other people's money. And why? Because those same people all wanted something for nothing and hadn't the brains to get it for themselves. That's nonsense. I'll tell you another thing, too. There's gold in this valley, tons of it. What's more, I've got permission to prospect it. Maybe I can give them tips on how to increase the output. Maybe even someday I'll have... Uh, a common thief facing a life behind prison bars. No wonder he wants to stay here. Well, I'm not facing a life behind prison bars, Mr. Mallinson. And I think I'll stay on, too. What? You, Miss Brinkler? Yes. I've done a lot of thinking the last few weeks, and my mind's made up. It's quite obvious that I have a call. This place is in urgent need of a mission. I'm strongly opposed to this doctrine of moderation. In my opinion, it's nothing but slackness and laxity. It's plain to me now that I have a lot of work to do here. A lot of work. Thank you, Lord Sam. It was beautiful. Mr. Conway, you have seen the High Lama? Yes. He told you everything? What do you mean? The story of Father Perot, of the Lamas, of me. The High Lama did not mention you, Lord Sam. But he told me a great deal about the history of Shangri-La and the work he's doing. And you found it interesting? More than that. I was thinking just now as you played how much Shangri-La has come to mean to me. How much these hours here in the music room with you... 
have come to mean. Do the others feel like this, too? I'm afraid not. But then, we're all of us different. For each of us, I dare say, Shangri-La holds a special meaning. Except, I think, for Mr. Mallinson. He will never be contented here, Mr. Conway. Never. No, I suppose not. He has no idea, then, of what the Lama has told you. You haven't told him. Naturally not. And you believe? You believe all that you've been told? Well, I see no reason why the High Lama should lie to me. No? No, of course not. Of course not. Have there been many who have tried to escape from Shangri-La? Escape, Mr. Conway. Is that really the word that should be used? After all, the pass is open to anyone at any time. Uh, yes. I can only hope none of your friends would be so rash as to attempt so difficult a journey. Uh, there's Mr. Marison. He's young, of course. Uh, but others, too. Uh, Lutzen, for instance, was young when she first came to us. Was young? Her carriers lost their way in the mountains. She was betrothed to a prince of Turkestan and was traveling to Kashgar to meet him. The whole party would doubtless have perished but for the customary meeting with our emissary. When did this happen? 1884. She was 18. 18? In 1884? Yes. If you will forgive me a personal question, Mr. Conway, is it possible that you are falling in love with Lord Sandy? What makes you ask that? Because if it is so, it would be quite uh, suitable. Always, of course, in moderation. <laughs> Even love, then, fits into your scheme of things. The hospitality of Shangri-La is of a most comprehensive kind, Mr. Conway. Yes, I think I quite realize that by now. Uh, tell me, Mr. Jang, how old were you when you first came to Shangri-La? I was quite young, only 22. I am now 104. When did you first begin to grow old in appearance? I was over 70. That is often the case, though I... Think I may still claim to look younger than my years? Oh, decidedly. Thank you. Uh, and suppose you were to leave the valley now. What would happen? Death. If I remained away for more than a very few days. But even if I were fortunate enough not to die, I would immediately acquire the full appearance of my actual age. The atmosphere, then, is essential? Mr. Conway, in the whole world there is only one valley of the blue moon. sent for me, Father? I did. You are unhappy, my son. Not for myself, Father. I've never known such happiness as I've enjoyed here. It's as if I'd been searching for a long, long time. At last, I'd come to the end of that search. Then it is for the others. You are unhappy. For one of them. The other two are quite content, it seems. Yes, Miss Sprinkler wishes to convert us. <laughs> Mr. Barnard would also like to convert us into a gold mining corporation. But your friend, to whom neither gold nor religion can offer solace. How about him? Yes, he's going to be the problem. I'm afraid he's going to be your problem. Why mine? Oh. Ah, very storms. They are nothing. Karakul sends us storms at this time of the year. But we are quite secure... You said, Father, that uh, Melanson yes. was going to be my problem. Why mine, particularly? Uh, because, my son, I'm going to die. <laughs> yes, you surprised. But surely, my friend, we are all mortal, even at Shangri-La. Father. <laughs> it is charming of you to appear so concerned. And I will not pretend that there is not a touch of wistfulness, even at my age, in contemplating death. Fortunately, little is left of me that can die physically. And as for the rest, all our religions display a pleasant unanimity of optimism. 
There remains to me before I go one final duty concerns you, my son. You do me a great honor. I have in mind to do much more than that. I am about to place in your hands, my son, the heritage and destiny of Shangri-La. Father. I have waited for you, my son, for quite a long time. I have sat in this room and seen the faces of newcomers. I have looked into their eyes and heard their voices, always in the hope that someday I might find you. My friend, it is not an arduous task that I bequeath, for our order knows only silken bonds. To be gentle and patient, to care for the riches of the mind, to preside in wisdom and secrecy while the storm rages without. The storm? This storm you talk about? It will be such a one, my son, as the world has not seen before. There will be no safety by arms, no help from authority, no answer in science. It will rage till every flower of culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in a vast chaos. Such was my vision when Napoleon was still a name unknown, and as I see it now more clearly with each hour. And you, you think this will come in my time? I believe that you will live through the storm and after, through the long age of desolation, you may still live. Growing older and wiser and more patient. You will conserve the fragrance of our history and add to it the touch of your own mind. Beyond that, my vision weakens, but I see at a great distance a new world stirring in the ruins in its lost and legendary treasures. And they will all be here, my son. Preserved as by a miracle. Hidden behind the mountains in the valley of the blue moon. The speaking had finished. The boys were silent. Conway stood there, looking at that face before him, full of a remote and drenching beauty. Then the glow faded, and there was nothing left but a mask, dark shadowed and crumbling like old wood. And Conway told me that it was only after a long time that it came to him as part of a dream that the High Lama was dead. Conway! Conway! I got the porters. The porters? Yes, they're about five miles down the pass. They came yesterday loaded with books and things. You're thinking of going out to them? Oh, naturally. Oh, Melanson. Suppose you do get beyond the pass and find the porters waiting there. How do you know they'll take you with them? Oh, it all needs arrangement. Negotiations beforehand. Well, they have been arranged. They have been paid in advance. And they've agreed to take us. Who's been making all these plans? Lotsen. Who? Lotsen. She's with the porters now, down below the pass. She's uh, waiting. Waiting? Yes. She's coming with us. I assume you've no objection. Lotsen. That's nonsense. It's impossible. It's not impossible. You think you know a great deal more about her than I do, I dare say. But it seems you don't. Oh, just think of it, Conway. A kid of her age shut up here with a lot of old men. Naturally, she'd get away if she had a chance. She said she'd come. She wanted to come. Oh, hang it all, Conway. Don't stare at me like that. Melanson, I've got to tell you the truth. I hope when you've heard it, you'll realize at least why Lotsen can't possibly go back with you. Huh? Well, there isn't anything that would make me believe that. But go ahead. There's something about this valley, Melanson. Something that makes it different from other places. From any other place on earth. There are men living here. You've seen them. Who were young when your grandparents already old. Oh, and you think that... Lot Sen is no different from the others. Lot Sen is not young. Not young? 
I, I suppose you'll tell me that he came here in 1884. 1884? And she was 18 then. Well, that, that makes her... She was 18 then. Conway. Conway, you're raving. You're raving! Her beauty, Melanson, like all other beauty in the world, lies at the mercy of those who do not know how to value it. It is a fragile thing that can live only where fragile things are loved. Take it away from this valley, and you will see it fade like an echo. You will see her for what she is. An old woman. Conway, I don't believe you. I never will. I, I think you're off your head. I'm sorry if you think that, Melanson. They, they warned me about that in India. I thought they were wrong. What did they warn you of? Well, they, they said that you'd been blown up in the war and that you'd be queer at times ever since. Melanson. Well, that settles it. I'll go now alone. I, I don't know how I'll manage to climb without you. And those tricks with a rope. Well, it's almost certain death. But I must go. I gave my word. Slow ten? Yes. Oh, won't you, won't you come with us, Conway? I, I hate imploring you for my own sake. But I'm young and we've been friends. And Lopesen, too. She's young. Doesn't she count at all? Melanson, there's just one question I'd like to ask. Yes? Are you in love with Lopesen? I... I dare say I am. Oh, Conway. It's that stupid nonsense about her being old. Conway, you can't believe that. You just can't. How can you really know she's young? Because I do know she's young. Because you'll think less of me for it. Because I do know. Oh, I... I'm afraid you'll never properly understand her, Conway. And you do. And she's young. And you're sure of that? Just a girl, Conway. I was terribly sorry for her, and we were both attracted. I don't see there's anything to be ashamed of. She's young. I know. I understand. Valentin... I don't know whether I've been mad and I'm now sane or whether I've been sane for a time and I'm now mad again. Well, Conway. You think you could manage that tricky bit of the, on the pass for the rope if I were with you? You see, I think at the last moment the thing happened to Conway that so often happens to the dreamers of the world. His dream had dissolved like all two lovely things at the first touch of reality. I think he realized, too, that his mind dwelt in a world of its own. Its own Shangri-La. But with their going, Melanson and Lo Tsen, that world was in peril. He saw the corridors of his imagination twist and strain under the impact. The pavilions were toppling and all about was ruin. But good heavens, man, you talk as though... You don't mean you really believe this story, do you? I wouldn't believe it, except for one very small fact. And that is? Two weeks ago, I went back to the hospital at Jungjiang and looked up the young Chinese doctor who'd had charge of Conway's case. He remembered him perfectly, the Englishman who'd lost his memory. Was it true he'd been brought to the mission hospital by a woman, I asked? Oh, yes, certainly by a woman, a Chinese woman. She said something about a companion, a young Englishman who'd died on the way. Did he remember anything about her? Nothing, he answered, except that she'd been ill of fever herself and had died almost immediately. Then I asked him one final question. I dare say you can guess what it was. About that Chinese woman, I said. Was she young? Yes, and what did he say? He looked at me solemnly for a moment. And then he answered, Oh, no. She was most old. Most old of anyone I have ever seen. The last you heard of Conway was three months ago from Bangkok, eh? Yes. And he was going northwest. How could many places lie northwest of Bangkok? Including... The Valley of the Blue Moon. Do you think he'll ever find it again? My friend. It is not an arduous task that I bequeath. For our order knows only silken bonds. To be gentle 
be patient. To care for the riches of the mind. To preside in wisdom and secrecy while the storm rages without. Such a storm, my son, as the world has not seen before. There will be no safety by arms, no help from authority, no answer in science. But I see, at a great distance, a new world, stirring in the ruins, seeking its lost and legendary treasures. And they will all be here, my son, preserved as by a miracle, hidden behind the mountains in the valley of the blue moon. I've been listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Lost Horizon with Sigrid Gurry. Mr. Welles will return to the microphone with his guest of the evening in just a moment. Meanwhile, one quick reminder. You'll be serving soup frequently these December days, won't you? I'm sure you will. And in letting Campbell's make your soup for you, as I hope you will, may I suggest you think often of Campbell's chicken soup? You'll find its full, rich chicken flavor will delight your family and your guests. And they'll enjoy, too, the fluffy rice and tempting pieces of tender chicken meat that help to make this chicken soup of Campbell's so homelike in taste and good nourishment. Have it tomorrow, why don't you? If you will, then I know with your very first spoonful you'll understand why I say, just as sure as you like chicken, you'll like Campbell's chicken soup. And now I see Orson Welles is ready, Mr. Welles. Here by my side, ladies and gentlemen, is a lady whom you've already admired in many continents of the world. In Asia, in Marco Polo, in Africa, in Algiers, and more recently in South America, in the picture Rio. And tonight she was in Tibet playing La Tsin. But for whose charms the story of Shangri-La might never have reached the outside world. The beautiful Sigrid Guri. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Orson Welles. And thank you especially for inviting me here to Campbell's Playhouse. I hear your productions very often, and tonight being here in the studio with you, acting in one of them... It's really an exciting experience for me. That's very nice of you, Miss Gorey. Thank you. Good night, Orson Welles. Good night, Miss Gorey. And ladies and gentlemen, next week, next Sunday night, our favorite and foremost guest, Miss Helen Hayes, returns once more to the Campbell Playhouse. Our production, Vanessa, Hugh Walpole's magnificent love story of modern England. And Vanessa is not only the heroine of a great love story, she is also one of Helen Hayes' favorite characters. Indeed, it was Miss Hayes' own choice for her next appearance on the Campbell Playhouse. And so until next Sunday night, until Vanessa, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us here in the Campbell Playhouse remain obediently yours. The makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we bring you our exclusive Playhouse star, Miss Helen Hayes, and the delightful love story, Vanessa. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed tonight's Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's chicken soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Craig's Wife, which is the title of tonight's offering, has been a personal enthusiasm since I first saw it. This story of 24 hours in the life of a husband and wife. As we've rehearsed it here in the studio, we've been impressed to find that Craig's Wife is fresh and vital and true in the same degree as it was when it first played on Broadway. I got to feel the surprise. Miss Faye Dainter, who was to have played Mrs. Craig, is unfortunately one of the many victims of our local epidemic of flu. In her stead, we are something more than lucky in the very personable person of an actress distinguished both in motion pictures and in the living theater. 
whose triumphs have been memorable in both fields and richly deserved. Miss Anne Harding. Mrs. Harold. Mrs. Harold. Well, maybe. What is it now? Did you see the evening paper? Oh, what? It's a murder right over near us, too, on Willows Avenue. Oh, man's sake. I used to work over in Willows Avenue. Who was it? Fashionable Willows residence, scene of double tragedy. Bodies of Jay Fred of Pasmore and wife, socially prominent in this city, found dead in library from bullet wounds. Man's sake. Empty revolver near fireplace, cause of death shrouded in mystery. Police working upon identity of gentlemen visitors seen leaving premises in automobiles shortly after midnight. Is it a creeps that does? Well, creeps and hoax. You better brush up them rose petals from off the living room floor. And don't leave the evening paper lying about either. You're not expecting the lady back already, are you? Can't ever tell about women like Mrs. Craig. If she gets an idea that there's a pin out of place around here, she'll take the first train out of Albany and come right back home. Honest, Mrs. Harold. I never worked for a woman like Mrs. Craig. Sure feel sorry for Mr. Craig. Oh, she could build a nest in that man's ear and he'd never know it. She certainly is the hardest woman to please I ever worked for. Did, you, did I tell you about her wanting me to dust the leaves off that little tree in front of the dining room window last week? Dust the leaves? That's the honest truth. And me with rheumatism at the time. You know how I done it, don't you? What'd you say to her? I told her right up. I said, I'll dust no tree for nobody. Well, you done right. She says, you mean you refuse to dust it? Yes, I said, I refuse. And what's more, I'm going to say refuse. Well, she says, it needs dusting whether you dust it or not. Well, I says, let need it. A little dust won't poison it. We'll be dust ourselves someday unless we get drowned. <laughs> you sure done right. I think the worst kind of woman a girl can work for is one that's crazy about her house. Say, how long is she going to be away in Albany? Well, I guess her sister's better, but still you never know about her. She's liable to find some excuse to come home. She don't like to be away from her home. Mrs. Craig don't. All right, dear. Just leave your bags here. Yes, Carol. Mrs. Craig. Mrs. Harold? Mrs. Harold? Coming. Coming. Lady? Yes, Mrs. Craig. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Craig. We didn't expect you back so soon. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Craig. This is Miss Eldris, my niece, Mrs. Harold. Yes. Uh, Maisie, will you take her things up to the corner room? She's staying with us for a few days. Yes, Mrs. Craig. And uh, will you see that that catch is on the screen door, Mrs. Harold? It was open when I came in. Yes, Mrs. Craig. Oh, and Harriet, are you sure we were right to leave Mother like that? Oh, Ethel, dear, you mustn't start that. Your mother's been through this very same kind of thing many times before. Be careful with that suitcase, Maisie. Don't scratch the wall. Oh, Aunt Harriet. Yes, dear? Suppose something should happen. Oh, nothing's going to happen, dear child. Mrs. Harold. Uh, Mrs. Harold? Yes, Mrs. Craig. Where did those roses come from? Oh, why, that woman across the street brought them over to your aunt. Mrs. Fraser, you mean? Yes, ma'am. Well, you better take them out of here, Mrs. Harold. The petals will be all over the room. Maybe Miss Austin left them in her room. She and Mrs. Fraser are up there having tea. You mean to tell me that Mrs. Fraser is upstairs in my aunt's room? Yes, ma'am. And how did she happen to get up there? Miss Austin asked her. Really? Oh. All right, that, that will be all, Mrs. Harold. Aunt Harriet. Yes? You know, there was something I wanted to tell Mother, but the doctor said he thought I'd better wait. Is it something important? Yes, it was about Professor Fredericks' at school. Mother met him last year when she was up there at commencement, and she liked him very much. And when we got home, she said that if he ever said anything to me... She'd be glad if I could like him well enough to marry him. She said she'd feel easier about me in case anything ever happened to her. And you mean he has said something? Yes. He asked me to marry him right after Easter. I don't know why your mother would be so panicky about your future, Ethel. You're only 19. She said she'd like to feel that I have somebody. Well, why does a person need anybody, dear, if one has money enough to get along on? Oh, really, I think you're a very foolish girl, Ethel, if you rush into marriage. Oh, but Aunt Harriet, he and I... Are, are you engaged to this, this Mr. Um... Uh, Mr. Fredericks. Yes, I am, Aunt Harriet. I knew Mother liked him, so when he asked me... Well, that's all very nice, Ethel, but simply liking a man isn't going to go very far toward keeping things going. But... Well, I have money of my own, Aunt Harriet. Oh, I know that, dear child, but surely he isn't marrying you because of it. Oh, no, of course not. He doesn't know anything about that. Well, I hope not. You did say he was a professor, didn't you, dear? He's a professor of romance languages. Naturally. <laughs> and I suppose he told you that he loved you in all of them. Were you married, Aunt Harriet? I had no private fortune like yours, Ethel. I married to be on my own in every sense of the word. I haven't entirely achieved the condition yet, but I know it can be done. I don't quite understand what you mean, Aunt Harriet. Oh, I mean that I'm simply exacting my share of a bargain. How? Oh. By securing into my own hands the control of the man upon which they're found. But how are you ever going to do a thing like that, Aunt Harriet? Haven't you ever gotten Mr. Fredericks to do something you wanted him to do? <laughs> yes, but I always told him I wanted him to do it. Well, there are certain things that men can't be told, Ethel. They don't understand them. Particularly romantic men. And Mr. Craig is, is inveterately idealistic. But supposing he would find out sometime. Find out what? What you've been telling me, that, that you want to control him. 
Oh, one never comprehends, dear, but it is not in one's nature to comprehend. That's where we women have such a tremendous advantage over me. Oh, uh, I know you're deploring my lack of nobility. Oh, no, I'm not at all, Aunt Harriet. Uh, if you are, see it in your face. You think I'm a very sordid woman. Oh, no, I don't think anything of the kind. Well, what do you think? Well, frankly, Aunt Harriet, I, I don't think it's quite honest. That's very much safer, dear, for everybody. Because, as I say, if a woman is the right kind of a woman, it's better that the destiny of her home should be in her hands than in any man. Don't you see? Aunt Harriet, I'm rather tired. Would you mind if I rested a bit? Oh, of course not, child. You go right upstairs. I'll be along in a few minutes to see that you're comfortable. This is Harold. This is Harold. Yes, this is Craig. Uh, have there been any letters or messages for me since I've been away? Uh, two letters, ma'am. One came this morning and one came Tuesday. No telephone call? None for you, ma'am. There was a gentleman called Mr. Craig this afternoon about four o'clock. He seemed real anxious to get in touch with Mr. Craig and for him to call him as soon as he came in. Who was that? Uh, Mr. Bergmeyer, ma'am. He was the same gentleman who called Mr. Craig last night. But he must have got in touch with him for I gave him the number Mr. Craig said he'd be at. You mean Mr. Craig was out last night? Uh, where? I don't know, ma'am. He didn't say. But he left a number for me to give anybody that they call. I wrote it down in this paper so I wouldn't forget it. It was Levering 3100. Levering 3100. You didn't say whose number it was? No, ma'am. He just left a number and the gentleman called and I gave it to him like he told me. I see. All right, Mrs. Harold. I'll, I'll tell him when he comes. Yes, ma'am. Information? Uh, could you give me the address of the telephone number Levering 3100? Oh, you don't give out addresses. I see. Well, it isn't important. Thank you very much. Well, who's here? Bright and smiling. Hello, Walter. Harriet. Would you get in, my dear? A few minutes ago, left Albany at noon. I should wire us something, all I right? I thought of it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> there was so much to be done around there, getting Ethel's things together and one thing and another. And was Ethel there? Yes, I brought her back with me. She's upstairs, lying down. How's your sister? Why, I couldn't see that there was anything the matter with her more than usual. But you'd think from her letter she was dying. Then I'd have to walk out and leave my house for a whole week and go uh -huh. racing up to Albany. I'm glad to have you back again, Harry. Oh, stop it, Walter. You're so strong. Seems you've been away a month instead of a week. Don't break my bones, Walter. <laughs> That's what I think I'd like to do sometimes. <laughs> no, stop it. Stop it. Here, take this hat and put it there with long. Okay. Uh, take this paper out of here, too. This room's a sight. Your aunt's company will be scandalized. Oh, has Auntie Austin got some clean? She's upstairs with her. The um, woman across the street there. Mrs. Fraser? Hey, it's a wonder she wouldn't bring a few of those roses over here, Auntie Austin. I guess she has sense enough to know that if we wanted roses, we could plant some. Walter, whose telephone number is levering 3100? That's very fast, Ma. Why? Oh, nothing. I was just wondering. And Miss Harold told me you gave her that number last night in case anybody wanted you. I was wondering where it was. Fergus fast. I was playing cards out there last night. What did Billy Bertmeyer want you for? Mrs. Harold said he called you out. Yeah, Fergus asked him, too, but Billy called me up later to tell me that his father just come in from St. Louis. He wouldn't be able to make it. I wasn't here when he called, so we talked him from there. I hope you're not going to get into that card playing again, Walter. I never gave up card playing. We haven't played in nearly a year. Well, I suppose that's because you don't play. Most of the folks know that, so they don't ask me. Was Fergus wife there? No. I suppose that's the reason Fergus asked you then, wasn't it? What do you mean? Well, you know, insanely jealous of him. Oh, Sure, he's never jealous of me. He was jealous of everybody, from what I could tell. Oh, don't be silly, Harriet. But you wouldn't know it, Walter, even if you were. I'm glad I wouldn't. You come to find out, I'll bet, that's just the reason Billy Berkmeyer dodged it. That that's just what he called you up to tell you. He called me up to tell me anything of the kind, Harriet. He said he called me up to tell me his father had come in unexpectedly. Oh, same. I don't mean last night. I mean when he called you today. He didn't call today. Yes, he did, this afternoon, at 4 o'clock. Here? So Mrs. Harold told me. Said he wanted you to get in touch with him as soon as you came in. I wonder why he didn't call the office. Well, probably did, and you'd gone. Really, Walter, I can't understand Auntie Austin. The minute my back is turned, she invites one of the neighbors into my house. Oh, why shouldn't she, Harriet? Why shouldn't she? Well, really, Walter, she stands there right out on the front porch saying goodbye oh, to that Mrs. Harriet. Frazier. You say Ethel's here? And she's in the guest room. I think I'll go up and say hello to her. Right here. I'll be right down. Bye. Oh, hello, Harriet. How did you find your sister? You said Harold told me a moment ago that you were back. Yes, Auntie Austin, I'm back. I think it's about time I came back, don't you? I don't understand what you mean. Well, from the looks of things, if I stayed away much longer, I should probably have come back to find my house a fellow fair for the entire neighborhood. You mean by having Mrs. Frazier here for tea? You know perfectly well what I mean, Auntie Austin. Please don't try to appear so innocent. It's exactly what that woman's been trying to do ever since we've been here. And the minute you get my back turned, you let her succeed. Just for the sake of a lot of small talk, how did she happen to get in here? Well, she brought me some roses over, which I think is very thoughtful of. Of course. And you walk right into the trap. Well, why do you think she should be so anxious to get in here, Harriet? For the same reason that a lot of other women in this neighborhood want to get in here. 
satisfy their vulgar curiosity. See what they can see. And why should you care if they do see? I don't want a lot of idle neighbors on visiting terms. Let them turn to their houses. They'll have plenty to do. Mrs. Freighter is very likely one of those housekeepers that hides the dirt in the corners with a bunch of roses. You know nothing about her house. Well, I don't want to know about it. And I don't want to know about her. She wasn't here to you. She was in my house, wasn't she? And in your husband's house? Oh, well, she was hardly here to see my husband, was she? Did you say they were here to see me, your husband's aunt? And I made her welcome, and so did he. And asked her to come back again. And I don't think you'll find him very much in accord with your attitude if he knew of it. Well, you'll probably tell him. Oh, I have a lot of things to tell him, Harriet. I've had plenty of time to think about them during the past two years up there in my room. And they've been particularly clear to me this week that you've been away. That's why I've decided to tell Walter, because I think he should be told. Only I want you to be here when I tell so that you won't be able to twist what I say. You have a very good opinion of me, haven't you, Auntie Austin? No opinion I have of you at all, Harriet. It's you that I have. Well, whatever it is, I'm not at all interested in hearing about it. I want you to know that I resent instantly your having brought Mrs. Fraser in here. Oh, be honest about it at least, Harriet. But what do you mean? By particularize on Mrs. Fraser. Because I don't want her here. You don't want anybody here. I don't want her. You don't want your husband. Only that he's necessary to the upkeep here. But if you could see how that could be changed or managed without him, his position here would be as pure as, as the position of one of those pillows there. Well, I must say, Miss Austin, that's a very nice thing for you to say to me. You want your house, Harriet. That's all you do want. And that's all you'll have to finish, unless you change your way. People who live to themselves, Harriet, are generally left to themselves. For other people will not go on being made miserable indefinitely for the sake of your ridiculous idolatry of house furnishings. You seem to have borne it rather successfully. I did it for Walter's sake. But I knew he wanted to have me here. I didn't want to make it difficult. But I've been practically a recluse in that room of mine upstairs ever since you've been here. Just to avoid scratching that holy staircase or leaving a print on one of those sacred rugs. I'm not used to that kind of stupidity. I'm accustomed to living in rooms. I think too much of myself to consider their appearance where my comfort is concerned. So I've decided to make a change. Only I want my reasons to be made perfectly clear to Walter before I go. I think I owe it to him, for his own sake, as well as mine. What's the matter? Get your way up there. Haven't the faintest idea, I'm sure. But from what Auntie Austin has just been saying, she seems to think there are quite a few things the matter. What is it, Auntie? She tells me she's going to leave us. Nothing very new, Walter. Leave the house, you mean? So she says. You didn't say that, did you, Auntie? Haven't I just told you she said it? I'm leaving tomorrow, Walter. Why? What happened? She says she finds my conduct of affairs here unendurable. I'll be obliged to you, Harriet. If you'll allow me to explain the reasons for my going, I know them better than you do. But you haven't any reasons that I can see. Except the usual jealous reasons that women have of the wives of men that they've brought up. You'll have plenty of time to give your version of my leaving after I'm gone. Well, sit down then and let us hear your version of it. I prefer to stand, thank you. Oh, thank you, please. I doubt if I'd uh, know quite how to sit in one of these chairs. What do you mean, Auntie? I can't believe you've had a difficulty with anyone, especially with Harriet, who thinks the world of you. Now, you know what she does, Auntie. Harriet's just as fond of you as I am. I'm glad you're here to hear some of this. I suppose there are little irritations that come up around the house occasionally, just as there are in any other business. But I'm sure you're too sensible, Eddie, to allow them to affect you as they tend to make you want to leave the house. Why, Eddie, what did we do here around you without you? It wouldn't seem to me that we had any house at all. What was it you said to Eddie, Harriet? I said anything to her, of course. She's simply using her imagination. Well... If it isn't anything that Harriet has said to you, Annie, what is it? Oh, no. Harriet has never said anything. She simply acts and leaves you to interpret, which you're able. It takes a long time to be able until you find the key. And it's all very simple, very ridiculous, and incredibly selfish. So much so, Walter, that I rather despair of ever convincing you of my of my justification for leaving your house. Well, what has Harriet done, Auntie? I'll tell you what I did, Walter. I objected to Auntie Austin as having brought that woman across the street in here while I was away. You mean Mrs. Fraser? Yes, I mean Mrs. Fraser. What's the matter with Mrs. Fraser? She's a vulgar old busybody. That's what's the matter with her. She's been trying to get in here ever since we've what been mean? here. What do you mean she's been trying to get in here? Well, you wouldn't understand if I told you, Walter. It's, it's a, a form of curiosity that women have about other women's houses that men can't appreciate. I'm afraid I don't quite understand if you feel, Andy, you're... You're a man, Walter. You're in love with your wife. I'm perfectly familiar with the usual result of interference under those circumstances. Well, I hope I'm open to conviction, Andy, if you have a grievance. Oh, it isn't my own cause I'm about to plead. It doesn't matter about me. I can't be here. But I don't want to be witness to the undoing of a man by way of becoming a very important citizen without warning him of the danger. I don't understand what you mean, Andy. It's probably the great part of the danger, Walter, that you don't understand. If you did, 
It'd be scarcely necessary to warn you. Of what? Your wife. Oh. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Harriet? Oh. oh, don't you think that's very amusing? I don't know that I think it's so very amusing. <laughs> no, I didn't, Harriet. Well, wait till you've heard the rest of it. You'll probably change your mind. Harriet isn't really <laughs> laughing, Walter. What am I doing? Crying? You're whistling in the dark. Oh, dear. You're terrified that your secret's been discovered. Really? What is my secret? I think it's hardly necessary to tell you that, Harry. But I'm interested in hearing it. Well, you can listen while I tell it to Walter. Very well. But I want you to know before I tell him that it didn't remain until your outburst against Mrs. Frazier here a few minutes ago to reveal it to me. I knew it almost as soon as Walter's mother knew it. She means that I've been trying to poison you secretly, Walter. Not so secretly either, Harriet. Well, I'm sorry, I must go. I don't intend to stay. I didn't think you would. Why not, Harriet? Because I've something more important to do than listening to a lot of absurdities. I hope when you finish discussing me, you'll be as frank in letting Walter know something of what I've been putting up with during the past two years. Oh, Harriet. Playing the martyr as usual. I could have almost spoken those last words for her, Walter. I know her so well. I wish you'd tell me what's happened, Addie. Walter, your mother asked you to promise her that she was dying, that you'd take me with you when you're married. She asked me to promise her that I'd accept your invitation when you made it. You see, she knew her woman, Walter. The woman you were going to marry. Mother didn't like Harriet? Nobody could like Harriet, Walter. She doesn't want them to. I like her. You're blinded by a pretty face, son. As many another man has been blinded. Oh, Harriet Dunn. She's left you practically friendless, Walter. Why do you suppose your friends have so suddenly stopped visiting you? They always visited you at home. And I dare say all those charming young men and women that used to have that pleasant times at home thought that when you married, your house would be quite a rendezvous. But they reckoned without their hostess, Walter. Just as they're beginning to reckon without you. You never go out anymore. Nobody ever asks you. They're afraid you might bring her, and they don't want her. Because she's made it perfectly clear to them that she doesn't want them. I don't think that's true. No, I, Andy, I think just... I want to tell you Harriet... something that I saw the other day in the city. I was having luncheon at the colonnade, and two of your old Thursday night poker crowd came in. Sat at the table within, well, within hearing distance of me. Presently, a man and his wife came in. Sat down at another table. The wife immediately proceeded to tell the man how he should have sat down and how he should sit now that he was down and so on. I distinctly heard one of your friends say to the other, listen to Craig's wife over there. That's a little straw, Walter, that should show you the way the wind is blowing. Your friends resent being told where they shall sit and how, and so they're avoiding the occasion of it, just as I'm going to avoid it. But you can't avoid it, so you must deal with it. How? How should I deal with it? By impressing your wife with the realization that but there's a man in the house, as well as a woman, and that you are that man. If you don't, Walter, you're going to go the way of every other man that's ever allowed himself to be dominated by a selfish woman, become a pallid little echo of her distorted opinions, believing finally that every friend you ever had before you met her was trying to lead you into perdition, and that she rescued you and made a man of you. Oh, how can ever turn me against my friends? Walter, they can make men believe that the mothers that nurse them are their arch enemies. That's why I'm warning you. For you're fighting for the life of your manhood, Walter. And I can't leave this house without at least turning on the light here and letting you see what it is that you're fighting for. Daddy, I can't see you leave this house. That's all it is. But if I'm but if I'm not happy here. I promised Mother that you'd always have a home with me, and if you go I'll feel somehow that I'm breaking that promise. You haven't a home to offer me, Walter. You have a house. The furniture in it. It'll only be used under highly specified conditions. You know, I have the impression somehow or other, when I look at these rooms, that they're rooms that have died and are laid out. Well, whenever they are, they'll seem less if you leave them. I don't think I'd feel worse if it were Mother herself that were leaving. Oh, be glad that it wasn't your mother, Walter. She would have left long ago. Beg pardon, Mr. Craig, but there's nothing here to see. That's going to come in. I'll see you before I go, Walter. All right. I have a lot of things to do here. Hello, Miss Austin. Hello, Hello, Walter. Hello, I called you out. I couldn't get you. What's up? Something wrong? Something wrong? Well, that's what I came to see you about. You were out there last night. I saw you, Ma. You mean you don't know? Haven't you read the evening papers? Fergus Passmore and his wife are dead. Both of them. Murdered. What? It's in every paper in town. That's why I wanted to see you. 
The paper says they're looking for a man seen leaving the house after midnight. Sure, that was me, but Fergus was alone when I left him. Now, now listen, Larry. You've got to move carefully in a thing like this. This kind of affair is pie for the newspapers, and the fact that we were invited out there to play cards wouldn't read any too well. I never thought of that. If you've got nothing to worry about, you weren't there. Well, I know that, but I'm not sitting back in the corner in this thing, you know, Walter. Well, it just so happened that I wasn't out there, but I talked to you on the telephone out there last night from my house. And the thing of this kind, they trace telephone calls and everything else. Oh. Now, now, Waller, I think a wise move for us is just to hop out there and try and find out what's going on. We've got to move mighty carefully, you yeah, know. Yeah, I know. I can't get over it, Billy. Just a few hours ago, I was sitting in his house playing cards with him. He's laughing and joking. You know the way Ferguson is not in a card game. No. Hey, Billy, I'm just beginning to realize that I was the last man to see Fergus Passmore alive. Oh, don't I know it. And that's what the police are looking for. You. Come on, now, let's get going. All right, my car's out front. We hurry, we can get over there in ten minutes. Walter. Walter. Walter, where are you? Walter. Oh, Mrs. Harold. Maisie. Yes, Mrs. Craig. Maisie, where's Mr. Craig? I don't know, ma'am. Maybe he went out with that gentleman that was here a while ago. What gentleman? Who was he? I don't know, ma'am. I never saw him before. You're sure he's not around somewhere? I haven't seen him, ma'am. It... Oh, you've been reading the paper. Ain't that a terrible murder, ma'am? I was just saying to Mrs. Harold... I Harrelson... don't want to talk about it, Maisie. Did you know the man? The Passmore's, I mean? Oh, be quiet, Maisie. Leave me alone. Yes, ma'am. Oh, why did I ever leave this house? You are listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Craig's Wife, starring Orson Welles and Anne Harding. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Maisie, go up and see that Miss Elder's door is closed and be quiet about it, Maisie. And uh, don't disturb this is asleep. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Craig's residence. Yes. Oh, yes, Mr. Fredericks. Well, Ethel is lying down now. She was very tired, poor child. No, no, there's nothing really you could do if you came down, Mr. Fredericks. Well, I'd much rather not call her, Mr. Fredericks, if you don't mind. Can't I take the message? Oh, I see, of course, yes, I understand. Oh, no, no, I, I wouldn't think of serving her just now. I'm sorry, no, Mr. Fredericks. Mrs. Craig, for the devil to you. He said he's from the police headquarters. Police. Show him in and tell him I'll be right down. Will you uh, step this way, please, mister? Mrs. Craig will be right in. Thank you. Good evening. I called to see Mr. Craig. Oh, well, Mr. Craig isn't in just now, I'm sorry. Have you any idea what time Mr. Craig will be in? I'm expecting him any minute. He was here less than half an hour ago, and I went upstairs, so... He must be right here in the neighborhood somewhere. I see. He'll certainly be back for his dinner at 7 o'clock if you'd care to call back. Well, it may be that you could give me the information I'm looking for as well as Mr. Craig. But would you sit down for a minute? Oh, certainly. Well, I'll tell you what it is I wanted to see him about, Mrs. Craig. I suppose you've seen the evening paper about this unfortunate affair out here on Willows Avenue. You mean that shooting affair? Yes, at the Passmore home. Isn't that a dreadful thing? I've just been reading it. I'd want to alarm you, Mrs. Craig. There's no particular connection between that and my visit here. Oh, I'm very glad to know that. There was a man seen leaving the Passmore house shortly after midnight in an automobile. One of the neighbors happened to see him, but it was too dark to establish any identification. Besides, that wouldn't account for the death of Mrs. Passmore. Of course, she didn't get in until after 3 o'clock, and the man left there between 12 and 1. I see. Of course, as you understand, Mrs. Craig, it's part of our business to follow up any little outside clue that we happen to get hold of that might throw some additional light on case. Yes, of course. And uh, that's what I wanted to see Mr. Craig about. You mean, uh, you think Mr. Craig might be the man that was seen leaving there last night? No, that circumstance is really not being seriously considered house of that description might have had any number of visitors during the evening. That's very true. But we've had a report late this afternoon, Mrs. Craig, from the Lindbrook Telephone Exchange, where your calls come in, that there was a call made on your telephone here at 5.27 this evening, about 30 minutes ago, asking for the address of a telephone number of Levering 3100. And that happens to be the number of the telephone Mr. Passmore's home. You mean that somebody called from here? On this telephone, yes, ma'am. Oakdale 623, that's the number of your telephone here, isn't it? Yes, it's our number. Yes, of course, I've got here. Well, I can't imagine who it be that called. Court says it was a woman's voice. And the call was made at uh, 5 o'clock this evening, you say, half an hour ago? 527, my report says. The operator didn't give the address, of course. It's against the telephone company's rules. Well, it does seem strange, doesn't it? Has this telephone here been used at all, to your knowledge, Mrs. Craig, since 5 o'clock this afternoon? 
Why, um, I answered a call a few minutes ago from Northampton, Massachusetts. A long-distance call, you mean? Yes. It was a Mr. Fredericks at Smith College there calling my cousin to inquire about her mother. Her mother's ill in Albany. I see. You don't know whether or not anybody from the outside has been in here since 5 o'clock? Mm, not to my knowledge. Well, except a neighbor from across the avenue there, Mrs. Frazier. She brought some roses over to my husband's aunt. She was here when I got in, although I scarcely think she would have used the telephone. Mm, mind if I use this phone here for a minute? Oh, not at all. Go right ahead. Keelan, Carol calling. That's so. I gotta wait in there before six. Right up, Chuck. I'll be right over. Won't have to bother you anymore right now, Mrs. Craig. There's been a bit of additional information coming over at headquarters that'll hold things up temporarily. And there's uh, been some new development in the case? Yes, Mrs. Craig, a very important development. Good evening, and thank you, Mrs. Craig. Yes, very welcome. Sure. Walter, where have you been? I was Billy Berkman, alive. Shut that door. All right. Lava. Haven't you seen the evening paper of Fergus Passmore and his wife? Yes, I've seen it. Well, what about it, Walter? What about it? What do you mean? I've been what? nearly out of my mind for the last half hour. I happened to see it in the paper there when I came downstairs. I, I couldn't find you anywhere. Or probably you'd been arrested or something. What did I be arrested for, Harriet? Well, connected with this thing, of course. Police are looking for you. One of them just left here not five minutes ago. Are they looking for me? What are they looking for me for? But doesn't it say in the paper there you were seen leaving Passmore at 12 o'clock last night? It doesn't night? say that I was seen leaving there. It says there was a man seen leaving there. I Who know. else could it have been but you? You were out there, weren't you? Yes. Well, that's enough, isn't it? But they don't know that. Oh, don't be absurd, Walter. Didn't you tell me that Billy Burkmeyer called you on the telephone out there last night? Yes. Well, didn't the butler get your name then? No, Fergus answered the phone himself on the extension of the library. Did the policeman say they knew it was I that was out there last night? Oh, I don't remember what he said exactly. I was so upset. But he wanted to know where you were, and of course I couldn't tell him because you were here when I left the room and then you suddenly disappeared. Yeah. I've never placed in such a position in my life. I'm sure that man must have thought I was evading him. Where did you go with Billy? Over to Fergus' house. Oh, what in heaven's name did you do a thing like that for, Walter? Do you want your name to be dragged into this thing? I should think your own common sense would show you what it would mean to have your name mentioned in an affair of this sort. It would be in every newspaper in the country. It wouldn't bother me in the least. Wouldn't bother you? No, not in the least. My conscience is clear. Oh, don't be so absurdly romantic, Walter. It isn't a question of romanticism at all, Harriet. No, and it isn't a question of conscience either. Simply a matter of discretion. If you've had nothing to do with this thing, what's the use of becoming involved? What do you mean, if I've had nothing to do with it? Oh, don't start picking me up on every word, and don't take out a cigarette, Walter. You know you can't smoke in this room. Oh, all right. Well, that's a nice place to throw it, I must say. Into the fireplace, don't you want it? What good is it if I can't smoke it? Well, there are plenty of other places in the house smoke if you want to. I don't know where they are. Well, you can smoke in your den, can't you? If I shut the door. Oh, now, don't act martyred, Walter. I think I'll call up Billy and see if the police have been to see. You're not going to call Billy Berkmeyer. Why not? Don't you realize that that telephone is being watched and that they're probably watching Burkmeyer's too? And if you call him and the operator listened in... You've got something else to do but listen in on our call, Terry. Well, Believe you listened me. in on this one, didn't you? Which one? Huh? Uh, what did you say? You mean the police said the operator had reported on a call from here? Oh, I don't remember what said distinctly. He just kept rambling on about a telephone. Well, I want to know why our phone's being watched. What's more, I intend to find out. Now, listen to me, Walter Craig. You must not use that telephone. I will not allow you to drag my name into a notorious oh, scandal. Harriet, I've got to find out where I'm at at this thing. If you speak over that telephone, I'll leave the house. And you know what construction would be put upon that under the circumstances. What do you mean? You leave the house. I mean exactly what I said. Do you think I could stay in this neighborhood 24 hours after my name has been associated with a thing of this kind? Oh, you surely don't believe I had anything to do with a murder. It isn't for me to determine the degree of your guilt or innocence. I'm not interested. Right. I'm interested only in the respect of the community we've got to live in. You mean you'd rather know I was involved in this thing and keep the respect of the community than know I was the victim of circumstances yes, and lose it? All right, Mrs. Harold. Put it up with you. will be right Mrs. out. Harold. Yes, sir? Miss Harold, do you know if anybody's called that number that I gave you last night here today on the telephone, Leverings 3100? No, sir. You haven't had occasion to call that number today on this telephone. I never even thought about it today until Mrs. Craig asked me for it when she came in this evening, and I gave it to her. All right, Mrs. Harold. Thank you very much. And it was you that made that call. What are you doing? Checking up on me? Don't flatter yourself, Walter. What you were doing, wasn't it? Why didn't you tell the truth? You were playing fake. That was it, wasn't it? Exactly. That is my expense. I knew if I told you I made that call, you'd be on the telephone in five minutes telling the police. Well, I intend doing that anyway. Well, if you do, you'll explain my leaving you, too. 
That wouldn't worry me in the least, Harry. Well, it might worry the police. But if you know detectives are looking for her... Oh, you needn't try to turn it on to me. They wouldn't be looking for either of us if you'd stayed at home last night instead of being out car playing with a lot of irregular people. I felt it in my bones up there in Albany that something would happen while I was away. I knew as soon as ever my back was turned, you'd be out with your friends again. And what has your back being turned got to do with my visiting my friends? Well, you wouldn't have been visiting them if I'd been What here. do you mean? How would you stop me? I'd have stopped you all right one way or another. What you've done, lock the door on me? wouldn't have been necessary to lock the door on you. You haven't been visiting them in the last 18 months, have you? No, I haven't. And they haven't been visiting you either. You mean you kept them out of here? Well, if I did, the end justified the means. You at least haven't been in the shadow of the law in the last 18 months. My aunt said here a while ago she'd driven all my friends away from the house. I thought she was imagining things. Said something else, too, something I didn't believe. She said you were trying to get rid of me, too, without actually driving me away from the house. Please, that's true, too. What if I wasn't cordial to your friends? You think I wanted my house turned into a tavern? My friends never turned my mother's house into a tavern. Well, evidently, your mother and I have very different ideas of a house. Very different indeed, Harriet. There was more actual home in one room of my mother's house than there'd be in all of this if we lived in it a thousand years. Why didn't you stay in it, then, if you found it so attractive? Now you're talking, Harriet. Now you're talking. Why didn't I do just that? Don't make any mistakes that I you didn't want my friends here simply because they played cards. You wouldn't have wanted them if they'd come here to hold prayer meetings. You didn't want them because, as my aunt says, Bev, this implied an importance to me. That it was at variance with your little campaign, the campaign that was to reduce me to one of those wife-ridden sheep that's afraid to buy a necktie for fear his wife might not approve of it. Oh, don't try to make yourself out a martyr. You had your share this bargain. I never regarded this thing as... Bargain. Did you expect me to go into a thing as important as marriage with my eyes shut? I wanted you to go into it honestly, as I would this insisted. You've been playing safe right from the start. You've been exploiting me consistently in your shifty little business of personal safety. And you'd throw me right now to suspicion of implication in this double murder to preserve that safety. I've been trying to preserve my home. That's all I've heard from you since the day I married you. Well, what else is a woman like me but her home? Isn't she her husband? She could lose her husband, couldn't she, as many another one has. Couldn't she lose her home, too? She couldn't if she knew how to secure it. <laughs> That's the point in the nutshell here, is if she knew how to fix it for herself. Well, what if I have fixed things for myself? You haven't lost anything by it, have you? If I fix them for myself, I fix them for you, too. Your home is here. And maybe if I hadn't played the game so consistently, it wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't be the first woman that's lost her home and her husband, too, through letting the control of them get out of her hands. I saw what happened to my mother, and I made up my mind it would never happen to me. She was one of those, I will follow thee, my husband, women, that believed everything my father told her. And all the time he was mortgaging her home over her head for another woman. And when she found it out, she did the only thing that women like her can do, and that was to die of a broken heart within six months. Leaving the door wide open for the other woman to come in as stepmother over Estelle and me. And then get rid of us both as soon as Estelle was marriageable. But the house was never mortgaged over her head, I'll promise you that. For she saw to it that it was put in her name before ever she took him. And he kept it there, too, right to the finish. Why didn't you ask me to put this house in your name? Because I didn't want it in my name. Yes, I've been more honest. I haven't done anything that wasn't honest. Simply try to be practical, but with your usual romanticism, you want to make me appear a criminal for it. I'm not reproaching you at all, Harriet. I'm merely saying that you simply married the wrong man. I married a romantic fool. But I married, I'm seeing it more clearly every day I live. Oh, well, we understand each other now, Harriet. Do we? Huh? Walter. Now, who on earth moves those ornaments on the mantelpiece? The grass of you. Presumption. Just wondering how you get that one. Walter. Did you mean that on So brazenly presumptuous as to say such a thing to me. What have you ever done for a million others like you that would warrant the assumption of such superiority over the men you're married? I asked the servants a dozen times not to touch the things on the mantelpiece. You should set yourself up to control the very destiny of a man as though I was some mental incompetent. I... Yeah, uh, sorry, ma'am, but I had to remind you about dinner. It's going to be spoiled. Oh, Mrs. Harold. Who moved those ornaments? I only dusted them, ma'am. You know perfectly well I never allow anybody even to dust that mantelpiece but myself. 
I even bought a special little brush for those ornaments because I wouldn't trust them to anybody else. But you were away, Mrs. Craig. I am not interested in your excuses. I have told you over and over again never to touch those ornaments. And you deliberately disobey me. I'm sorry, Mrs. Craig. Well, don't let it happen again. You may put up the dinner. We'll begin in two minutes. Yes, Mrs. Craig. Walter, you better go along in and get your dinner before it's cold. I'll go up and tell Ethel and Aunt Austin. Did something get broken here, Mr. Craig? Did that ornament fall off the mantelpiece? No, Mrs. Harrell. I smashed it. On purpose, you mean, Mr. Craig? Yes. I didn't like it. Walter! Did something fall down there a moment ago? No. Well, sounded up here as though the house fell down. Maybe it did, Harriet. I'm just standing here, wondering. Is the yellow cab company? Oh, will you send a cab to 8545 Franklin Avenue? At once, please. Thank you. What on earth is going on down there this morning? Is that all? It's the men taking out Miss Austin's cup, Mrs. Craig. Well, tell them to keep it away from the wall. I don't want that wall all scratched up. I only had it painted in April. Yes, ma'am, I'll tell them. Are you up, Walter? Yes. Good heavens, Walter. What a mess your room is, honestly. Oh, is that the morning paper? What does it say about the past morning? Quite safe. Quite safe. I mean, his brother got in last night in Pittsburgh with a letter that Fergus had written in... Intimating his intention. Ah, then Fergus did it himself. So it appears. I was told he was jealous of his wife. He did it because she was dishonest. Well, thank heaven I kept my head last night and didn't allow you to telephone and make a show of us all. You can thank me that your name isn't in every paper in the city this morning. Oh, I can thank you for more than that, Harris. Another thing. I want to know about that ornament there that was broken downstairs last night. I smashed it. Oh, what were you doing? Leaning against the mantelpiece again as usual? No, it wasn't an accident. I did it deliberately. What do you mean, you did it deliberately? I mean that I smashed it purposely. What for? I became suddenly heroic. Yeah, I smashed it into a thousand little pieces. Then I smoked one cigarette after another till I had your sanctum sanctorum absolutely littered with ashes and cigarette butts. I was positively a whale of a fellow around here for about an hour last night. Should have seen. What did you do? Go out of your mind or something? Not particularly clear in my mind, strange to say. You made a remark here last night, Harriet, that completely illuminated me. And uh, illuminated you. Suddenly I saw for the first time everything. Just as one sees an entire landscape at midnight in a flash of lightning. But unfortunately, the... Lightning struck my house and knocked it down. I sat here all night wondering how I might build it up again. Oh, really? I saw your entire plan of life, Harriet, and its relationship to me. And my instinct of self-preservation suggested the need of immediate action. In the inauguration of a new regime here, so I smashed your little ornament as a kind of opening gun. I was going to smash all the other little ornaments and gods you'd set up a temple here and been worshipping before me. I was going to put my house in order, including my wife, and rule it with a rod of iron. <laughs> I don't wonder that amuses you. It amused me. Particularly when I suddenly remember the truth of what you called me last night. In view of that, the absurdity of my trying to sustain such a role indefinitely... Made me laugh, but I'm rather sorry you couldn't have seen me anyway. I think you would at least have appreciated the sincerity of my attempt to continue here as your husband. Oh, you mean attempt to continue here as my husband? I realize now, Harriet, that the role is not for me. I can only play a romantic part. That's all dear time. Well, what are you doing up so early? You're not ill, are you, dear? No, but I've made up my mind, Aunt Harriet. I've got to open it. I know, dear child, but I'm sure you're upsetting yourself unnecessarily. We certainly would have heard something if anything had happened. And I really should call Mr. Fredericks on the long distance, Aunt Harriet. He'll be wondering what on earth has happened. He probably hasn't given it a thought. Oh, don't say that, Aunt Harriet. I know he has. That's great. Well, Mrs. Harold, what are you doing with your hat on at this hour? Where are you going? Well, the fact is, I, I'm i leaving, Mrs. Craig. Leaving? I'm going with Miss Austin, Mrs. Craig. Indeed. She was telling me last night she was going to leave here, and I said I thought I'd be leaving pretty soon myself. 
So she said if I was going away soon, she'd like very much to have me go with her. And do you think it's very considerate of you, Mrs. Harold, to walk away like this without giving me any notice? What about the keys? I left them all on your dressing table upstairs, and Miss Austin's, too. Well, I'd better check things over with you first, Mrs. Harold. We'll see who's at the door, will you, Ethel? Whoever it is, neither Mr. Craig nor I at home. Uh, come on upstairs, Mrs. Harold. Oh, Jean, what are you doing here? I had to see you, darling. I thought maybe you were ill or something. I called you on the long distance, but I couldn't get any satisfaction. I, I didn't know what to think. So I just jumped on the night train and got in here at 8.20. I'm going right, I'm going home right away, Jean. Did your cousin tell you I called you last night? Why? No, she didn't. Well, I, I asked her to call you to the phone. She didn't seem to want to do it. In fact, why, she hung up on me. That's why I came down. It seemed such a peculiar thing to do on the long distance. I know why she didn't tell me you called. And she doesn't want me to marry you. Jean, do you really want to marry me very much? Why, yes. More than anything in the world, I... Well, yesterday she almost convinced me that I was wrong about loving you. But today I know differently. If you're ready, Jean, we'll go. Uncle Walter will drive us to the station, away from on the porch. I don't want to see Aunt Harriet again. Ethel, you and Mrs. Fred are getting in the car. I'll be right out as soon as I can there. All right, Uncle Walter. Harriet? Going out? What is it, Walter? I'm meeting Andy Austin in town on the way I'll take Ethel and Frick down the station. Is Ethel leaving without telling me goodbye? You wonder after what you did to her? Well, just because I... Walter, don't put those keys on that table. You I've got the key to your car in the garage. Some other things I've left for you. If you'd want me for anything during the week, I'll be at the risk. You'll be... Where? Walter. You're not serious about leaving this house. I think that decision would please you very much. Well, it doesn't please me at all. It's absolutely ridiculous. But it's so absolutely practical. Oh, don't try to be funny, Walter. Anyway, I'd like to know what's practical about a man walking out and leaving his wife in his home. I have no wife to leave. You neither loved nor honored me. Well, you married me, whether I did or not. I never saw you before in my life, Harriet, till last night. Well, you married me, didn't you? And you married a house. If it's agreeable to you, I'll see that you have it all to yourself. You'll be quite alone with your house. Oh, you'll be back unless I'm very much mistaken. You don't know your man, Harriet. You know me pretty well, I'll grant you that, particularly when you said my mind works very slowly. You fail to reckon with the thoroughness of my mind when it does work. We've shown our hands, Harriet. The game's up. You also showed me how I could keep from making a fool of myself in the future. Well, you're certainly not beginning very auspiciously, I can tell you that. I shall be at least a self-respecting fool, and that's something I could never be if I stayed here. There's something in a man that I suppose is... his essential manhood. You insulted that last night. I should be too embarrassed here under your eye, knowing that you had no respect for that manhood. I should remember my lover's ardors, and enthusiasm for our future. And you bearing with me contemptuously for the sake of your future. Couldn't stand it. Where are you going when you leave here? Where a lot like me are going. Out fashion, possibly. You know, Harriet, I can't help but wonder, for your wisdom, it never occurred to you that one can't play a dishonest game indefinitely. I haven't played any dishonest game. Maybe not according to your standards, but I think you have, and I think you know you have. That's the rock that you and I are splitting on. This there attack noise hadn't revealed you something else would. So my going may as well be today as tomorrow. Goodbye, Harriet. 